Brilliance Audio presents The Imposter by Marin Montgomery, performed by Jane Oppenheimer. Prologue Deborah Six months ago. Getting the mail should be an easy feat, except in this case. It's minus five degrees, and the blustery cold unavoidably renders Deborah's limbs numb. She can't feel her face, even though it's mostly covered by a wool scarf, and her toes are frozen stiff as she trudges through the deep snow. It doesn't help that the mailbox isn't twenty feet away, but at the end of a long, winding gravel driveway, smack dab in the middle of a colorless sky. A subtle hint more snow is on the way. Groaning, she curses the dreary landscape. The mailbox is the only vibrant speck in the distance, a forest green metal container with a neon orange flag that sticks out like a sore thumb in the drabness. Midwesterners do this every cold season once the promise of sunshine and bearable temperatures arrives. They swear it'll be their last, but the spring, summer, and fall make up for the bitter winter. By the time the last of the snow melts and the sunshine reappears, it's a fading memory. Out of sight, out of mind. Deborah angrily tosses her head, the blast of cold air penetrating the thick material of her down coat. Her rail-thin frame is made hulking by the layers of clothing, a turtleneck, a heavy sweater, and a wool coat. If anyone spotted her barely five-foot stature, they'd think she was a miniature version of an adult playing dress-up in her mother's clothing. Sticking her bulky glove inside the metal tin, she predicts bills and the hometown newspaper and, at her age, maybe an AARP magazine. She's not wrong, but there's one more package, a manila envelope that takes up the width of the box but is thin, the edges creased to make room for it to fit. She's unable to grasp the mail firmly in her bulky glove, and a gust of wind almost takes the contents from her clumsy grip. She yanks her glove off with her mouth, and it's mere seconds before her fingers succumb to the winter's version of a sunburn, windburn. The handwriting's unrecognizable, though it appears feminine, due to the impeccable cursive spelling out of her address in broad swoops and curly cues. No name is listed as the return sender, only a scribbled post office box. Curious, but not enough to withstand any more blasts of wind, Deborah replaces her glove and lumbers back to the farmhouse, worn out and exhausted from her one errand of the day, the trek down the driveway exacerbating her depressing outlook on the unchanged scenery. After cranking the thermostat to a temperature on par with a kiln, she curls up underneath an heirloom quilt from her deceased mother and sorts through the other mail before carefully opening the slim package. Deborah gasps when a single picture falls into her lap. Her hands shake as she scans the letter written on pale yellow stationery. No, this can't be. This is too unbelievable teetering between clutching it securely in her fist and gently examining it, she instead smooths the creases with her fingertips. The photographs wrinkled, having been folded up and then flattened out. The lines draw a likeness to the worry etched on her face. All the years she can't erase of existing solely as a beating heart, thudding in her chest, on pace with her brain, ticking steadily ready to detonate at any given moment. Deborah wishes she could blot them out in one fluid ripple. All the hurt and sleepless nights. The impossible task of trying to move forward. But more than that, live. In those days it was called a nervous breakdown. Now it's referred to as an acute stress disorder. As if the change provides comfort to the sufferer. It makes no difference to her what you call it, what label you package it up with to sell to patients. 
the trauma is no less real. A significant part of her died that day, and Deborah likens it to missing a limb. People might learn to live without it because they have to, but they never forget it's missing. Deborah knew she would never be whole again, but she took baby steps to move forward because it wasn't just her life she had to consider. But here, on her lap, the words jump off the page at her. And never in a million years did Deborah expect this would be in her mailbox. Cautiously optimistic, she rereads the paragraph over and over, squinting at the out of focus words until she remembers she needs her reading glasses. Terrified to see the writing sharpened, she holds the paper in her trembling hand. Dear Deborah, or maybe I should call you Mother, but it sounds strange after all this time. I'm sure this picture brings up lots of questions, namely what happened at the hospital all those years ago. You were led to believe it was a tragedy, and it was, but of a different proportion. I've asked myself what I should do over the years, the voice inside my head telling me to let go of some of the hurt, anger, and blame. We all make choices that sometimes have unintended consequences. I tell myself you did what you had to do because you had no other alternative. I don't want to punish you any more with silence, because it's only hurting me in the process. We both need to heal. It's time. S. Deborah must read it another hundred times before settling back to absorb the weight of the letter. She doesn't dare let the note leave her grasp, for as silly as it seems, she's worried it will float off into the air, a disappearing act, just like the letter writer. Then, giddy with excitement, she gently lays the frail paper in her lap to clap her hands, but immediately a wave of disappointment brings them to her gaping mouth, where she stuffs them. What if it's a hoax? Deborah stares at the envelope. And with no physical address, just a P.O. box, she wonders suspiciously if the writer is who they claim to be. It wouldn't be the first time someone's played an evil prank on her. Deborah trembles at the memory of the October the year after her husband's death. Recalling the scarecrow in their cornfield, she remembers how she thought it was cute until she got closer. Those straw-like mannequins have been used for years to keep pesky birds from disturbing the crops, and she used to make one every fall until the accident. Someone had placed one in their field, meant to resemble a decapitated body, a gory mess covered in red paint. The trespasser had used sticks as arms, giving it a Freddy Krueger feel that gave her the willies. Scowling at the memory, she scolds herself. Don't think that way, Deborah. Not everyone is out to get you. It just seems that way. Pacing the floor, she carefully considers what she wants her letter back to say. But then her pen wavers on the blank page. She starts and stops multiple letters, ripping the paper into tiny shreds and throwing them like loose confetti in the air. Deborah then telephones the postmaster, whom she knows on a first-name basis after all these years, and he promises to research the identity of the box. She impatiently waits for him to call her back, positive she's wearing a hole in the carpet with her constant pacing. The old rotary phone doesn't finish a full shrill before Deborah yanks it off the wall in apprehension. With trembling fingers, she sinks into the nearest chair, and his answer shocks her. She hopes he doesn't pick up on her high-pitched squeak, the zip code associated with the post office box is in Florida, and it belongs to an S. Sawyer. Beyond that, he can't provide her any more details or a specific address tied to the box. Deborah has so much to say, but it's impossible to write off the lost time in a matter of sentences. Lingering questions suppress her happiness. Should she express her long buried feelings? pain and anguish? Guilt? 
To pour out her remorse after nothing but silence feels as disingenuous as her sham marriage was. Deborah doesn't want to mess this up. And she wishes she had someone to confide in, her lips burning to talk. But practically a hermit, Deborah doesn't have close friends, only acquaintances, and she fears they would gossip behind her back and call her a lunatic. Her only interaction with other people is at church, or when she volunteers at a nursing home. Deborah gulps. The last time she tried to ask someone for help, it ended up causing repercussions she had never considered and destroyed multiple families. She certainly doesn't need people to bring tired old speculations and theories to light when it comes to that fateful night. The only other person alive who witnessed what happened won't even speak to her. And it's been sixteen years. The cross pendant she permanently wears around her neck becomes a mass of knots, twisted by her troubled fingers. She remembers being a child in the front row for her daddy's sermons, hearing his stern baritone as he drove his point home about the day of reckoning. After flipping the dog-eared pages of his hand-me-down Bible to Second Timothy, chapter 4, verse 16, Deborah reads out loud, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. The lesson is pounded into her brain like his fist into the pulpit. Everyone after death is called to account for their actions in life, and Deborah's no exception to the rule. This thought makes her queasy. She slams the Bible shut and puts her head in her hands, and with a deep sigh, Deborah is now well aware of what she must do. She must reach out to the only person who witnessed what happened that night. Part One Deborah Chapter One Deborah a few weeks later, Deborah's trying to enjoy her nighttime ritual of sipping a cup of chamomile tea before bed. Though it usually comforts her, especially during winter time, she's restless and fidgeting, kneading her fingers in her lap, where a second envelope that arrived today now rests innocently enough. She gazes at the nightstand, where the sheet of pale yellow peeks out from the unsealed flap, the words committed to memory. Removing it would only risk tearing the flimsy paper. Eventually, other mail got piled on top of it. And indecisive, Deborah did nothing. It's not like she forgot what it contained, or her guilty conscience. She slides on her reading glasses. This envelope also has no return address and is thicker, with more pages and further proof, enough details to dredge up the past and cause problems. Stunning details, full of particulars she thought were known only by a small group of people, most of whom are dead. The scratches across the page appear rushed, as if the writer had limited time to collect their thoughts. Even though there are discrepancies between the shaky scribbles and Deborah's recollection, she doesn't need to memorize this letter because she was physically present, though mentally checked out. Besides, the permanent imprint tattooed on her brain never fades. Engrossed in forming a response, Deborah ignores a sharp scraping noise that pierces the silence until she's interrupted by a loud thump. Assuming it's an overgrown tree branch rasping the house, she doesn't bother to stand. Out loud, she expresses her reply and continues to talk to herself. But Deborah halts mid sentence when she hears the pitter-patter of footsteps moving across the wraparound porch. She crawls out of bed and noiselessly tiptoes to the dark living room. Startled by a melody, Deborah slams into the wall as the old grandfather clock chimes four times, signaling the top of the hour. Then, rubbing her sore elbow, she stands directly in front of the Roman numerals, squinting at the glass and mahogany display. It's far too late and cold for peddling beauty products or selling magazine subscriptions. Ever since they built a men's prison outside town, 
Deborah's not keen on unexpected visitors. On edge, she moves into the kitchen to flick on the outside light. The howling wind has a ferocious intensity, and Deborah narrows her eyes at the frost-covered gauge of the outside thermometer, which indicates it's a mere three degrees. Her night vision has never been the best, and it's only gotten worse with age. Objects far away tend to blur and move in and out of focus, and she could swear a dark form jets across the snow-covered porch of the old farmhouse as she stares hard into the pitch black. Deborah hasn't been outside since earlier when she got the mail, and it snowed at least five inches since then, which is why her heart thuds in her chest at the fresh tracks in the snowy ground. Nervously, she jiggles the door handle to confirm it's locked. Swallowing hard, she wonders why she stayed out here all alone for all these years. I have protection, Deborah says out loud. I have a gun. Then, in the walk-in pantry, she bundles up in a scarf and coat and quickly laces up her snow boots, groaning at the weight of the old Winchester rifle locked in the gun closet. She realizes she's forgotten how heavy it is against her tiny stature. Cautiously, she unlocks both the deadbolt and the damaged screen door, the netting frayed and torn. Her teeth chatter as soon as the icy blast hits her face. With a heavy and unyielding gun slung haphazardly over her shoulder, Deborah steps outside into the cold temperatures. The wind makes it impossible to catch her breath and Deborah gasps for air. She inhales a lungful of arctic chill, and as it slides down her throat, it's as if she swallowed a block of ice. As she walks the perimeter of the porch, an explosion in the direction of the barn jolts her. After slipping on the ice-covered snow, Deborah tries to steady herself by grabbing a corner piece of siding, except the board is loose, and a single yank pulls it directly off the house. A wind gust picks up at the same time, and without anything to latch on to, Deborah's thrust forward and drops the board. Deborah's shrieks are carried away in the draft as she meets the slippery ice head on. The rifle escapes from her clutch and tumbles to the ground. Luckily, the snow pads her fall, but only enough to act as an ice pack against her immediately bruised face and knees. Mumbling, ouch! Deborah notices dark red blood seeping from her knuckles. Dazed, she clenches the powdery substance in her hands until a black figure appears out of the shadows. Assuming it's Esmeralda, Deborah calls out to her, expecting paw prints to dart across the porch, light and effortless, accompanied by a purring sound. But the footfalls coming closer are weighty and forceful, like a person's. Esmeralda, she moans, staring at her outstretched arms. Then she watches in horror as the snow-covered feet stop in front of her motionless body. Frantic, she glances over her shoulder for the rifle, her eyes darting uselessly across the whiteout conditions. Resignedly, Deborah levels her gaze with dark pants, then moves her eyes toward the torso, also clothed in black. When she reaches the stranger's face, Deborah lifts her chin in defiance, but she's disappointed to see a mask covering their features, the only exception the narrow slit in the front for the nose and eyes. She tries to make eye contact, but just as abruptly the heavy boots step forward and crush her fingers underneath what are surely steel-encased toes. Before she can scream, a swift kick lands on her forehead, and she tastes blood as it slides from above her left eye, down her nose, and into her mouth. The assailant steps around her, and before Deborah can try for another shriek, she's being dragged down the porch steps by her feet, each clunk the sound of her head hitting the concrete. Usually the stars give her comfort, but tonight they seem to be frozen stiff in the sky, as if they are too cold and numb to twinkle. Her body mimics this behavior and she shuts her eyes against the blustery wind, her scarf like a noose as it gets tangled in frozen pieces of grass and gravel as Deborah's hauled across the stretch of property. Her hands clench at the ground, but it's futile. 
The solid clumps of snow are unforgiving against her swollen hands. A sorry excuse for a scream catches on her chapped lips, emerging as nothing more than a pleading whisper. Deborah silently begs for it to be over, but she can't form a coherent thought, with shock settling in every fiber of her being. It's not until something hard jabs into her skull that she realizes too late the rifle is in the hands of the intruder. Deborah doesn't remember much of what happens next, or how long she's beaten against the ice-covered ground. She does know that if it weren't for the weather and the lingering smell of manure and hay, she probably wouldn't have woken up and crawled into the ramshackle barn for cover. Later, baffled to wake up in a hospital bed, Deborah stares in loathing at the uniform four walls. They're a dizzying reminder of the life-changing news delivered to her in the same medicinal environment. Even with the decades gone past, she gets goosebumps at the similarities when she's face to face with the doctor. This time, when the white coat rests a hand on her shoulder, she flinches. His hands are smooth and less calloused than before. Back then, the doctor's rough hands felt gritty like sandpaper when they inspected between her legs, poking and prodding during the examination. Before, when she wanted to interrogate the doctor and ask him questions, he refused to meet her eyes. His stare was fixated on the ugly watercolor painting behind her. Deborah still recalls how her husband, Jonathan, was seated beside her, clawing her wrist with his bare-sized hands. Both he and the doctor couldn't refrain from digging their fingers into her skin. Staring down at her lap, she clutched the thin cotton hospital blanket wrapped around her protruding abdomen. I'm afraid I have some news to share, the doctor told her. He stumbled over the news part, as if he couldn't decide if that was the right word to use. News? I'm sorry, Deborah. It's unfortunate what happened to her. But this isn't 34 years ago, and presently the man in the white lab coat speaks to her with compassion and makes eye contact, explaining it's a good thing she made it into the dilapidated structure because she was this close to dying of hypothermia. He warmly tells her, You must have a guardian angel watching over you. Puzzled, she asks, what do you mean? If the police chief hadn't stopped by after the department received a call about a potential UFO sighting in the sky, you'd be a frozen carcass, found in the spring when the ground thawed. Deborah does remember hearing a blast, but she figured she imagined it, and she says so. Her brain feels like mush, all the events a jumbled blur. Nope, the doctor says. It was some dumb kid trying to set off fireworks. In the middle of winter? Yep, in the middle of winter. He rolls his eyes. Stupid kid. But it got the police out to investigate. Reaching a hand to her forehead, Deborah touches an elastic bandage. It feels like someone lit them inside my brain, Deborah moans. That's not surprising considering you have some circular lesions from the butt of the rifle, called friction blisters. We're going to keep you under observation for a few days. The doctor looks jubilant, but I must say you have a thick skull, Mrs. Sawyer. I've had to have one, she mumbles, more to herself. You have some surface lacerations from being dragged, but you're fortunate to be alive. We did a CT scan, an X-ray, but we're going to do an MRI today for a more comprehensive view. Make sure there isn't abnormal brain activity like a concussion. My concern was an intracerebral hemorrhage, a brain bleed, but there's no evidence of that. That's comforting. Deborah sighs with relief. What about the farm? Is it still standing? Did they take anything from the house? The doctor shrugs. The police didn't say anything about a robbery. Deborah's asking out of concern for her safety. It's not like she has anything to confiscate. 
Deborah's lucky she wasn't shot with the old rifle for having nothing of value but a few old antiques. Her intention has never been to draw attention to herself. Any person with a lick of common sense knows that people get caught by being too flashy or materialistic. When you give someone a reason to pay attention, that's when the spotlight shines brighter on you. But why now? she wonders. And did the letters have anything to do with this unplanned visit? If Deborah had perished, she could picture the people in town clucking their tongues, shrugging their shoulders in mock grief and speaking about the irony. She was found mere feet away from where Jonathan had tragically died and most would have said she got what she deserved, karma at its finest. The religious zealots would claim God had a hand. Others might say the ghost of Cindy had a hand, that it should have been Deborah, not Cindy, who died all those years ago, as she was an innocent bystander in the whole sordid tale. As if I asked Cindy to involve herself, Deborah thinks bitterly. Chapter Two Deborah. When Deborah goes home from the hospital, she's still wearing a bandage wrapped around her head and some adhesive strips on the less severe abrasions. Though she's starting to recuperate from the superficial wounds, Deborah freezes in nervous anticipation when she hears a knock at the front door, expecting the worst. By far, the psychological damage from the trauma is going to surpass the visible imprints. Tempted to ignore the unwanted visitor, Deborah half-heartedly drags her feet to peek out the picture windows facing the highway. Spotting the neighbor's old truck, she lets out a sigh of relief. When she opens the door slowly, she's face to face with him. Even in her fragile state of mind, he's a sight for sore eyes, even tired ones. Robert lives on a neighboring farm and is a widower. They lost their respective spouses around the same time, and their families used to be close, until tragedy struck. Holding up a grocery bag as a peace offering, Robert tells Deborah he came to check on her. He mentions the prayer circle at church, and says the congregation has added Deborah to their prayer chain. Flustered at this thought, she assumes Robert feels pity for her. Even though Deborah sits in the same pew at church every Sunday, their interactions have been cordial but distant for years. Suddenly, self-conscious of her appearance and used to having a spotless house, Deborah becomes embarrassed because she has a few dishes in the sink and hasn't dusted since before the incident. She didn't plan to invite him in, but after they stand awkwardly at the door for a few minutes, she feels like she has no choice. After she motions Robert to sit at the table, they stare at the empty chair between them in an unbearably long silence fraught with tension. Unpleasant memories belong to this chair, and the owner. It was once Jonathan's, and his cigarette burns are stubbed into the fabric, the pockmarks a permanent reminder of his bad habits. It's apparent they both feel the ghost of him sitting in their midst, the blame game is as prevalent now as it was back then. Neither of them needs to say out loud that they think the other bears a majority of the responsibility for Jonathan's death, because neither would be wrong. No one can deny mistakes were made, some well-intended, a few reckless, others vengeful. But guilt, that's a dangerous thing. That'll eat your insides alive as Deborah is well aware due to the acidity in her stomach lining. If people in town had minded their own business, she runs her hand through her hair, unsettling a few sparse grays, we wouldn't be sitting here like complete strangers. I know, Robert admits in a clipped tone. But there was truth to some of it. We had to be careful. After she offers a cup of coffee, black with no cream or sugar, the way he used to take it, they finally start to talk like old times. Slowly she loosens up, and laughter creeps upon Deborah. Smile lines finally appear on her wrinkled face. She's forgotten how good it feels to have a conversation where there's actual dialogue. The farm cats aren't so adept at answering back. 
When Robert leaves, he promises to come back and install an outdoor security camera and some floodlights. The 70-acre farm has far too much land to have eyes on all of it, but she's grateful the house will be protected. Deborah tries not to read into this renewed friendship, telling herself it was born out of neighborly obligation and nothing more. But she is pleasantly surprised when he calls the next day to invite her over for a friendly card game. Deborah cautiously accepts. Like a true gentleman, he picks her up, and they sit in front of his fireplace to play gin, rummy, and hearts. Deborah returns the favor a few days later by inviting him over to watch television. Then he cooks dinner for her, and they sit at his dining room table and trade stories. After a few weeks, she suggests they have their own book club, which might seem silly with only two people, but they agree on an author to read. Sometimes Robert will sit in the recliner and nod off when it gets late, and Deborah then feels relieved not everything has changed with time. He'll fall asleep with his head at a painful-looking angle, his snores loud enough to rouse an army. Deborah giggles at the memory of him doing this during church sermons. His wife would give him an elbow in the ribs or loudly whisper for him to wake up. Deborah would snicker at her outbursts since they drew more attention than his inconvenient naps because of the echo in the high-ceiling chapel. When his eyelids finally flip open, he wears a sheepish expression on his face. Slapping his knees, he slowly pulls himself out of the chair. He doesn't ask to stay the night, and she never offers. Their companionable silence enjoyable for the two of them up until a point. One warm afternoon when the snow is melted, hopefully for the last time, they go down to the pond on the edge of Deborah's property to fish, a perfect, cloudless April day upon them. They don't need much in the way of conversation, both able to enjoy each other's company, but Deborah is abnormally quiet, a lot weighing on her mind as of late. She had struck the letters from her memory, but now, after a long dry spell, Another one has arrived. She's dying to tell someone, and Robert's the closest she has to a confidant. Pacing the grass, she makes the decision to tell him. With a glance over his shoulder, he shoots her a questioning glance before he throws out his fishing line. The last thing she wants to do is alienate him, and suddenly shy, Deborah second guesses if she should share the secret. Maybe she should wait. It might spark old memories that they've both tried to bury. What is it, honey? Robert reaches out his arm to grab hers in an attempt to stop her aimless wandering. What's wrong? You're lucky that patch of grass is still dead because you've trampled it repeatedly. Deborah can't help but grin at the term of endearment, often said by her husband, but not meant. It was a force of habit, and now sounds different coming from Robert. Natural, even. She blushes like a teenager, beaming with pride. I've really been enjoying my time with you. He squeezes her arm. I feel the same. He's quiet for a moment, and then he says, I know that's not all. No, it's not, she shrugs. You can read me like a book. Always have, he guffaws. Looking down at the brown grass, she murmurs. I have something to tell you, she hurriedly adds. I got a couple letters in the mail, three now, actually. Deborah tells Robert about the letters while his fishing pole bobs up and down, the rippling water movement, the only sound. She can tell he's unnerved by the red flush that spreads from his face and down his neck, disappearing into the collar of his shirt. He finally responds. Did you write back? No. She bites her lip. I'm not sure what to say. Do you think there's an ulterior motive for reaching out? Yes. She rests a frustrated hand on her hip. Money. After all these years. There's a sharp exhale on his end. I thought it was just us there that night. It was, Robert promises. 
The letter mentions the gun. What about it? They claim to know what happened to it. I dumped it in the pond, Debbie. He shields his face from the sunlight. It's someone messing with you. He reaches a hand out to hold hers. Everything's going to be fine, honey. I'm here with you now. Do you ever think about that night? No. But his abrupt release of her hand tells her he's being untruthful. I hear his shrieks sometimes in the night. Deborah. She chokes on a sob. I wish my actions hadn't hurt so many people. Stop, Robert demands. This doesn't help us getting all emotional. No one was there but us. Deborah inhales a ragged breath, reminding herself all she can do is breathe. Just breathe, Deborah. I don't know what to do, she whimpers. I'm worried this can only mean trouble. Not on my watch. His voice sharpens. Give me some time. I take it you kept the letters? Yes, her voice quivers. Give them to me, I'll think of something. He nudges her arm gently. You'll let me know if another letter comes. Of course, but there's more. She hesitates. The letters are sent from a P.O. box that supposedly belongs to her. Robert grimaces. After all this time? Not trusting herself to speak, Deborah stares down at the hole she's dug in the barren grass. Before Robert can respond, she watches his hand tremble, the line bobbing up and down. I think I got something. Watching in amazement, Deborah's impressed at how Robert expertly holds the line almost taut. Did you get a hit? Nodding, he keeps his hand underneath the reel, while his index finger and forefinger skillfully press down on the line. Nibble or bite? They might have just taken the bait. Glimpsing tiny swells in the water, Robert lifts the rod up at a ninety-degree angle to reel it in. They both chuckle when they realize the lure is gone, but no fish is attached to the hook. As they enjoy the solitude, Robert moves closer to her as she snuggles into his side. When he brushes a large hand through her windswept hair, Deborah winces. Nothing seems to get past him, and looking concerned, he tenderly touches a swollen lump on her head. Sounding alarmed, he asks, What happened to your head? It was a fall, nothing serious. Yet Deborah can't meet his eyes. Looks pretty serious to me. Robert motions to her leg. You also weren't limping a couple of days ago. Her mouth puckers like she's tasted something sour. This getting old is not for the weak of heart. He sighs. How did you fall? Trying to carry a laundry basket down those dreadful stairs. Those stairs are a death trap. How is it that no one's fallen down them before this? Deborah's mouth drops open and she stammers, then thinks better of it and shakes her head. Robert waits for her to continue, but she stares distractedly out at the water. She's not sure she wants to tell him what prompted her to lose her balance. She knows he's already worried about her mental state. Depressed and weepy, Deborah's unable to sleep. Night terror is a constant invasion. Debbie, he softens his voice. What don't you want to tell me? If anyone else called her Debbie instead of Deborah, she'd automatically correct them. But she finds she doesn't mind at all when he says it. Finally, she relents. Do you believe in ghosts? I know I've heard enough ghost stories to last a lifetime, yet every one ends with more questions than answers. Well... The farmhouse is over a hundred and fifty years old. She takes a deep breath before she lays it on him. A lot of people have lived and died on this land. What do you mean? I don't think my fall was accidental. Deborah shrugs out of his grasp. Someone shoved me down the stairs. He looks incredulous. You were pushed down the stairs? Her face burns crimson. 
Robert's eyes convey the dread that Deborah feels. By whom? I don't know, she sighs. But I felt a hand grip my shoulder. Whose hand? His eyes drill into hers. It felt cold, too cold, like it didn't belong in this world. You think a ghost made you lose your balance? He snorts. <laughs> Come on, Debbie. You can't honestly expect me to believe some evil spirit pushed you down the stairs. Deborah silently counts to ten, trying to maintain her composure. She knows how this must sound. Maybe it was the ghost of Jonathan, he adds disdainfully, or Edward. Ignoring his scorn, she hurries on before she loses her courage. It didn't feel as heavy as a man's touch, more delicate, like a female. A dead woman pushed you down the stairs. Maybe Cindy, she muses. Don't bring her into this. His eyes narrow in annoyance. Defensive, Deborah says. I think someone wants to hurt me. Tears start to cloud her eyes, and seemingly taken aback by her emotion, Robert shifts uncomfortably on his feet. I know since they built that prison, this place hasn't felt safe. Robert says, empathetically. And I'm sure that random act of violence didn't help matters. How can you be so sure it was a random act? I think they thought you'd have cash or jewelry, a robbery gone bad. One of our other neighbors got their place cased for the very same reason. She says, brooding, Do you think I'll ever know who wanted to hurt me? Doubtful. He sighs. If they stole something, there would be serial numbers to trace or something to find. Rankled, Deborah stares off into the distance at nothing but fields and an endless highway. She wishes she could go back in time, before she knew of anyone named Jonathan or Robert, before she had to carry the weight of the world on her shoulders. Maybe you'll remember specific details along the way, he offers. Has your memory been jogged since you came home from the hospital? Unsure if she should admit this, Deborah says quickly, spitting the words out in a jumble. I swear they had blonde hair. Because of what? They had light-colored eyebrows. That's about all I could see in the eye slits. What about their eye color? A naturally dark, like charcoal. She automatically tenses up. I could only see for a moment on the porch. You think it was a guy with blonde hair and dark eyes? I don't know, she admits. But it definitely was a man. Deborah thinks about this as they pack up their fishing gear. If it was a chance encounter with a stranger, then why does she have an unsettled feeling of being watched? Shuddering at this idea, she doesn't hear what Robert says until he lightly taps her on the shoulder. Deborah leaps backward before she realizes he's asking her a question. Are you okay? He frowns. Yeah, I... Uh, I just was thinking about all of this. She waves a hand around. It's a lot. I know, he agrees. That's why I just asked if you had given any more thought to my suggestion. After the assault, Robert asked if she'd consider seeing a psychologist, psychiatrist, or hypnotist. Sensitive about her past and feeling harped on, she told him to drop it. Look, Robert says. You told me you can't sleep since the, since the incident. You're sleep deprived, and I'm sure it's not helping you function. I mean, your skin and bones, and you didn't have the weight to lose to begin with. Without looking at him, she stares straight ahead. You think a shrink can fix me because I'm crazy? Yes, I, I mean, no. Robert clears his throat. That's not what I mean. I'm worried about you. She stiffens when Robert lays a hand on her arm. What happened to you was disgusting and senseless. Random or not, it doesn't matter. There's no way to escape unscathed from something that awful. You're a strong woman, but damn it, there are limits, Debbie. I know, 
she murmurs. He hunches his shoulders. I'm just scared, is all. I don't want to lose you. Flippant, she asks. Are you afraid I'll lose my mind again, or that someone will finish the job? Both. He shakes his head sadly. Both, Deborah. It's not the answer she wants, but it's the truth. I don't want you to be worried for me. She threads her small fingers through his large ones as they walk back toward the house. Deborah can't help but notice his troubled expression at the sight of the thin gold wedding band she has on. How could you still wear that? It comforts me. That ring isn't symbolic of peace. A lot of lives got ruined. His tone is harsh. I'd hardly call that reassuring. It reminds me of how relieved I felt when that night was over, she explains. It was like a resurrection of sorts. Deborah could breathe again, and it was as if she had risen from her own grave, even if it meant putting Jonathan in his. And it felt good, wholesome even. She can tell by Robert's clenched jaw he disagrees. That might be why you feel Jonathan's presence. Maybe it's time to think about a change. Not wanting to rock the boat, she tugs on his fingers. Do you really think trying to talk to a professional again will help? It couldn't hurt, he chides her. We need a fresh start, Debbie. I've been burned before, she divulges. I don't want to be taken away and force-fed pills. I wouldn't let that happen to you. Inside, she screams, You've let it happen before. But she knows that's not fair. It was a different time, and there were others to consider. It was selfish to ask him to put her needs above everything else. Being assaulted had to be traumatic for you. He tightens his grip on her hand. I hate that it happened, and I wasn't around to protect you. But if it hadn't... His voice trails off. What? I doubt we'd be standing here right now. His sorrowful eyes peer deeply at Deborah, the mood becoming somber. It's a terrible thing to say. I just... I'm glad we reconnected. His old pickup truck is pulled around the garage, hidden in the brush, just in case his kids or their neighbors drive by. They both agree they aren't ready for tongues to start a wagon again, at least not this soon. After setting his fishing pole and tackle box in the bed of the truck, he slides his hands gently around her waist to give Deborah a warm embrace. After they separate, Robert gives her a kiss and climbs up into the driver's seat. Wait. He opens the middle console, rummaging through the contents until he finds what he's looking for. Ah, here it is. Pressing a business card into her hand, he seems ambivalent. A friend gave me this card a while back. You know, when I was dealing with my wife's death. Or I should say, when I hadn't dealt with her death. He takes a deep breath. This doctor comes highly recommended. Unsure of how to respond, and on rocky footing with the topic of his wife's death, she closes her palm around the heavy cardstock. Thank you. I won't bring it up again, he promises. I just want you to feel better. PTSD is a real thing. Although her external injuries have healed, her renewed terror at living on the farm alone hasn't. After every sunset, at the first trace of dusk, her insides clench in apprehension as Deborah imagines a stranger waiting in the gloomy night, ready to pounce and finish the job. I know, she nods her head. But even with seeing someone, I don't know if I'll ever feel safe again. It might be time for a change. Robert is grim. Before he drives off, he gives her hand one final squeeze, and Deborah can't imagine giving him up for anything. If Robert thinks she should seek help, then maybe she should. It might even make him more inclined to want a relationship with her, especially since he witnessed the fallout from before. She doesn't want him to think she's unstable, 
or deranged. That's all in the past, isn't it? But in this moment, Deborah is suddenly unsure. Chapter 3 Deborah Sitting in her vehicle until 8 a.m. on the dot, Deborah clasps the now tattered business card in her hand. She arrived early for the appointment, but her nerves got the best of her. Distrustful that this quack doctor would be any different or wiser, she circled the block, then opted for a parking spot behind the building instead of in plain sight. She's had enough curious and threatening stares over the years in this tiny town. Robert recommended this woman, she reminds herself. And he's not like Jonathan. He's better. Kind. His concern is from a place of caring, not selfishness. With this in mind, Deborah hesitantly enters the office from the back door instead of the front entrance. After shutting it softly behind herself, she's tempted to open it and run back to the safety of her automobile. The shades are drawn in the waiting room if you can call the small area that, but Deborah doesn't spot a receptionist, which is a relief. In fact, there's no check-in desk or bell, and there's always a bell to ring for service. When she announces her presence aloud, it's garbled, and even her name sounds foreign to her ears. She starts to pace the small room, and fighting the instinct to run, she forces herself to take a seat in a plush chair in the corner. Then, unable to relax in the elegant chair, Deborah fiddles with the strap of her purse. Staring at the pale blue walls, she's reminded of an article she read in one of her home improvement magazines. Or maybe it was, oh, Oprah's magazine. It said the walls of doctors' offices are painted soft colors like this shade of blue or light green because the colors have been shown to be soothing though she despises bright, vibrant colors and loud wallpaper, the pastel tone isn't warming her up to this visit. Deborah agreed to come only to show Robert she was serious about starting the healing process and merging their lives. Suddenly, as if Deborah had snapped her fingers, a woman in her mid-forties appears. Too much of her face is covered by thick black glasses, a contrast to the platinum hair. The picture Robert showed her on the website when she scheduled an appointment online matches the woman perfectly, minus the white lab coat and black dress, with Dr. Alakoy, clinical psychiatrist, on it. Today she's more casual, wearing linen pants and a flowered tunic. At first glance she appears harsh, cold even, not a strand out of place in her stern updo. But when Dr. Alakoy opens her mouth, the crinkles at the corners express her desire to smile, and it transforms her demeanor instantaneously. Deborah feels an immediate warmth and familiarity with this woman. Maybe it's because they've bumped into each other around town, but she feels like a kindred spirit. Deborah Sawyer? The doctor not only shakes her hand, but allows her soft one to linger over Deborah's trembling one. I'm Alice Alakoy, and I'm so glad you could make it. You came highly recommended. That's sweet of you to say. She lets out a slight chuckle. I'll ignore the fact this town has limited options, and there aren't many choices. This is true, as Deborah's previous doctor has retired. Unsure what to say, she simply stands to follow the tall woman into an adjoining room, an exact replica of the one she just came from. Painted the same color, it has coordinating furniture. The only difference is the large, polished mahogany desk sitting astutely in the middle. It's uncluttered and empty, save for a laptop and printer. Dr. Alakoy points to the sitting area on the left, where an overstuffed chair and a small leather couch beckon them. A little side table rests between the two pieces of furniture. Take your pick. Where will you be sitting? On whichever one you don't choose. That is, if you're comfortable with it. She motions to the desk. Or if you prefer, I can sit here and take notes. 
It's just not as easy to hear you across the room. Hesitating for a moment, Deborah chews her lip before deciding on the couch. Great. Dr. Alakoy claps her hands. Before we get started, is there anything I can get for you? Maybe some coffee or tea? Deborah rests her purse next to her, though for some reason keeping the strap around her fingers feels oddly therapeutic. So she keeps the leather loose around her knuckles. Deborah winces as she has a flashback to them bloodied and bruised from the steel-toed boots that stepped on them. Dr. Alakoy offers to light a candle. I've got either a vanilla or a lavender one. Deborah read in the same magazine that mentioned relaxing paint colors that flowering plants could alleviate anxiety. Maybe a scent could calm her nerves. How about lavender? Perfect. Dr. Alakoy scans the room and locates the candle on the window ledge. After setting it on a mosaic glass platter, she pulls a lighter from her pocket. Did you know they used to use lavender to help purify mummies? No, I did not. Dr. Alakoy sniffs the air. The camphor is subtle, yet distinct. Deborah inhales a deep breath. Dr. Alakoy smiles at her. Lavender has been an essential oil since practically the beginning of time. Used to soften the skin and cover up odors back then, but also as a part of the embalming process. I like that it's not an overpowering smell. Absolutely, that's the draw of it. The way it sucks you in without being overly potent. With a candle between them on the side table, Dr. Alakoy casually steps out of her clogs, and tucks her bare feet up underneath her, as if they're old friends catching up and need to be as comfortable as possible. First, she reaches for Deborah's hand and gives it a gentle squeeze before she lets it go. I'd like you to call me Alice. No doctor this or doctor that. I'm here to act as a guide in your journey to self-enlightenment and healing. I'll know I've done my job if you feel better than you do at this moment. Alice fixes her with a caring smile. This is a judgment-free zone, and it only works if we have open communication lines and trust. I realize this isn't easy. I'm a stranger, and telling someone your innermost thoughts or feelings can be hard, especially with a shrink. By the way, Alice mutters, I hate that word, but she gives Deborah's knee a quick tap. If I can listen and advise you on the best course of treatment, then we will make progress. But it's not just up to me. It's up to you. Deborah slowly nods, unclear what Dr. Alakoy is implying. You'll have to do the work, put in the time. Alice peers at her through the massive lenses of her glasses. I take it you're open to whatever type of therapy or recommendation I make. Deborah feels her face redden, as if Alice can detect her reservations. You're here because you want to feel better. Yes. You seem unsure. Alice points out gently. I just want to make sure you're on board. Many people are coerced into seeking help, and the success rate is minimal if it's not what you want. Of course I want to feel better, Deborah snaps. Alice sits back as if she's been slapped, but quickly recovers. Sorry, it's just... Deborah takes a deep breath. <sighs> I've had some bad experiences with therapy. To be honest, I've seen a psychiatrist before, and I have mixed feelings. Don't apologize, Alice murmurs. It's quite all right. You're not offending me. They consider each other for a moment while Alice rests a finger on her chin. Was it because of the doctor or the treatment? Both, she sniffs. I didn't like the outcome. Alice opens her mouth to speak, but Deborah isn't ready to address her comment. I value my privacy. Deborah twists the thin gold band around her finger. Nothing stays quiet in a town this size. Everyone knows everyone's business, regardless if they should. Are you alluding to something public 
or a breach of confidentiality. Alice must notice Deborah's pained expression and adds, Your concerns are valid. Our conversations and sessions are strictly between you and me, unless, of course, someday you want or need a medical release for other treatment. Also, to be clear, even though you were referred to me by a mutual friend, he isn't privy to our sessions unless you want him to be. Deborah stares down at her lap, silently processing this. Trust is a hard thing to come by, especially now. Alice's blue eyes flash with worry. I want to hear about what brings you here today and delve into the past. But first, let's start with your medical history so I have the full picture. She reaches forward and pulls out a notepad from the small drawer in the side table. Do you mind if I take some notes? This way I can go back for clarity if I need to. Uh... Deborah twists uncomfortably on the couch. I guess not. Alice starts off with simple yes or no questions, as if earnestly preparing Deborah for the easy parts of an exam until she can interrogate her on the harder subjects. And finally, Alice does just that, making a smooth transition by asking Deborah about the incident that prompted this visit. Tapping her pen against her cheek, Alice says, Let's talk about what happened. Okay, Deborah anxiously tugs at her cross necklace. About three months ago, in January, I was inside my home when I heard a noise outside. She tightens her grip on the thin chain. It scared me since I'm on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Besides that, it was nighttime and the middle of winter. I thought I saw something outside, but I told myself it was my mind playing tricks, especially since my night vision isn't the best. Alice is fixated squarely on her, her pen poised, unmoving. When I went outside to check it out, I managed to slip and fall on a patch of ice. With a quivering voice, Deborah falters. I was right, someone was there, and that person hit me repeatedly with my own rifle kicked me, and left me for dead. The color drains from Alice's fair skin. Before we talk about the after effects, I have to ask, is there a police report? The creases in Alice's forehead deepen. Do they have any suspects? Yes, Deborah sighs. There's a police report, but they haven't mentioned anyone. Ever since they built that men's prison outside of town, we've had an influx of crime. Deborah shudders. Escaped convicts using the farms as their hideout. I'd like to think they are still investigating this closely. Alice shakes her head. How awful. It definitely has been a test of my faith. Were you wearing that necklace? Alice nods at the cross, tangled in Deborah's fingers. I was. Deborah gives her a small smile. It belonged to my mother. My father was a preacher. It might have saved your life. I thought psychiatrists didn't believe in the power of prayer and God. I wouldn't say that. To each their own. Alice shrugs. And this is about your beliefs, not anyone else's. Speaking of saved lives, I'm lucky I was found and didn't freeze to death. Deborah groans. I spent three days in the hospital while they did some tests. I'm guessing you had some injuries from this, Alice asks. Maybe even concussive symptoms or a hematoma as a result of the fall. Yes, I had a concussion. Deborah focuses upward on the ceiling so she doesn't burst into tears. As a result, I'm experiencing a lot of headaches. Migraines, actually. I'm dizzy as soon as I wake up, and my ears ring at times. Did they do a brain scan? Yes, both a CT and MRI. Alice stares at her notes, tapping her pen in thought. First, I'd like to request those medical records so I can review both scans. 
I'm guessing your brain activity didn't show signs of tumors or torn tissue. Correct. Anything else you've noticed since then? Alice points to Deborah's leg. Any issues with your motor skills? I noticed you had a slight limp. Did they do a neurological exam to check your coordination and balance? That's from another accident, Deborah stammers. I fell down the stairs a week ago. Ignoring the surprise behind the large spectacles Alice is wearing, Deborah continues. I live in an old farmhouse, and the steps are wooden and pretty steep. I sprained my wrist and hurt my leg. How did you fall? I tripped. Did anything cause you to trip? My own klutziness, Deborah says with a nervous laugh. Any hallucinations, visual or auditory? No, Deborah lies. It's more than the attack that has Deborah concerned. Lately, her brain has seemed muddled, as if she's taken a handful of hallucinogenic drugs, like the time in high school when she mistakenly ate some shrooms and objects appeared to take on their own ominous shapes. A couple of days ago, Deborah was driving at nighttime when she swerved to avoid a collision with what she thought was a deer, but in reality, it was a telephone pole. Embarrassingly enough, she was pulled over as a possible intoxicated driver. The police officer cautioned her about driving in her lethargic state, said being unalert was as dangerous as driving drunk. She couldn't tell him the wooden posts reminded her of moving animals, the electrical wires impersonating outstretched limbs. But Deborah doesn't feel like confiding in Alice about what happened. If Deborah said it out loud, even to her own ears, it would sound bonkers. She doubts Alice will be able to cover up a judgmental reaction. She'll probably suggest she be thrown in the loony bin for good. Alice tilts her head, as if suspecting her of dishonesty. Another reason for the neurological exam is to check your vision. You'd be surprised how your body works in conjunction or against other muscles, organs, and tissues. Speaking of, when was the last time you had an eye exam? Um, Deborah tries to remember. I believe it was last year. I suggest both visiting your optometrist and scheduling another neurological exam, since the fall was recent. Okay. Deborah consents. I can do that. Has a doctor prescribed any meds? Pain pills? Oxycontin? For sleeping? Trazodone? Wait, Deb. Alice writes something on her pad. Deborah, she corrects. I go by Deborah. Of course, Deborah. Alice repeats. Deborah, got it. Since you are prescribed sleeping pills, can you talk to me about your issues with sleeping? I didn't sleep well to begin with, and it's even worse now. It's hard to feel like I get a good night's rest. What happens when you go to bed? Nightmares, Deborah stammers, about the stranger coming back to finish me off. Do you know if you talk in your sleep? Um, no, I don't. Alice points at Deborah's wedding band. I notice the ring, and if it's one thing I know, your spouse will tell you when they don't get rest because of you. My husband woke the whole household up, including the farm animals, much to our detriment. Stopping suddenly, Alice shakes her head. But I'm digressing. My point is, they'll typically mention if you talk in your sleep. Flail. Heck, even kick or punch. Deborah raises her eyebrow at this. People punch in their sleep? Some people have very vivid reactions. Alice shrugs, especially to dreams. Have you ever had a dream that seemed so real you woke up and were mad about it? Now that I think about it, yes, Deborah says. But I live alone, so I couldn't tell you about my sleep patterns. Alice looks at her with curiosity. Deborah explains. I was married, but I've been widowed for a long, long time, and my boyfriend, 
The word boyfriend sounds so juvenile coming out of her mouth, so Deborah rephrases. Robert and I tend to sleep at our own houses. Alice claps her hands. I didn't know Robert was dating anyone, but I'm glad to hear it. In her head, Deborah mutters a curse word. She wasn't supposed to tell anyone they were dating. It was what they both agreed to. Do you mind if we keep that private? Deborah's face burns with embarrassment. We, we wanted to keep it between us for now. We connected after my attack, and we're moving slow. Certainly. Alice shrugs. Our sessions are strictly between us. I know you mentioned being a widow, which has to be difficult. Alice leans forward. What was your husband's name? I want to be sure I know who you're referencing when we talk. Jonathan. How long has Jonathan been gone? About sixteen years. What was the cause of death? It's complicated. Deborah presses a hand to her forehead, suddenly feverish. Alice stares at her in puzzlement. He's deceased, though. Yes. My... My husband... Deborah's heart starts to pound, and she's sure Alice can hear it. Would you mind... She clears her throat, unable to catch her breath. With a racing heart, she whispers, Could I please have a glass of water? Alice presses gently on Deborah's shoulder. Absolutely, I'll be right back. Deborah's mind is reeling while she waits for Alice to exit the room. Her footsteps echo across the hard wood when she returns with the water. After thrusting the cold glass into Deborah's palm, Alice hands her a couple of pills. These are just regular old Tylenol. Thank you, Deborah murmurs. I've got the worst headache. I figured. Alice motions to the couch. I could tell by the grimace on your face. Leaning forward to move a decorative pillow, Alice offers. Go ahead and lie down if you like. I'm sorry, Deborah apologizes, moving her purse to the floor so she can lie down. I'm not feeling so hot right now. Nothing to be sorry for. Alice gently helps Deborah reposition herself on the couch, settling the pillow underneath her head. Do you mind if we stop for a minute? Deborah shuts her eyes. Of course. Alice shoves her feet back in her shoes and perches on the chair. We are in no rush. I'm on your timetable. Feeling dizzy, Deborah is relieved Alice doesn't continue to pepper her with questions, but is content to sit there in silence or at least accept the lull in the conversation. Though she means to ask Alice a burning question, she quickly forgets what she wants to know, the pounding in her head taking precedence. Half asleep, Deborah feels a cold compress on her forehead and a hand resting on her shoulder. Just as suddenly, the warm touch disappears, but the washcloth stays in place. A moment later, she hears the door rattle open and shut with a soft thud. Deborah can listen to Alice talking to whoever is presumably the next client, but the voice has a familiar lilt to it. She groans. The last thing Deborah needs is someone local thinking she needs to be shipped off to a mental ward again. Even though that would be the pot calling the kettle black, she's used to the hypocrisy. Deborah's grateful when she overhears Alice say, My office is currently occupied, so let's do our session out here today. She doesn't realize she's fallen asleep until Alice gently tugs on her shoulder. Timidly, Deborah sits up and runs a hand through her tousled hair. Thanking Alice for respecting her privacy, she feels less stressed and more relaxed after her nap. Of course. Alice ushers her out to the main room. I can tell we're going to be in it for the long haul. We're going to work through this together, all right? Deborah gives her a non-committal smile. I'll see you in a week, and we'll go from there. Hurrying out to her vehicle, Deborah breathes a sigh of relief. Chapter 4 
Deborah. The following Wednesday, Deborah shows up at Dr. Alakoy's office, prompt but nervous. She's wearing dark sunglasses, her old fears causing anxiety about being spotted in the back lot. When she walks inside the building, she's grateful the shades on the windows are still drawn. Hi, Deborah. Alice greets her cheerfully and summons her to the back, where she motions for her to pick either the chair or couch again. Today, Dr. Alakoy is wearing a crisp white blouse, tucked into dark jeans, with a brightly colored scarf wound around her neck. Her hair is still in a severe bun, and her earrings are simple gold studs. Deborah sinks into the soft, buttery leather couch as Alice settles into the chair with her notepad, this time keeping her feet on the floor. They make small talk before they dive in. Deborah notices that Alice likes to slide her diamond wedding band up and down her ring finger. So, Alice asks, how are you doing this week? I'm okay. Your limp doesn't seem as pronounced. Are you getting along any better? They gave me a cane in case I need it, but I do okay without it. Deborah fails to mention she's able to cope because of the pain pills she's taking quite frequently. She doesn't want to rouse concern in Alice that she's painless only when medicated. How are the nightmares? The same. I want to circle back to your sleep patterns, if that's all right. Alice waits for Deborah to nod her head. Before the nightmares started, did it just take you a long time to fall asleep, but once there you'd stay asleep? Or has falling asleep and waking up in the middle of the night been problematic? Deborah clenches the leather strap of her purse again for emotional support. I could fall asleep, but I'd wake up a lot and sometimes I don't know where I am. Can you elaborate on that? I'll find myself wandering in another room of the house. I've fallen out of bed in the middle of the night and woken up on the floor. Last time we discussed an updated visual and neurological exam. Alice pushes her glasses up the bridge of her nose. To rule out issues with your coordination and vision, have you made an appointment with either doctor? I made an appointment with a neurologist and my eye doctor. My vision's been a tad blurry, Deborah says, and sometimes objects seem to take on other shapes or get twisted. Do you drink alcohol? No, Deborah makes a face. I don't even keep liquor in my house. Have you ever heard the term REM sleep behavior disorder? Alice asks also known as rapid eye movement behavior disorder. I haven't, Deborah shakes her head. Are you familiar with the typical sleep pattern? I know there are sleep stages. Yes, correct. There are two, actually. One is called non-rapid eye movement, and the other is rapid eye movement. In someone with a sleep disorder, like the one I mentioned, the REM is either lacking or absent, causing someone to act out their dreams. This can force a person to jump out of bed or take part in behaviors they normally wouldn't. Deborah tilts her head, unsure of what to say. The room suddenly feels stuffy, and Deborah unbuttons her light jacket. <sighs> Maybe I'm getting a hot flash. She waves a hand toward her forehead in a cooling motion. I can check the temperature and turn on the fan, Alice offers. I want you to be comfy. I'll survive, Deborah gives her a weak smile. I'm starting to fall apart in my old age. You're hardly old, Alice chuckles. I can't even believe you have a daughter old enough to be out of the house. A daughter? Yes, Alice gives her an inquisitive stare. You mentioned her last time. I didn't. Deborah frowns. Yes. Alice scans the notepad with wire-rimmed glasses that are better suited for her face and not so colossal. No. Deborah licks her lips. I wouldn't have a reason to mention her. Oh, Lord. Alice taps a hand to her forehead. Please forgive me. 
Deborah stares her down, swallowing a biting comment. How unprofessional of me. Alice shakes her head in annoyance. But Robert mentioned your daughter in passing. He gave you a compliment. She rushes to add, this was before you and I had even met. Why would the two of you be discussing me? I thanked him for the referral after you made an appointment. Alice gives her a wink. He mentioned he knew you from way back because his son and your daughter went to high school together. And our farms aren't too far from each other. Deborah shrugs. And we go to the same church. I know his kids are grown, Alice grins. And you certainly don't look old enough to have one that age, so you better let me in on your secrets. My advice is to get knocked up at nineteen, Deborah says calmly but seriously. Deborah's mother warned her it was easy to get pregnant at that age, and a giggle escapes her lips when she thinks back to her warning. It went unheeded since her mother's advice wasn't always reliable. A lot of the time it was passed down like an old wives' tale. Alice gives her a peculiar look. What's so funny? Uh, something my mother told me as a teenager. Let's hear it, Alice says. I need a laugh. She told me how easy it was to get pregnant. She said just looking at a man would do the trick. And for some reason, remembering her saying it all those years ago and how I didn't take her seriously made me chuckle. Jonathan's idea of intercourse was equivalent to that of a farm animal. He'd shove his sweaty body into hers in a frenzy, releasing his aggression after a couple of thrusts and grunts. She wasn't sure they could conceive because it was over so fast, and he never asked if she got any pleasure from it. In her mind, it wasn't lovemaking, so it didn't equate to making a baby like in the romance novels she would devour. Tell me about your parents. Are they alive? Alice asks. I know you mentioned your father was a man of God. My father was a preacher, and he died when I was in my early twenties. Heart attack, Deborah says. My mother died a few years later, an accidental overdose. I miss my mother the most, she muses. She was strong and scrappy. Deborah's mother wasn't an affectionate woman. She doled out love sparingly. But when she did indulge her child, she gave the warmest hugs, which made Deborah feel wholly and completely loved. Deborah had promised herself that when she became a mother, she wouldn't withhold affection or love, and there would be an abundance of it. Her thoughts drift from her deceased mother to her estranged daughter. Though the estrangement was entirely unexpected, it shouldn't have been. She made a solemn vow to be the best possible mother yet she feels like a failure. Alice's voice cuts into her thoughts. Did your mother hate being a preacher's wife? You mean because that's what she was known as, with no identity of her own? Yeah, Alice says. It would be hard to have the expectations for you to be perfect all the time. No one can stand on a pedestal and never fall. She had her moments but she prized the role, and she knew how to bring out the best in my father. No one could have brought out his personality more than her, and he could be difficult. She gasps involuntarily. And cunning. Deborah no longer wishes to talk about her parents, so deciding on a subject change, she murmurs, That reminds me, Alice. Speaking of our families, why don't I know any other Alicoys? Did you not grow up around here? I didn't. She offers a small smile. Weird, right? I grew up in Ohio. What brought you here? Marriage, Alice shrugs. And even now I live 25 miles away. And this is where you wanted to open up a practice? Not necessarily. I have office space countywide. It's an easy drive, all highway. Alice glances at her notes, back to business. I know you live on a farm, and I'd like to know how you feel living out there, considering the circumstances. 
Can you elaborate on your mindset since the accident? I have a security system now, Deborah mentions, and the police on speed dial. Do you ever see yourself moving into town or closer to civilization? Deborah chortles. I know the land is invaluable, especially to certain individuals who want to rezone it for something else. Deborah sighs. Unfortunately, everyone has always wanted the farm for their own intentions. I realized too late my husband married me for the stretch of property my folks passed down to us after we got married. Speaking of your husband, I think you said his name was Jonathan, Alice murmurs. Last time before you left, the loss of him was mentioned. Alice crosses her legs. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to trigger a negative response along the lines of a panic attack. Is this something you want to talk about? Not particularly. I'm guessing he had to have been very young when he died. Alice says gently, if it was sixteen years ago. Yes, is all Deborah feels like responding with. Then let me ask you this. Alice taps her fingernails on the arm of the chair. Will talking about it help with unresolved issues from the past? Deborah doesn't answer, focusing on the polished hardwood floor. Her eyes drift to the empty desk, devoid of photographs or wall hangings near it. Maybe because Alice isn't here every day, she doesn't bother to decorate. Or maybe she doesn't want her clients to have a peek into her home life. All it takes is one psychopath to threaten your family. Alice probably prefers to keep her personal life private. It's not going to keep Deborah from asking, though. Do you have children, Alice? I do, she says hesitantly. I have a son and a daughter. How old? My son is seventeen. My daughter is in her twenties. Are you married? Yes, Alice says coyly. Why do you ask? Because I made a lot of decisions based on keeping my family together, right or wrong. I can understand that. Alice abruptly stands. If you're not ready to talk about your late husband, we can save that for our next session. Touching the knotted scarf at her throat, Alice says, In the meantime, we can look at something to help with your other ailments. Besides what you mentioned last time, are you taking any over-the-counter meds or other prescriptions? No. Antidepressants? Nope. Alice moves to the laptop at her desk. I want to prescribe something different as a sleep aid and a medication for your migraines. Let's try these and find out if there are side effects and go from there. Clicking her nails on the keyboard, Alice confirms. You said you don't drink or keep alcohol in the house. I do not drink. Good to know, because you shouldn't drink on these meds, Alice warns. Where do you want me to send them? Deborah prefers to handle most of her business in the next town over. Her prescriptions are filled at the small pharmacy there, and it gives her an air of anonymity. Deborah's relieved Alice doesn't ask her about using a different zip code. After tapping a few more keys, Alice gives her a smile. Okay, I submitted the scripts. You should be able to pick up today. Thank you. I'd like to see you in a few weeks, if that's all right with you. Alice scans her computer screen to see how you're adjusting and to talk about whatever you're comfortable with. That works. Alice hands Deborah an appointment card, which is nothing more than a circle date and time. As she's exiting the office, Deborah makes a quick stop. Twisting around, she turns to consider Alice. Dr. Alicoy, barely glancing up from her laptop, she murmurs, Uh-huh. What was the compliment, then? Alice peers at her from over the screen. Beg your pardon? You said Robert paid me a compliment. That he did, Alice grins. He said you made the best pies in the county. Deborah shrugs. 
I did win a blue ribbon at the state fair. Where I come from, the state fair doesn't compare to the one here. Maybe I'll be lucky enough to try one sometime. Giving her a thumbs up, Deborah pauses at the door to retrieve her sunglasses. Sliding them back on, she smiles to herself, thinking of Robert. With a glance in both directions, she heads to her car, a noticeable bounce in her step that's still with her when she gets home. Then, with more energy than she has had in a long time, Deborah goes on a cleaning spree, wiping fingerprints and dirt from the windows, dusting the furniture and sweeping the kitchen floor. Running the vacuum over the carpet, she maneuvers it through the downstairs rooms until her hip starts to throb. It's not like I'm going to venture upstairs anyway, she consoles herself. It's too spooky up there. Robert's coming over for dinner later, and she smiles, remembering the compliment he paid her to Alice. Scouring the cupboards and the walk-in pantry, Deborah checks to see if she has all the ingredients to bake an apple pie. By the time it's in the oven, Deborah has flour smudged on her cheeks and discarded apple cores on the countertop and floor. With an hour timer set and feeling sudden fatigue, she crashes in her usual chair, watching mindless television while rocking back and forth, as if she can lull herself to sleep. The constant motion prevents Deborah from thinking about the strange man seated next to her in Jonathan's recliner. She asks herself why she hasn't gotten rid of the battered chair, but she doesn't have a good answer, mainly because after Jonathan died, she didn't want her daughter to ask questions or take offense. Deborah supposes she's had sixteen years to make a change and hasn't. The man in the usually empty spot seems disturbed, his face covered in bits of toilet paper and shaving cream as if he didn't bother to consult a mirror while shaving his stubble. Peering at him with concern, Deborah notices a rough patch of skin that looks like a scar, as if something as sharp as a razor is jutting across his face. Perhaps a knife. When he notices her looking, he moves his head toward her, as if wanting to engage her in conversation. Trying not to flinch at the sight of his half-closed eyelid, Deborah drops her gaze to her hands clenched on the armrest. She doesn't want to be rude, but his lid reminds her of something absent-mindedly stitched up by a needle and thread. His lips move, but she can't make out the words. Deborah is annoyed by this. She's always hated when people try to talk over the television. Jonathan used to do that, and she'd eventually get huffy and walk out of the room. Though now that she thinks about it, that was smart of him. It ensured he got the remote and television all to himself. And with only one TV in the house, it was calculated, like everything else he did. Though she wants to focus on the chatter of the infomercial, Deborah cocks her head to the side, straining to hear what he keeps repeating beside her. She doesn't want to look at him, but it's no use. You owe me money he says testily. You want to keep the farm, don't you? Surprised at this pronouncement, Deborah shushes him. I mean it. Pay up. Trying to keep him out of her line of sight, she goes so far as to pick up the remote and turn the volume louder, a universal signal to be quiet. I'm not leaving until we're squared. Would you just shut up? Deborah's lip quivers. Please, for five seconds. And then what? Then I'll deal with you. But it's no use. His incessant demands don't cease, and frustrated, Deborah explodes out of her chair, tossing the remote into Jonathan's recliner. She angrily strides into the kitchen. When the timer beeps to signal the pie is done, she can still hear him chanting from the other room. Frustrated, Deborah watches the glass pie tin rattle after she sets it down harder than she intends to. Avoiding the living room and the man's raised voice, she walks the long way around to enter her bedroom. When she's safe inside the master bedroom, she locks herself in the bathroom. After reaching into the medicine cabinet, Deborah fumbles with the bottle. 
She cups her hands in place of using an actual water glass, tips her head back, and swallows the pills down quickly, imagining them slowing down the rampant thoughts running through her mind. Her brain needs a break from the uncontrollable mania. She slowly sinks to her knees and crawls to the corner of the bathroom, resting her back against the wall. With no recollection of nodding off, she wakes to find spittle pooling in the creases of her mouth. After she swipes her hand over her eyes, her vision appears blurred, as if due to a smudged contact lens. Wondering why the television is blaring, Deborah drags herself from the bathroom into the living room. At first, she thinks Robert must have let himself in somehow. But she enters an empty room, the televisions on a talk show channel Deborah dislikes. Wrinkling her nose in annoyance, she searches for the remote. Frustrated it's not in its usual spot, she starts to lower herself to the floor, wondering if it fell underneath the couch or one of the chairs. That's when she glances at Jonathan's empty recliner, where it rests innocently enough odd. What's it doing in his chair? She mutters, staring at it in confusion. Scratching her head for a moment, Deborah suddenly remembers the loud stranger demanding payment. But for what? She hasn't a clue. Deborah rocks herself slowly back and forth, an unsuccessful attempt to self-soothe. She keeps envisioning the man as she stares out the picture window, her diminished recollection tells her the memory was real, down to his contorted face. But she's doubtful about their interaction. Involved in an internal battle with herself about what she saw, she's relieved to hear the wheezing of Robert's beat-up truck coming up the drive, the exhaust pipe sounding like a smoker's cough. She prefers his presence, so she doesn't have to be alone with her memories. Lately, They've been nothing if not frightening. Chapter 5 Deborah The grocery store is a good twenty miles away, and Deborah waits until she dodges the pothole to call Robert. Deborah has learned from experience that half a mile after you bounce over it, cell service becomes available. It's the reason for many flat tires. Yet the city refuses to fix the soon-to-be sinkhole, made worse every year by the snowplows and farm equipment that bump over it. The county says it's not within their jurisdiction. So she's left veering off to the side to avoid the natural crater's jarring consequence. We need to talk, Deborah says as soon as he answers. I keep getting all these weird crank calls and hang-ups. Where are you? I'm headed to the grocery store. Okay. I'll come to meet you. I'm about to take a lunch break. Except, when Deborah admits she's in a neighboring town, he chuckles at her, but agrees to drive that way, with a gentle reminder he won't be able to stay long. They agree to meet in the produce aisle, as cliched as it sounds, before they disconnect. Deborah's wrapping a sprig of rosemary in a plastic bag when he appears by her side. He greets her warmly, his smile making her giddy inside, even though she's filled with dread. I got another letter from the Department of Transportation. Deborah tosses a bag of organic carrots next to the herbs. About what? They want my land to build a road for nothing more than convenience. Can you believe that? She frowns. It's not for sale, but they're claiming eminent domain. I heard they wanted to expand, connect the county route to the expressway. His fingers clasp the metal of the cart. My father would be rolling over in his grave, Deborah mutters, and so would his ancestors. Why would I care about accessibility? I live out here for a reason, she says bitterly. No one bothers me, and I don't bother them. Her shoulders droop or at least no one used to. I bet they'll eventually come from my land, he sighs. The economic development they claim will result isn't as necessary as they want us to believe. Though, he ponders, maybe it's not such a bad thing. 
How can you say that? Because maybe it's time for a change. He cocks an eye at her. I was hoping someday soon we could talk about our future. Deborah holds her breath. What do you mean? He leans down to whisper in her ear. Maybe us starting a life together. If you'll have me. Like moving in together? That, he guffaws, among other things. Potentially moving somewhere else, somewhere warm. I didn't take you as the kind that would want to leave your roots. I know, it's a lot to consider since my kids are here. But it might be a good change for us. He squints at her. You ready to battle another winter? No, she concedes. But the kids don't know about me. Won't it be a pretty sudden bomb to drop on them? Yes. Which is why I'm not trying to rush us into making an impulsive decision. I just want us to consider our options. I will tell them soon about us, he promises. I'm just waiting for the right time. She wants to protest. He's been saying this for months. But it's a useless argument. It's a sensitive topic. She knows his kids have had a hard go of it, considering they lost their mother. Watching Robert walk ahead and grab a carton of milk in the dairy aisle, she's aware of how time has aged him. His shoulders aren't as straight as they used to be. Now he has a slight stoop from not only time, but stress and heartbreak. Both of them have shouldered a lot in the preceding years. Deborah maneuvers the cart, absent-mindedly tossing items in until the cart groans as one of the wheels catches on an end cap display, upsetting the cereal boxes. An overworked and underpaid grocery clerk stops stocking a shelf to gawk at the commotion. Deborah hurriedly fixes the capsized cardboard and keeps moving. His voice appears back beside her, a calming presence. It'll be okay. I don't know, Deborah sniffs. Can we make this work? Of course. I need you now more than ever. She gently strokes his thumb. I'm here for you, Debbie. After deciding to make a stew later, Deborah adds beef bouillon cubes and chuck steak to the cart's contents. Then realizing she didn't grab all the ingredients on her initial walk through the produce aisle, she glances up at the fluorescent lighting and scans the colorful array of fruits and vegetables. She likes to watch the misters, the whoosh of the jets as they spray the produce at different times, the cleanness and freshness of this area in particular. The sudden thud startles her as a plastic bag with a white onion lands in the cart. You read my mind, Deborah smiles at Robert. I know exactly what you need. Robert gives her hand a squeeze before glancing at his watch. Unfortunately, I've got to get back to work. Talk to you later. Nodding as Robert disappears from sight, she's amazed at the way he vanishes like a long-ago memory, without a lingering whiff of spicy cologne in his wake. It's better than the alternative. The smell of whiskey and sweat she swore her husband couldn't scrub off his skin no matter how hard he tried. After moving aimlessly through the aisles, she heads to the conveyor belt to check out. As she's loading her groceries into the back seat of the ancient Ford, Deborah is at first giddy, thinking of having Robert all to herself. When she finishes stacking the last of her reusable tote bags, she slams the door. Trying to be a good citizen of the world, she goes to return her cart to the designated corral. Her hands pause on the warm metal as goosebumps rise on the back of her neck, signaling that someone is watching. Deborah can feel eyes on her. Trying to be subtle, she pretends to search for a place to return the cart so she can find out who's watching her. Using her hand to shield against the direct sunlight, she's able to slide her gaze across the parking lot. Sure enough, a man's intently staring at her from the comfort of his vehicle. She tries to place where she might know him from. Whether it be a church or around town, 
but there's nothing memorable about his burgundy truck or his license plate. The plate belongs to a different county, and though she knows most of the people here from the neighboring towns, he doesn't strike her as a familiar face. His hairy arm lazily hangs out the window, and she notices a snake tattoo wrapped around his bicep. Anxious about walking her cart to the stall, since it means passing him, she shifts from foot to foot, hesitating. It's not illegal for people to sit at the grocery store, she berates herself, or look out the window. Walking as briskly as she can with a limp, she passes him, noticing the red bandana wrapped around his scalp. She wonders if he has a shaved head, or is going bald underneath the faded fabric, or maybe another tattoo is stretched over his skull. She shoots him a dirty look, just in case, just so he doesn't get any ideas. His voice carries out of his open window, but Deborah doesn't bother to stop, sure he's hollering at someone else in the lot. Maybe his buddy or wife is in the store shopping for groceries, and he's their ride. As she darts her eyes toward him, he yells something. But Deborah's not close enough to hear, nor does she want to backtrack and lessen their distance. Something about him makes her nervous. A loud honk startles her, and tripping over her clogs, she stumbles on the pavement and goes down hard. The same aggressive driver gives another sharp beep as the woman driving swerves around her. Sighing, Deborah wipes her hands, dirty and indented from the pebbled ground on her pants. By now her cart has drifted into the center of the lot. Deborah mutters something unsavory, forgetting about the man suspiciously watching her for a second. It's not for long, since a powerful thud draws her attention from her skinned knee to over her shoulder. His burly figure has exited his truck, and his vast body barrels toward her. If he wasn't a wrestler in his formative years, she'd be surprised. When she landed on the ground, her purse spilled some of the contents and loose change, and breath mints are rolling on the cement, glinting in the sunlight. The runaway cart has now settled against a parked car. Ma'am, the mustached stranger squats down to Deborah's eye level. Clenching her hands, she whispers, What do you want? He reaches a hand down for the strap of her handbag and swoops it up. Just helping you with this. Not today you aren't, Deborah screams, frantically waving her hands at a couple walking by. Help! Someone! Please help me! The thirty-something man runs over to her side, concern etched on his face. Is there a problem? His female companion has already yanked out her phone, ready to place an emergency call if needed. This man, Deborah points at the ape-like man, tried to mug me. What the hell? The mustache jumps up. That's not true. Confusion is on all three faces as each one peers at the others. The female bystander stares at all of them in morbid curiosity. You have my purse, Deborah motions to his hands. He's taken aback, because indeed, he's grasping her purse. The beefy man knows what this looks like to the couple. They exchange a smirk as his jaw hangs in bewildered silence. I was just doing you a favor trying to help you. Would you please hand her back her purse? The hero asks politely. This is a misunderstanding is all, the man blathers. She fell, I was only offering her some assistance. Deborah shifts impatiently, waiting until he hands, no, shoves the handbag into her arms. Looks like you lost a few things. The woman motions to the ground. Let me get that. The young lady leans over and picks up the mints and change, returning them to Deborah. Thank you. Deborah smiles at the couple. I appreciate your help. Avoiding the pointed stare of the incredulous stranger, she spins around and hurries toward her car. She can feel his eyes drilling into her back as she puts distance between them, but she doesn't dare glance over her shoulder to confirm this suspicion. With a slam of the car door, she fumbles with the lock, careful to check her mirrors to make sure he's not in pursuit of her. She guns the engine too fast, and the vehicle shoots forward like a rocket. Deborah's eyes dart back and forth between her side mirror and the windshield as she exits the parking lot 
her mind a disorganized mess, more chaotic with each passing mile. Focused on what's behind her in the rearview mirror, she isn't paying attention to the road and the bulky object bolting across the center strip. Swerving too late to avoid what she suspects is wildlife, she braces for impact. Her body jerks forward as she stomps on the brakes, and relieved she wore her seatbelt. Deborah waits for the deafening sound of scraping metal and the thud of a carcass. The car grinds to a screeching halt, the smell of burnt rubber causing her to cough. It takes her a second to realize it's from the friction and heat of the tread on the road as she ground to a stop. Dazed, she rubs her neck and peers out the window, expecting to see a wounded animal that's now roadkill. But there's no lifeless body splattered across the concrete. She removes her seatbelt and shakily steps out of the car, suspecting the animal ran into the fields. When she walks back toward what she assumes is the scene of the crime, there's no telltale sign of blood or matted fur, only tire marks. Swallowing hard, Deborah slowly turns in a full circle, carefully considering her surroundings and the absence of wild animals and traffic. A feeling of defeat is tugging at her consciousness. I know I saw something, she mutters. Even though she's relieved her vehicle and the suspected animal went unharmed, Deborah is apprehensive as she repositions herself in the driver's seat, telling herself she's being paranoid because of the incident at the grocery store. She might not be able to trust others easily, but she can trust herself, right? She knows what she saw, and that's all that matters. Her hands tremble on the wheel as she drives under the speed limit the rest of the way home, her eyes wildly squinting from side to side at the open road, sure another object is going to lurch across her path. Part Two Sibley Chapter Six Sibley It's barely 6 a.m. on a Friday, but I'm already frazzled, juggling multiple items in my arms wishing I had an extra set of hands that could follow me around and hold a catcher's mitt underneath my struggling grasp. <sighs> I sigh. The struggle is real as I focus on staying upright without spilling my iced coffee or tripping over my own feet. Unfortunately, my twenty-something paralegal and right-hand woman, Leslie, isn't due in for another hour. My rigid grip on the plastic tumbler keeps my drink at arm's length, from my black-and-white pinstripe blouse, lest it dribble down the front and necessitate an outfit change before my first meeting of the day. Believe me when I say this has happened more than once. A change of clothes is now stowed in my office closet. Some call me clumsy, others headstrong, depending on if they're my friends or the opposing counsel. In my other hand, I'm carrying a laptop case and a half-zipped gym bag, having just finished a workout in our office's downstairs exercise facility. One tennis shoe rests on the carpet while I shove my foot into a stiletto heel. I wince as my poor pinky toe swipes the uncomfortable edge of the navy suede, another blister earned from taking the stairs up to the sixteenth floor instead of using the elevator. I'm a glutton for punishment, I guess. Or maybe it's an accurate reflection of my life the constant maneuvering and balancing act I have to do to keep up a well-heeled and well-manicured facade as the only female divorce attorney in my office. I fumble with the lock on my door, and using my weight I jam my side into the wood, creating a broad enough passage to let the bulk of my body and bags in. The refillable cup starts to tip, and muttering a curse word, I hurriedly cross the office to set it upright on my solid glass desk, just in time. Then, after shoving a coaster that resembles a brass-plated white agate underneath the Colombian roast, I settle into my plush leather chair to finish the task of changing out of my other shoe. I don't think a stiletto on the right and a running shoe on the left would be a convincing fashion statement but maybe I can defer to Yeezy on that. 
After gently tugging my hair out from the ponytail holder, I shake out my strawberry blonde locks and use my hands and some dry shampoo to add body, my day-old blowout still holding its end of the bargain. At least something is, I smirk, thinking about my marriage. Holden and I have been together since our early twenties, and a decade later, we've hit a rough patch. A few months ago, he got tenure at his university, and I was ecstatic for him. He'd been working toward this for years, and it was the career trajectory he wanted. Me? Not so much. And my stance is admittedly selfish. I was used to his career taking a back seat to mine. It was the argument I always had in my back pocket. Being the breadwinner, I could toss that in the ring when it came to chores or as justification for how I spent our money. My needs always at the top. And now that the tables have turned, I've become the resentful and nagging wife. After his promotion, the little time we have together has been sucked up not only by teaching, but by his research and mixers, and our relationship is no longer a priority. Worse yet, Holden no longer seems to need or want my opinion or validation. I draw in a depressed breath, staring at the three-foot sword-like plant sitting on the ledge underneath the window. Called a snake plant, it adds coziness to my mid-century office, the furniture and decor reminiscent of an era gone by, but not forgotten. I'm not a fan of the scaly reptiles, but the snake plant was a gift from a client. I gulp. Not sure client is the right word. I touch a finger to my lips. Friend, maybe. Ever since that night a couple of weeks ago, my husband might beg to differ on this point. So we skidded from one rough patch into another onerous stretch. Outside, a shrill blare from city traffic interrupts my thoughts. I'm about to glance out the window when a buzzing in my purse distracts me. I ransack the contents of my catch-all handbag and dig my phone out on the last ring. <sighs> Speak of the devil, I mutter. Before I can say hello, my husband says coldly, We need to talk. I'm startled at his tone. He adds, it's urgent. I hastily reach forward for my coffee, instead catching the cup with my elbow. It topples over, the dark liquid pooling over the transparent glass, its movement swift as it spreads over the length of my desk. Shit, I murmur. So, the voice accuses, you know what it's about. No, I sigh. I just spilled my coffee. Frantically, I open the frosted glass desk drawers in search of a leftover napkin. My hands shake as I fumble with a couple of airplane bottles of vodka, both empty. They roll around in the drawer, loose and free, rattling underneath a pile of papers. I rummage around for anything I can use to wipe the desk off, then push them aside, unable to find anything useful. Glancing at my watch, I ask, when do you want to talk? Tonight work? How about now? My eyes home in on a tissue box on the middle table that separates the two chairs across from my desk. Jackpot. Give me a minute, I offer. Let me check my calendar. I tap the mute button and set the phone down before rushing to clean up the mess I've made. The liquid has taken over the desktop and I catch droplets about to plunge onto the plush navy carpeting in my office. An aggravated scowl appears on my face, and I'm annoyed I didn't ask for tile flooring. After sopping up what's left of my morning drink, I toss the tissues in my wastebasket and settle back in my chair. Sibley? Annoyance penetrates the silence. You there? Taking the phone off mute, I respond. Uh-huh. I can spare a few minutes now. My next meeting's in a half hour. You do that, he hisses. I'm glad you can spare some billable hours. 
If we need more time, should I make an appointment with Leslie? Whoa, I snap. What's wrong? You clearly know. Obviously, I don't. I reach for a pen cap to chew on, something to refocus my mind as the usual craving hits. I need to focus on this conversation when what I really want is a drink. I lick my lips, thinking about the bottle stashed in my closet, underneath my change of clothes and a raincoat for the few days a year a monsoon or thunderstorm unleashes a torrent of rain. I'm better than this, I tell myself. But it doesn't ease the longing. Exasperated, he asks, Do you have something to tell me? You know, I don't like these games. I chomp down hard on the plastic. I'm trying to be available, but I don't have much time, so what gives? Fine, then. I'll cut to the chase. Holden lets a pregnant pause linger. His flair for the dramatic is giving me an ulcer. Why am I looking at a dating profile for you? This is not what I expected to hear out of his mouth. I thought he was referencing something else entirely. The stash of empty bottles I've hidden all over the house. Our joint checking account, which I've depleted. I'm baffled. A dating profile? For me? Repeating what I say only buys you time and further implicates your guilt, Sibley. I'm processing the words you just said, I say. You're staring at a dating profile of me? Yes. Care to share it? You wrote it, so you should know. And I quote, Just looking to see what my options are. To be up front and scare you away, I'm still married, still unclear on what I want from this, but easily available if I think we'll have some fun. Are you still reading? You are, aren't you? Speechless, I open my mouth and then close it. Oh, and then you added a devil emoji. I must say these pictures are very flattering. Going risque on a public site is ballsy for you and with your career. It seems a bit over the top, but lately you have been reckless. Even with the air conditioning blasting through the vents, a bead of cold perspiration trickles down my lower back and into the black pencil skirt I'm wearing. The chilliness of my office doesn't make up for the dread dripping into my waistband. The phone chimes in my ear, signaling a text. I glance down to see a screenshot of my supposed dating profile. It's certainly me. There's no denying that. My stomach drops three more times as the accompanying pictures come through. The first is my professional headshot. I'm buttoned up in a suit jacket with a camisole underneath, my hair and makeup expertly applied, the smattering of freckles across the bridge of my nose absent. This one is used on the firm's website and in marketing materials. Hell, it's on various billboards throughout the valley. I used to take a different route to avoid it on my way to work. Gaping at the other three photos, I'm confused. These aren't for public consumption. In one, I'm scantily clad in a bikini, holding a pina colada while relaxing on a white sand beach. It was taken a little over a year ago in Key West on a much-needed vacation. And if you look closely, Holden's tan shoulder is next to my freckled one. The next is a seductive pose. My blonde sex kitten hair, big and tangled a come-hither look in my green eyes. I'm wearing lingerie, a black corset and thong, the result of a night when I had too many glasses of Merlot and a pang of deep sadness I couldn't shake, unless it was with an Amex card. The $700 price tag I could stomach more easily than the empty pit in my gut. The need to feel sexy was worth the high price, except he didn't appreciate it one bit. My jaw clenches at this memory. In the final pic, I flash a coquettish smile at the camera, one of my hands tucked into the front of my white lace panties, 
leaving little to the imagination. I'm engaged in an intimate moment, touching myself and enjoying it, taunting the photographer. A flush rapidly spreads down my neck. The last two photos were supposed to be private. He promised me only I'd see them, and I've never shown them to anyone. I saved them in the cloud. Could someone have hacked them? But why? Because they're borderline pornographic, I chide myself. Are you there? Yes, I managed to whisper. You don't seem to have much to say. Biting my nail, I struggled to think of anything else to add in my defense. I must be a shitty attorney if I can't make a solid case on my own behalf. I bought that lingerie a couple of months ago, I shrug. You had no interest. Hmm. His voice rasps. Looks like you showed it to someone. No. I stare closely at the last picture, at my painted red lips and kitten eyeliner. His voice rises an octave. The tone is less controlled and hysterical, a perfect match for the unsettled thoughts in my mind. I don't believe you. I keep my chin up, glad he can't see it quivering. We can talk about this tonight. Is there anything to talk about? I didn't. I start to say, but just as quickly I close my mouth. First your birthday, and now online dating? You're fucking unbelievable. Pressing my eyes shut, I try to remember. But it's all a haze, a loop. I heard about different dating apps from friends who rejoined the dating pool after messy divorces, or because they hadn't met anyone the organic way, whatever that is anymore. A few nights ago when I was out, or maybe it was last week, I went to a happy hour with a group of women for networking opportunities. We all work in different industries, and usually there is an eclectic mix. It's once a month, and it's great because there are always new people who join. A topic of conversation that came up was how vastly different dating is in this day and age, compared to the experiences of those of us who have been married a long time, which is a decade in my case. This prompted a couple of the women to show the different types of apps they were on, which then brought out a comical array of stories from everyone, mostly about first dates. I could hardly take a sip of my wine I was laughing so hard. I was curious at the types of profiles some of the women described, and a few offered to show me. One newbie to the group showed me how a couple of the apps worked. All she had to do was swipe left or right, she talked about the thrill of swiping, how it was like a fun game. I toyed with the idea of setting up a profile just for curiosity's sake. But I didn't. Did I? Or did I? Holden interrupts my thoughts. You didn't what? Huh? I rub my temples. Nothing. My hands start to shake and when I rub them together, they are ice cold. The chills racing up and down my body cause me to wonder if I should be home in bed. Maybe I'm coming down with something. Or maybe it's guilt. It could even be my own lack of awareness, a missing memory I can't seem to retrieve. I wouldn't have used those pictures to set up a dating profile. I couldn't have. I rest my head in my hands. What if? No. Sib, don't go there. What if I was a couple of bottles deep? You're a lot of things, but you're not your father, I warn. Stop transferring his bad behavior onto yourself. As much as I loved my father, I don't want to end up like him. I didn't see his anger so much as I saw him feebly controlling it. He'd be most accurately described as a bitter alcoholic. No. No way. I'd never embarrass Holden or myself like that. We have our share of problems, but 
not to the extent I'd advertise my rocky relationship status on a dating site with provocative photographs he didn't know about just to get back at him. Our careers are important to us, and with them, our privacy. I know what it's like to grow up in a family under constant scrutiny, plagued by rumors and innuendos. Holden and I both understand how critical it is to keep our personal issues to ourselves. It works for our public persona, yet it's crippling to the sustainability of our marriage to shove down unresolved issues like a college frat boy guzzling shots. Except, the annoying voice of reason in my head chirps, you do stupid shit when you've been drinking. I groan. Sibley, are you even listening? Of course, I panic, worried I've missed something he's said. Where are you? Home for the moment. I'm about to leave for class. I thought you didn't have class until one. I have a meeting at ten. It's on the shared calendar. His smug voice makes me want to smack him. You know, the Google calendar you insisted we start using? Refusing to engage in this battle, I ignore the snarky comment. Tonight, then. The door barrels open, and startled, I frown at the intrusion, the phone glued to my ear. The only person who doesn't knock consistently is my red-headed Amazon woman of a paralegal, Leslie. Still, even she knows to announce herself before strolling in first thing in the morning. Except it's not her, but my wrinkled 72-year-old boss, Roger Felderman, one of three managing partners of the firm. His office is one above, but it might as well be on a different planet. Only the three of them, Roger, Paul, and John have luxurious suites on the 17th floor, their offices inaccessible to the rest of the building. Primarily, I see them in monthly meetings or at company galas. They only come down to our level, literally and figuratively, when someone deserves a promotion or royally fucks up. I think about all the cases I've won and how dedicated I am to my clients here. I've always wanted to be made partner, but it seems like it will be another five years before that will be possible. Maybe the latest case has shown them how much they need me in this corner office and on a fast track to becoming the first woman partner in the firm. Maybe it's time, I think excitedly. Roger, I say out loud, automatically disconnecting and turning the ringer off. Hurriedly, I scan my blouse and skirt for coffee stains. As always, Roger looks immaculate in his suit and polished shoes, his white hair still thick, his back straight as a steel rod. I realize too late the empty vodka bottles are lined up on my desk next to my now empty iced coffee. Sibley? He acknowledges me with a curt nod. Mind if I come in for a minute? It seems a silly question since he's already invaded my territory. Depends, I offer him a big smile, if it's good news or not. He doesn't return my smile, which automatically worries me. You may certainly come in. I stand and cross the room, relieved I've changed into my heels so my five-six height doesn't diminish against his imposing figure. You're always welcome to visit. I don't see you enough. He doesn't acknowledge this comment. His troubled eyes simply scan the contents of the desk, narrowing in on the liquor bottles. Shit. I wipe my sweaty palms on my skirt. It's too late. I can't swoop them into the trash, since they've already been spotted. Mimosas for breakfast? No, I titter nervously. I found those in my drawer from our last company mixer. In college, I was required to attend sobriety classes as punishment for a public intoxication ticket. A man there taught me an invaluable trick. As the CEO of a large organization, he spent most of his time with stakeholders and clients, which meant lots of drinks, dinners, boozing, and schmoozing. He recommended I order a club soda and Sprite to keep in hand so that I wasn't pestered continuously to have another 
and so I could control my sobriety in a room full of avid drinkers. This method means I have total control. Until lately, that is. Roger motions toward the door. I didn't see Leslie at her desk, so I thought it would be a good time to catch you. She's in at eight. Any potential new cases? I have one in about 15 minutes. No problem. This won't take long. He motions to the other chair. Why don't you have a seat? This can't be good. A managing partner asking me to sit in my own office. Fine. My legs would have given out if not for the chair, so I gratefully settle into the leather. I picked out these chairs because they're luxurious enough to relax in, and though they mold to fit you like a glove, they have enough support so you don't sink into them. Believe it or not, I learned a lot about furniture and easing clients into tense, lengthy conversations by testing out different seating arrangements. I just didn't think I'd be on the receiving end. I physically shove my hand under my thigh to keep from bringing it to my mouth, one of my bad habits Roger doesn't need to see. Sibley, his vibrant blue eyes are fixated on mine. You've been a great addition to the team for the eight years you've been a part of this firm. You're a remarkable lawyer with an uncanny ability to get to the crux of the matter. And that's what I'm going to do right now. Just rip the Band-Aid off and get to the heart of it. I slowly nod. Paul and John and I, we've never questioned your judgment. There's a slight pause. Or integrity. Or I should say, we haven't had to until recently. His eye contact never wavers. We take our responsibilities in this field and client relationships very seriously here. Yes, we do. That's why this is so disappointing to our group. I stare at him blankly. We received a complaint. Spit it out, my brain screams. Stemming from what? It's unethical to sleep with a client, Sibley. I don't need to tell you the legal ramifications or the risk you're putting yourself at and the firm. His hand gingerly touches his impeccable hair, not to mention the other questions your lack of judgment raises. Stuttering. I don't understand. You're married. At least you were. He shakes his head. Maybe not after this. Who am I? What are you talking about? You know I would approach you first about any concern regarding inappropriate behavior. I'm not one to mince words. But this came to Paul's attention, and we discussed it privately. We've kept an eye on the situation, and it's unfortunate. Glumly, he stares at me. Hell, maybe we should have acted right away and not waited. I don't think any of us wanted to believe it. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I wipe my clammy palms on the chair. We have photos. Mortified, I ask. From a dating profile? He tilts his head. I beg your pardon? Nothing. Even though your client interaction happened after you left the building, we were still notified. It doesn't change the impropriety of it. With all due respect, Roger, can you please tell me who this involves? I'm louder than I intend, and the voice in my head commands my composure. It is, after all, a sign of a seasoned attorney, the ability to remain calm under pressure. The partners don't do well with feminine whales, from what I've seen with the staff. You should know who you're sleeping with, he spits out. I shouldn't have to tell you. Mr. Marcona. Nico? I gasp. You think I'm sleeping with Nico Marcona? There is such a thing as a dumb question, and I have my answer. His mouth is a flat line. We only went out one time, I hurriedly add, for drinks, to discuss his case. Nothing happened. Nico's divorce required a lot of time, 
and it's true I didn't mind his presence. We spent a lot of time discussing his case and how to proceed, and in the beginning we had clear boundaries. He would come to the office during regular business hours, and someone would always be around, other attorneys or Leslie. But as we got more comfortable with each other, I did a poor job of keeping my personal and professional lives separate. And I made a rookie mistake. I confided too much in him about my own problems. The lines became distinctly blurred. And then the night of my birthday happened. Simply, do me a favor. Don't look me in the eye and lie to me. You're better than that. You've put your career at risk and your future with the firm. He eyes me sadly. I know temptation runs rampant in life, and especially with this type of clientele. He sighs. We've had eight years together. I don't want to think even worse of the situation. And me, I finish. He nods. I'm, he holds up a hand. I'm going to have Tim come in and pack up your office. Chapter 7 Sibley What? I shake my head incredulously. You're firing me? This is a serious breach of trust, not to mention an ethical dilemma. Considering a bar complaint could be filed, piss off the wrong person, and this could become a serious transgression. It is, don't get me wrong, but we are going to deal with it internally. Roger slaps his knee. We have to take the best course of action for the firm in case this blows up in our face. And in this case, you're terminating me. Not exactly. What does that mean? We want you to get help. With what? I slump in my chair. I'm not a sex addict. What is this even about? Not that type of addiction, he says uncomfortably. Unless that's an issue, too. Who wants me to get help? The partners. Paul, John, myself. He waves his hand helplessly. Even Dr. Bradford. Wait, Holden's been involved in this decision? Son of a bitch. I clasp my hands together so he doesn't see them shaking. Roger continues. We do care about you, Sibley. That's why we want to approach this with some sensitivity. He clears his throat. Your husband mentioned you'd had a rough childhood, compounded by mental illness in your mother and the tragic death of your father. Wait, Holden mentioned my upbringing to my bosses? When? I grit my teeth. Roger waits for me to respond but I'm focused on Holden and the final nail he's pounded in the coffin of our marriage. All bets are now off when it comes to my husband. As he waves his hand toward my desk and the offending bottles, there's an awkward pause. That's why we want to see if we can remedy this among ourselves. It's not what you think. Paul used to struggle with alcohol addiction, and he's been sober now for ten years. I don't have a drinking problem, I say quietly. And I have a meeting in five. You're missing the point, my dear. My secretary already spoke to Leslie. Your next appointment is no longer your concern. It's been reassigned. I'm not. There's nothing more to say, Sibley. Do what we ask and let's hope we can move forward. We're suspending you without pay in the hopes you will focus on recovery. I think about the savings account I drained. Someone might as well put me out of my misery now. What exactly are you asking me to do? Tim has the packet. It outlines the requirements for us to reinstate you. He winces. I'm afraid it's not going to be easy to earn our trust back, if that's even what you want. I want to keep my job, I say shakily keep being the best at what I do. With a glance at my ring finger, he says, If you do decide to pursue this thing with Mr. Marcona, be 
be warned. It will result in your immediate dismissal. My jaw drops. I count to ten in my head to save myself from saying something I'll regret later on. Roger rises slowly, but with the confidence of a distinguished attorney who's been practicing for the length of time I've been alive. He can't be rushed, even after having a difficult conversation. The plant, I say. Can you make sure the plant is watered? He gives me an odd stare. It releases oxygen during the day instead of at night, I lamely add. Raising a bushy brow, he says, your office will still be taken care of. Tim appears in the doorway as suddenly as Roger disappears, an empty cardboard box in hand. Sibley Bradford, he shakes his head. Pity laces his voice. Today is not your day. I raise my chin at him haughtily. Depends on who you ask. What do you need? He waves his arm around the office. I'll pack it up and walk you out. My purse, laptop. He holds a hand up to interrupt. Items out of the closet. I finish. The laptop is company issued. You can't take it with you. But it has all of my case files. Orders from Roger. He throws his hands in the air. Don't shoot the messenger. I brush a strand of hair behind my ear in frustration as Tim follows me around the office like I'm on an invisible leash, scanning the items I grab, tossing them in the box. Without asking, and despite my protests, he starts to rifle through my gym bag and laptop case before proudly removing a computer charger, as if feeling self-important at this discovery. This has to stay. I roll my eyes. Anything else? He asks innocently. I motion to the closet. I have a small plastic container in there, filled with some personal effects. Mostly sentimental, it contains some old photos and accolades I've received over the years, including a box of stationery that belonged to my mother. I've written a few personal letters on the pale yellow paper, and each time I catch a lingering whiff of the floral scent of her patchouli. As Tim reaches onto the top shelf and pulls out the bin, I stand close enough to steal a glance over his shoulder, studying the contents of the closet for my stash of vodka. Anything else? Giving me a side eye, he notices my stumped gaze on the shelf. If you're looking for the bottles, they've all been removed. What do you mean, all? I murmur. There were multiple. One? I shake my head. Maybe two. Six. We have a lot of clients that like to drink, I say defensively. He shrugs. Doesn't matter to me, Mrs. Bradford. When were they taken? It sounds as if we're talking about a person, a child being removed from its custodial parents. Last night. Well, you did a poor job. You missed all the airplane bottles, I say sourly. No, I didn't. They were all empty. My face reddens. Do you know why I'm being asked to take a leave of absence? The bottles gave me a hint. Tim frowns and quickly pats me on the arm. My brother had a wicked drinking problem. What happened to him? Well, Tim says sadly, he died. Of cirrhosis or another type of liver disease? No. Tim motions me out the door. He hit and killed a pedestrian. On second thought, wait. I quickly retrieve the snake plant, grunting at its heaviness. Tim gives me a confused look, and I snap. It was a gift, and it's mine. I'm standing numbly as Tim locks up my door when my colleague and friend, Tanner Ellis, comes around the corner. I hadn't thought far enough to consider the humiliation of being walked out in front of my cronies. As particles of soil spill out of the top of the terracotta pot, balanced precariously in my arms, 
I question why I bothered with the damn plant. But it doesn't take Freud to know why. It was a gift from Nico. And it's not like I was the one keeping it alive. Our night cleaning crew watered and tended to it like it was their own. It thrived, unlike our professional relationship, which is now wilted and dead. My face burns at the sight of Tanner gaping when he notices the box of my belongings cradled in Tim's arms. Shock and confusion are apparent in our wordless but powerful eye contact. Take the stairs, Tanner says with finality. Red and Connor are on their way up. I nod my thanks as Tim glances at my stilettos, and then my face. With confidence, I don't feel... I march to the stairs and yank the heavy door open, the metal staircase uninviting, on par with my blatant dismissal. Tim takes the descent of sixteen floors without missing a beat. He goes into morbid details with painstaking clarity about his brother's suicide after he accidentally killed someone. When we reach the bottom, I can only offer him a sympathetic whisper. My Tesla sits in its covered parking spot. The block lettering on the sign announcing it's reserved for Buckley, Felderman, Shackler, and Associates. I pop the trunk as he settles the box in the back. The hefty manila packet that Roger sent home catches my eye, but not before a loose bottle of vodka captures Tim's. Once rolled up tightly in a towel, the bottle has unwound itself and is now noticeable. Our expressions freeze and I watch him watch me. His brown eyes meet mine, and I see him for the first time not as our security guard, but as a person who has suffered an enormous loss. There's a heavy sorrow behind his gaze. Please come back, he says, and I wonder if it's as much about the job as it is about the implications if I don't. Because if I don't return, it'll mean my own demise and I might have a tragic tale on par with his late brother's. Before I can shut the lid of the trunk, his hand snatches the bottle out. I stare after Tim as he walks away, whistling a song I've heard but can't place. The lyrics are forgotten, but the melody is haunting. Chapter 8 Sibley Safe from the outside world for the moment, I lean against the headrest, listlessly closing my eyes to the morning sounds of birds and chatter as the world moves on around me. My fingers hang on to the steering wheel like mere threads that, if plucked, will cause me to lose my last remaining grip on reality. As much as I fight it, I don't have the power to push away the memories, at least not today. A wise person once said, A single deviation from a plan can change the trajectory, good or bad. And four months ago my course was interrupted in one fell swoop. On that fateful day, I was prepping to meet with my next client, when Leslie walked in with a man. It turned out to be him, and I felt his presence long before I looked up from my computer. As soon as he walked into the room, he commanded it. Demanded it, even. It wasn't because he was tall, or movie star handsome, or because he spoke in sharp, staccato taps, enunciating every word. I would learn it was because he knew how to work a room in a tailored suit molded to his body, complete with a three-day scruff of beard that had more gray than black. His eyes were not green or hazel, but an olive color that would change based on his moods, darkening when he was pensive, subdued when he was carefree, which was rare. At six feet, Leslie, standing taller than this man, seemed bowled over by him, his existence enough to overcome her height. Sibley, this is Mr. Nico Marcona. I stood, wobbly in my nude pumps, my insides twisting, though I was unclear from what at the time. Desire? Intrigue? 
maybe a combination of both. Hi, Mr. Marcona. I stepped around my desk to shake his hand. My handshake is firm, reliable, just like my reputation. Sibley Bradford, pleased to meet you. Likewise. Our hands stayed entwined, pumping in the air. Mr. Mar- Please. It's Nico. Nico, then. Please, have a seat. I gave Leslie a megawatt smile. Thanks, Leslie. Taking a seat behind my desk, I watched while Nico sank down in one of my two chestnut-colored Italian leather chairs. Leslie mouthed something totally unprofessional over Nico's head at me. Out loud, she said, Do you need me to stay and take notes? I didn't blame her. She was dying for a chance to breathe the same air as this man. He was a magnet. Actually, he twisted his body to consider Leslie. I'd prefer it was just her and me. The way he delivered the news wasn't condescending, but rather apologetic. Of course. She gave him a pleasant smile and nodded to me. I'll be at my desk if you need anything. While she was exiting, he rested his palms on the smooth leather armrests. These are really something. Let me guess. Restoration hardware? Close, but no. I'm guessing not a second-hand store. I cannot give goodwill credit. Custom. If you must know, I laughed. Yes. Don't worry. I'm not complaining about the exorbitant fees you charge to have this kind of furniture. If you were concerned with my retainer, you wouldn't be here. I narrowed my eyes at him. Then it would be about cost, not outcome. I considered the notepad on my desk. Plus, it looks like you are a referral, Bill McElroy. Your name wasn't just on the tip of his tongue. I've had a couple friends refer you. Say you're one hell of a bulldog. I like that. As long as they didn't tell you I resemble one. No. They said you were pretty. Nico pauses. But that word seems paltry. Doesn't do you justice. With a reserved smile, I didn't respond to his compliment. I wanted Mr. Marcona to hire me for my intelligence, for my ability to win, my record. I could give him the best possible outcome for his contentious divorce. Let's begin, I offered. I'll take notes the good old-fashioned way. Moving my Mont Blanc to my notepad, I wrote the date, and when I glanced up, his eyes were locked on my left hand specifically my ring finger. Wow, he whistled. A divorce attorney still married. I'd be more concerned if I were divorced, meant I hadn't learned my lesson. Which is? He raised a brow at me. It's cheaper to stay together, I smirked. And I kind of like him still. How long? Married for over ten. No seven-year itch. I met his eyes head-on. A storm was brewing behind them. I don't believe in that sentiment. Nico responded with how I must have been different from most people or had married someone I was better suited to. Clients tell divorce attorneys every infraction their spouse has committed over the last decade, including burning dinner or leaving dirty dishes in the sink, like those are worthy of the death penalty. When Nico went into a diatribe explaining how his wife, Christine, didn't want a divorce, I cut him off. Everyone wants a therapist. I can only offer my services as they pertain to the law, I said. Vent to girls you meet on dating apps or your family and friends. His jaw hit the floor like a caricature, and a tense silence lingered between us. As he crossed his arms over his chest, I could tell by Nico's surly demeanor he was shocked at my interruption. People didn't typically barge into his speech. It probably reminded him of Catholic school, and I was the nun chastising him with a ruler across his knuckles. His hand tugged on his ear, which I would learn was a nervous habit. Nico, 
He went to protest, but I held up a hand. I'm going to represent your best interests. I can be your sounding board, but as you pointed out, we're on an expensive clock. He was taken aback, his eyes becoming putrid green slits as he decided if I was a pretentious bitch or a cutthroat attorney. I could be both. If a man said this, he'd be thrilled. They love dick measuring contests. But I had tits. Great tits, but tits nonetheless. And Mr. Marcona hadn't bought into my legacy quite yet. I can refer you to a great therapist, but all I want are facts about your divorce, not any marital dissatisfaction survey answers. Those eyes fixed me with a steely gaze, I didn't think it was possible, but they flickered a shade darker as they pinned me to my chair. Fair enough. Let's talk about the law, assets, division of both, the nitty-gritty. Okay. When he steepled his fingers, his jacket sleeve revealed his expensive watch. I'll let you dominate the conversation. Thank you. I tried for stoic. He must have been placated, because his eyes started to soften, returning to jade green. For me to offer the best defense, I need to know everything, and I mean everything, as it pertains to finances. Divorces are expensive, but so are fuck-ups. I never broke eye contact. Your friends and family have surely offered all sorts of advice, some of it warranted, mostly frivolous. I need to know about any offshore bank or dummy accounts where you're hiding money you don't want your ex-wife to find. This way, I leaned forward, his eyes smoldering into mine. I can either advise you against it or turn a blind eye. Lifting his hand to signal a question, Nico threw me for a loop. I presumed it would be about money. I was wrong. What about cheating? I don't care who you are fucking, neither does the court, not me, his voice soured. My wife. It doesn't matter, since we're a no-fault state. I kept my tone neutral. Emotions have to be kept in check. Are we clear? Yes, ma'am, he saluted me. By the way, you'd make one hell of a dominatrix. How do you know I don't moonlight as one after work? A small chuckle escaped his lips, and I liked the sound of it. Even better, Nico was relaxing in his chair, leaning back into the leather, becoming less rigid. We were making progress. Be glad we aren't in New Mexico, where you can sue the lover of your spouse if they're withholding affection. I raised a brow. Or in Mississippi, where a reasonable cause for divorce is being an idiot. I wonder what baseline they use, he joked to determine if you're an idiot or a stupid idiot. And worse yet, I laid a finger against my cheek. In Tennessee, it takes your spouse poisoning you before you have grounds for a fault divorce. So, moral of the story, be glad this is a no-fault state. Exactly. I gave him a smug look. However, it is a community property one, which gets everyone twisted up inside. But consider this from both angles. Any children? Three. Did your wife give up a lot to raise the kids so you could advance your career? No, she has a nanny and spends her time shopping and cheating. Duly noted. Also, be forewarned, Mrs. Bradford. Nico frowned. I'm not out to play dirty. And though you don't want to hear the sordid details, you might want to hear at least one part. Which is, her lover is trying to blackmail me. And that was the beginning of my introduction to Nico Marcona. Who is no longer in need of my services? Damn it, Nico. I punched the steering wheel angrily with shaking hands. Was it him who ran to the partners and tattled about our evening together? As I watch my hands tremble, it's as if a 6.9 magnitude earthquake is flowing through my veins, making me convulse in agony. In the rear view, I see a stiff-lipped and staunch attorney, J. 
Jeff Karsten passing behind me, his voice growing audibly louder. Assuming he's talking to me, I sink down deeper in the leather, fearful I've been spotted. A sigh of relief escapes my lips as I realize his earbuds are in, his gesticulating arms almost laughable as he talks to someone on the other end. He'll be unhinged at my abrupt dismissal, I think sourly. I try to call Leslie, but it goes directly to voicemail. I'm indecisive about whether I should wait for her to arrive so we can have a private conversation or hide my tail between my legs and call her later. Eventually, I choose the latter. Forcing myself to drive, I head toward the busy freeway. It's still early morning and a peak time for rush hour traffic. Upset and humiliated, I'm in the mood to speed, but it's impossible in the dense morning commute. All I can do is maneuver through the traffic to the far left side, reserved for motorcyclists and high-occupancy or electric vehicles. Then an incoming call flashes on the large screen. I know the number by heart, yet I've never saved his name in my phone. We don't bother with a greeting since he despises those. It took him a long time to break me of that, a Midwestern habit of asking a few generic questions before getting to the meat on the bone or the heart of the matter ingrained in me. So I begin with, Find Christine yet? Looks like she's headed to a loft on 7th. Really? I tap a finger to set the car on autopilot. That's too predictable. Does it matter where she's headed? He never usually asks, but this time he does. What's it to you who Nico's soon-to-be ex-wife bangs? She has something up her sleeve, I protest, and it's affecting my client. If you say so, I hear him spit. But it's a community property state, so why do you care? It's personal, I say bluntly. My point, it shouldn't be. Tapping my finger to keep the self-driving feature on, I think of my options. Not ready to confide in Chuck all my suspicions, especially since he knows those involved, I stay silent. We are long-time acquaintances, and we both know that friends would be too far of a stretch. He doesn't make friends with his clients, nor should he. That's why Chuck's excellent in his line of work. As a retired former detective and now a private investigator, he typically researches fraud cases which prompted his services in the first place. Even with his standoffish demeanor, he's been a mentor and a guide since day one. We'll just call it your fiduciary duty, he grunts. By the way, I hear you're on a required sabbatical. Already? I groan. That was lightning speed. I tense up. Let me guess, one of the attorneys called you. No shit. You would have made a good Sherlock. Maybe even Nancy Drew, real insightful. Tanner got to me first. Opening my mouth to offer a sarcastic retort, I hear him mutter, fuck, under his breath, then again with added emphasis. Chuck? It's not a loft, it's a house, gated. So? I'm watching her speed through the front gate. Congratulations, I'm snarky in my reply. That's typically what people have to do to enter, go through them, yeah, no shit. Except it's Seventh and Campbell. Wait, I plead, tell me Seventh Avenue, not Street. Then I'd be lying, just like the woman barreling through the gate. Another curse word follows. When he repeats the full address, I offer... Maybe they know each other from a previous life. Sure, he adds disparagingly. Except in our current reality, she's at his house at eight in the morning. What the hell is she doing there? I seethe. There has to be a reasonable explanation. Except none comes to mind. I've done work for your firm for years. I told you I'd never get involved in a dispute between the two of you. He pauses for a beat. But this is fucked. I can't deal with this right now, I mutter under my breath. 
but I'm on my way over there. Sib. He begs me to go home and take care of my own shit, but I respond by disconnecting. When he calls again, I decline, my focus on the next exit, where I get off and speed in the direction I've just come from. Chuck sends me a text telling me not to bother. The gate is locked, so I can't see anything, and he's already got pictures of Christine Marcona heading in. I wish it were enough, but coupled with my job instability and the recent turn of events, I need an outlet for my frustration and anger. Stopping at a gas station, I grab a bottle of Tito's vodka and then make my way to the address that Chuck just left, careful not to stop and draw attention to my movements, a camera peering intently from the iron gate. I'm familiar with the compound, a large main house built next to a smaller guest one, a circular driveway wrapping around in between the two properties. A relatively empty parking lot is across the street in front of a flower shop and cafe. So I take my chances and idle, determined to wait until the woman leaves. I have all day, literally, to sit here. And I must follow this through to the end. Yanking the Tito's from the paper bag, I unscrew the red cap and start taking small sips. It isn't long before they become longer swallows, and the metal fortress blurs before my eyes. An incoming call interrupts my pity party, and my colleague Tanner starts rambling before I can even say hello. Picturing his dark, slicked back hair, the result of expensive pomade, and the equally exorbitant Italian loafers perched on his desk, I'm anesthetized to a seemingly innocent reaction. I'm just sick about what happened. Glibly, he says. I never would have agreed to that type of a deal. What deal? Come on, Sib, cut the shit. Roger told you guys already? I act surprised. And here I signed an NDA. I ran into Leslie in the hallway after I passed you, he sighs. This is just a sorry excuse for them to push you out. I don't point out Leslie wasn't in the office before I left. I'll do my penance, I say. Maybe it'll be a good disconnect from the world. If you say so, but I don't think you've done anything wrong, he says nimbly. As long as we've been friends, I'd tell you the truth. Thanks for suggesting I take the stairs today. No problem, Sib. He softens his tone. It wasn't fair for you to run into the other attorneys like that. We end our call, and between the sun and the liquor, I end up shutting my eyes, forgetting about my mission. A full-on throttle startles me from my hours-long nap, and I see five missed calls from Chuck. The roaring engine is a dead giveaway for the homeowner's Porsche 911 Turbo. I would know, considering I've been in that very vehicle more times than I can count. With mounting apprehension, I watch as the gate slowly opens, and the sports car is carefully finessed up the small incline to avoid a collision with the concrete underneath the low chassis. Hurt by his actions and feeling careless, I try the alleyway, thinking I might get a different vantage point of the two of them. I'm fuming and want nothing more than to catch them in the act. It's a tight fit, and when I make it through the narrow entrance, a block wall prevents me from viewing anything on the premises, him or her. It's pointless to climb the concrete, since it's so smooth I wouldn't be able to find a foothold. Disappointed, I gun the engine, and in my haste I take the corner too fast. Instead of making a smooth entrance onto the road, I end up on the sidewalk, clipping a bright yellow fire hydrant. As I swerve to avoid more damage, the nose of my Tesla slams into a retaining wall behind it. The hood crumples instantly, and smoke fills the air as the sound of metal scrapes into the unforgiving cement. Startled by both the impact and my airbag deploying, I manage to toss the bottle in the back seat before I lose consciousness. Chapter 9. Sibley
When my eyes flicker open, it takes a moment to convince myself there's not a football helmet situated on my head. An excruciating pain squeezes like a tight fist around my skull. My hand moves to my forehead, where I connect with gauze instead of my skin. My throat is parched, as if coated in a solid layer of cotton. Troubled, I stare down at the watercolor print duvet covering me. How did I wind up in my bed? I murmur, bewildered at the pain that radiates from my clavicle. It feels like I sat in the sun for too long and burned one particular area of my body to a crisp. Coughing, I struggle to sit up and adjust my position comfortably. It's made difficult by the razor-sharp pain searing from my left side when I twist toward the bottled water on the nightstand. <sighs> what in the world happened to me? Holden, I call out hoarsely, my voice barely making a dent in the cavernous master. My eyes dart around the room for my purse, but I don't see the tan leather in its usual spot on the dresser. Holden, I try with more emphasis, wanting my phone. I hear a door slam downstairs and sudden heavy footsteps on the stairs. The door whips open, but instead of Holden, it's Chuck. His longish grayish hair is in a ponytail, and his shirt is covered in red splotches. Puzzled, I ask, what are you doing here? He fixes me with a peculiar gaze. And you've got Kool-Aid or something on your shirt. You had an accident. He leans against the wall with his arms crossed. This is your blood. An accident? You totaled your car. That's impossible. I squint my eyes at him. What day is it? He appears unfazed. I was at work, I say stubbornly. Except you weren't. You were spying on. Before he can finish, Holden stalks into the room and his blue eyes, his best feature, widen as they spot me seated upright against the headboard, multiple pillows behind my back. Thank God! He hurries to my side, his tall frame leaning down as he kisses my cheek gently. You scared the hell out of me! His soft beard rubs against my skin, annoying me. It's a source of contention between us. I keep asking him to shave the damn thing. He keeps resisting. Groaning at the pain, I admit, I'm still not sure what happened. You hit a fire hydrant, Chuck offers from across the room, followed by a concrete wall. Holden's relief is short-lived after hearing this, his mouth twisting into a frown. He steps back from my side to sag onto the mattress near the foot of the bed. Your colleague here, Holden waves toward Chuck and directs an accusatory glance at me, whom I've never met, brought you home. I concentrate on the mirrored dresser behind his head, incapable of returning his silent but deadly stare. He removes his glasses and cleans the lenses on his T-shirt, a habit that buys him time to calm down. Chuck cuts in. Your wife and I have done work together for the past five or six years. She hired me for a case, and I was in the neighborhood. You just happened to be in the neighborhood where Sib was when she had a car accident. Replacing his glasses on his face, Holden looks incredulous. What exactly were you two doing? You can't accuse me of sleeping with everyone, I snap. Holden glowers at me, again removing his glasses for a second cleaning. I'm not sure what's going on, Holden, I say weakly. But from your tone, I can tell you're upset. Is this about my car? His voice is laced with contempt. Do you remember what happened today, Sibley? I close my eyes against the pounding in my head that strikes me like a hammer, blow by blow. I'm in a lot of pain. Can I please have something? With your history, 
Holden says briskly. There's no way I'm giving you any type of opioid. Then maybe I need to go to the hospital and have a real doctor check me out. A doctor already did that as a favor to me, Chuck snaps. To Holden, he grunts. He left something comparable for her to take. I'll go get it. Who left what? I screech. Can I have some water, please? Neither one acknowledges my questions, and when I hear Chuck's footsteps pounding down the stairs, I'm forced to open my eyes. The bed squeaks underneath Holden's weight as he shifts to hand me the bottle. A coolness hits my palm when he thrusts it into my hand. Thank you, I murmur. After unscrewing the cap, I tilt my head back and take a couple of long swigs. I feel like I was in a car accident. Well, you look like it. You gave me quite the scare. Holden's warm hand settles on my shoulder. I heard a knock on the door, and then Chuck was carrying you in the house. I had no idea who he was and thought he had hurt you and was trying to extort us or something. Extort us? I moan. For what? I don't know. I hadn't thought it through. He sighs. You were bruised and bleeding, and it's the first thing that came to mind. And then I thought about the conversation earlier. Between your pictures and the dating profile, it became an amalgam of uncertainty. What pictures? He squints at me. Don't you remember talking to me this morning? I stutter. I know I got up this morning and went to the gym. A block of time has been erased, as if the day's been split into two parts. You were still in bed when I left this morning. Then, accidentally moving my body too fast, I grimace. We talked this morning, fought, actually, about you dating other people. My eyes widen. What are you talking about? You don't recall your dating profile. The provocative photos I saw. I want to furiously shake my head, but slowly is all I can manage, the throbbing making my movements jerky and sluggish. <sighs> Never mind. He squeezes my hand in his. It's not important right now. What happened to me? My free hand drifts over my throat and collarbone area. The airbag deployed, thank God especially since you weren't wearing your seatbelt. You've got some burns and lacerations from the airbag and shattered glass. Where was I? Chuck said near your office. His voice is resigned. You're lucky you weren't arrested and charged with multiple infractions. What do you mean? You were drunk. No way. Yes way. Hold in, I protest. I was at work until you lost your job. My mind spins out of control when he says this. Suddenly, tears burn my eyelids. What happened to my job? Answer me this. Holden curls his hands into fists. Why were you over by his place? Whose place? Sib, I don't know what's going on right now. How convenient. I withdraw into the sheets. What happened at the firm? What happened to my job? They asked you to take a leave of absence. Suspicious, I ask. How do you know? As much as I hate lying to Holden about what I remember, I have to play dumb. I might not remember the accident, but I do remember everything before the crash. Unable to fold my cards yet, I find it easier to claim temporary amnesia at this point. Because they told me they were going to, he confesses. They asked my opinion first. We discussed an intervention. Luckily, Chuck brought the envelope with him from your vehicle that contains the disciplinary measures taken against you, which frankly couldn't have come at a better time. Curious, I ask. And you think they're fair? I think asking you to go to rehab is more than reasonable, he huffs. They could have just as easily fired you. Rehab? I yell in outrage. 
Come on, Holden, you're crazy. I expect him to crack a smile and tell me he's joking, but his mouth remains in a tight line. You have to be kidding me. My wife is all banged up. Lucky she didn't kill herself or someone else in a drunk driving accident, and this is what you want to say to me? Holden, I plead. I'll quit drinking, but rehab? That's ludicrous. You've said that before, but I mean it this time. Simply, this is a wake-up call. It should be, but I fear it's not. He throws his hands in the air. We're out of options. I don't know what to say, so I stare down at my hands, observing small cuts on both knuckles. Before I can think of an answer, a loud tap on the doorframe causes me to look past Holden at Chuck's sun-wrinkled face. His loud baritone carries across the room. You don't have a choice in the matter, Sibley. What are you talking about, Chuck? Without breaking eye contact, he crosses the room and hands me a pill. Here's something for the pain. I put it on the tip of my tongue and swallow it with the rest of the water. What don't I have a choice about? I finish. I'll make you a deal. Charles, I sigh, using his real name, the name he hates to be called. It's straightforward. You should have been arrested and charged with a DUI. I give him my best, albeit pained smile. You called your cop buddies, and I appreciate the favor. I really do. Anne took you to my doctor friend, and got your car towed to the junkyard, and brought you home. His brief glance nails me to the headboard. Let me be clear. There is no second chance, or fourth, or seventh. You have a drinking problem, Sibley. Your work has asked you, no, instructed you, to go to a clinic. If I tell them what happened or breathe a word of this to them, they'll fire you in a heartbeat, whether you're charged with driving under the influence or not. Why would you do that? I grit my teeth. Are you threatening me? No. His voice softens. You remind me of my own children and I'm not going to let you just trash your life. You've worked hard, and I know you've had a hard go of it, losing your father, having an absentee mother. Taking a quick peek at Holden, I can tell he's hurt this strange man he's never met knows about my past when it's hard for us to discuss. How did you know about... I hold up a hand. Who told you? I'm a P.I., you don't think I investigate colleagues I work with, too? Don't you dare bring my parents into this, I say, but without conviction. Chuck points at Holden. Your husband loves and cares about you. The firm cares about you. We want you to get better. We're rooting for you, all of us. But we can't do the work for you. You got to take ownership of that part. I sniffle loudly. You would never do this to your own kid. I absolutely would, and I did. My son Joseph. He motions for Holden to switch spots with him. As he settles next to me on the bed, his eyes drill into my tearful ones. Joe got in trouble for theft and drugs and was going down a nasty path. I put him behind bars when I was an officer. Hardest damn arrest I've ever made. You put your own son in jail? He nods. And I don't regret it one bit. He needed that to straighten out. And now I'm going to serve you up some tough love as well. His hand swipes a tear from my cheek. You could have been killed today. But I was just trying to help, I whisper. I told you nothing good would come of it. Since I don't remember, I don't bother to argue. But that doesn't mean I can't search my memory for a reason I would go against Chuck's advice. Sib. Chuck cuts into my pensive thoughts. I've known you for a long time. Go 
to rehab. Get your head right. I'm going to keep after the other case we were working on, but I'm calling a timeout on the Marconas. But what about- No rebuttals. Glancing between Holden and me, he adds, I have a letter from my cop friend. Your license is automatically suspended for 90 days, but if you go to rehab, and complete the program successfully, you won't be charged with driving under the influence. I don't think that's legal. Sibley, Holden stomps his foot. You will sign off on this, or we will have other matters to discuss. Chuck shakes his head at him, as if in warning. You don't have anything to discuss right now, except Sibley's health and mental wellness. Oh, really? I challenge Holden. Like what? Blushing crimson, Holden doesn't engage, likely realizing he's about to unleash our own marital problems on someone he doesn't know. The firm was making you sign off on rehab anyway, Holden says pointedly, to keep your job. Chuck's eyes look troubled at this declaration, but he says nothing. Instead, he leans forward and grips my hand in his large one. I'll talk to you soon, okay? Papers are downstairs. Chuck nods at Holden. You have my cell, right? I do now. I motion to where my handbag usually rests on the dresser. Speaking of that, I need mine. Did you happen to bring my purse home? I did. Chuck beckons to Holden. I gave it to your husband. Good. Call me if you need anything. Let me walk you out, Holden offers, following him out of the room. Bye, Chuck, I sputter, scared I'm going to drown in a puddle of tears. I hear the two of them talking downstairs, but I can't make out the words. I wait for my husband to come back and unleash a violent maelstrom of words on me, but the controlled disappointment in his voice is worse. We have next week for the... His voice cracks. For the facility. That'll give you some time to rest and heal. I stare at the ceiling, unable to meet the aqua pools of chagrin in his eyes. After a light stroke to my wrist, he disappears from the room. Smashing the pillows beneath my head, I restlessly wait for sleep to come. Since I can't move to my usual side position, I lie still on my back, my groggy eyes flickering open and shut as the whir of the fan lures me to sleep. Chapter 10 Sibley Dreading rehab, I alternate between sleep, depression, and frazzled nerves. Recovering from a car accident is one goal. Surviving the shadow of my husband is another. Holden's been overbearing, leaving the house only for work in the gym. Before Holden goes to the university to teach his night class, my best friend from college shows up wearing a guilty smile as if hiding a secret from me. I know Holden asked Adrian to keep an eye on me. They've become friends over the years, so he implicitly trusts her. It helps she's a counselor at a high school and can put anyone at ease with her warmth and snorting laughter. She's a lot more soft-spoken than I am, but she strengthens her tone when she needs to get her point across. It can be razor-sharp and deadly when she's pissed. I've always told her she'd make a good trial lawyer. Adrian and I bonded in undergrad over family tragedies and our love of sex in the city. Looks-wise, we're complete opposites. Adrian's curvy, long-legged, and tall. I'm thin and of average height. I'm blonde, blue-eyed, and fair-skinned. She's African-American and has the most incredible, one-of-a-kind, brown eyes with gold flecks in them. Because of my soreness, we embrace in an awkward hug before I lead her to the living room to watch, what else? Reruns of Sex in the City. Making small talk, 
we settle in on the couch, half watching the show. I have to show you something. She yanks her laptop out of her purse, which might as well be a suitcase since I swear I've seen her remove a four-course dinner from there. What's that for? I ask curiously. She scoots closer to me, pointing at the list of approved items on the Rehabilitation Center's website. After reading out loud an underlined sentence about the type of clothing allowed, only comfortable garments such as sweatpants, athleisure, or loungewear, nothing provocative, she shrieks in amusement. Can you believe this? Hmm, I raise a brow. Is this an instance where my clothing will cause me unwanted attention and it's my fault if I'm hit on or assaulted? Clearly, they don't want you to get the other clientele riled up, she shrugs. Or maybe the staff. After all, you are in the middle of nowhere. Ugh. I motion to the rest of the list. It might as well be a prison, especially with no cell phones or laptops, no keys and no snacks. Seriously, aren't you scared shitless? She asks. I'm worried about your health. You do drink like a fish. You can drink me under the table. Adrian, anyone can drink you under the table. I roll my eyes. Two drinks are all it takes. We both giggle at this. Adrian isn't a big drinker. We both had an alcoholic parent, but where she hardly touches alcohol, I go through binges. If I'm honest, it was shortly after I met Nico Marcona for the first time that I started slipping again. But not because of him. I'd put more blame on my marriage. Addiction doesn't just pop up one day, Sib. She squeezes my fingers before letting them go. Your dad was an alcoholic. I stare down at my wine glass, which is filled with water, a change from the Riesling I usually sip while relaxing on the couch, though this is hardly a time to unwind. Unfortunately, that excuse doesn't work. I raise my glass. But I do blame my husband. Spoken like a true addict, she chides. When you're an alcoholic, you blame others for your judgment. I'm not trying to justify my behavior. I'm noncommittal. It is what it is. I'm just wondering if you've dealt with your past. In terms of? It holding you back, Adrian remarks. You told me before that you just took off on a whim for the desert after you graduated high school. Yeah, a lot of kids leave home to go find themselves, I add, or go to college out of state, like I did. But you didn't have a plan. You just packed your car and left. It seemed like the right kind of weather. I turned the volume down on the television. And I met Holden and you and built a life out here. Not a bad choice, at least not until recently. But what about your mom? You said she's never remarried. No, she hasn't. My mom has a lot of issues stemming from my dad's death. Like health? Mental. I stared down at my lap, twisting my hands anxiously. She had a nervous breakdown after I left. I can only imagine, she murmurs. Your dad died unexpectedly. I'm sure it messed her up pretty bad. Incredulous, she adds. And yet you still left? It's not like that, I sputter. She made some poor life choices that spiraled her out of control. A nervous breakdown compounded by everything that happened. Then we got in a big fight because she wouldn't help me out with college, even after she got all this money for my dad's life insurance policy. Sib. I hate to break it to you, but at what point are you going to deal with your shit? She narrows her eyes at me, the gold flecks sparking in anger. This is one of your biggest triggers, and it's only impeding your ability to move on and truly break the cycle. So, don't go to rehab and deal with my mother instead? I offer up, hopefully. She says nothing, just glares at the television. The mood has soured 
and I don't even giggle at one of my favorite parts of my beloved series. It's when Carrie uses her oven to store her shoe collection. It's relatable that ample closet space would be more important than your ability to use kitchen appliances. I feel the same way. Seriously, Adrian asked softly. When was the last time you saw your mother? What's her name? Deb? Deborah? I cackle. For some reason, she hates when people call her Deb or Debbie. When was the last time? The day after high school graduation. You haven't seen her since then? My face flushes. No. Okay. Um, what about the last time you talked on the phone? Years, I swallow. I don't know, probably three or four years ago. Adrian shuts her laptop with a bang, unable to hide her peeved expression. And I know she's struggling with my answer since she lost her mom at a young age. Quickly, I add, I did write her a couple of times, but she never responded. And what did you say? She asks. Was it an angry letter or a nice one? I shrug. Probably a little bit of both. Then how do you even know she's okay? Remorseful, I shake my head. I'm sure I would hear something. It's not a big city. It's a small town. Nothing like what you're used to. Everyone knows everyone and everything. If she didn't call me in an emergency, a neighbor would. Looking unconvinced, she chews on her lip while I aim for my nail. What did you mean about your mom making poor life decisions? Forget it. I turn the volume up. This is important, Sib. Adrian watches me like a hawk, ready to swoop down on my twisted emotions and claw through them like a vulture circling a dumpster. I know she doesn't mean it negatively, but I'm immediately uncomfortable with her prying. I haven't even told Holden most of this. Why not? Swirling the water that doesn't belong in the wine glass, I sigh. His family life was so perfect. He gets along with his siblings. His family is uber close. There are no childhood scars of any kind, minus when he maimed himself from a bicycle accident when he was a kid. I run a hand through my tangled hair. Seriously, he is the poster child of a stable and thriving upbringing. His parents are still married, and beyond that, they are actually happy. Or do they fake it? Adrian says. Maybe to everyone else they are, but behind the scenes, they are miserable. If they're acting, they do a damn good job, I frown. Besides, why would I want them to be unhappy? I'm not trying to bash Holden's idyllic upbringing, nor do I resent him for having loving parents. I'm simply pointing out his reality and mine are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Whoa, baby girl. My intent isn't to pick apart their marriage, but to convey how many people hide behind a facade. She snaps her fingers. Take, for example, the people who post relationship goals all over social media, talking up their marriage and partner while they're close friends, no one's having an affair or they're miserable together. Adrian shrugs. You can control the narrative when you are the one who owns the rights. Absolutely. I see it all the time with my clients. I bite my lip. But what makes me not want to confide in Holden is he can't relate to my past. But he doesn't have to. I disagree. If he can't relate, he can't help me. It's not Holden's job to help you, Sib. She holds up a hand before I can retort. Hear me out. I don't mean it's not his duty to support you. I mean it's not his past to reckon with. Only you can do that. Just like you said, it's not his childhood, so therefore he can't fix it or make amends with it. She nudges me gently. Only you can do that. I'm thinking about what she just said when she continues. Your father didn't die in a car accident like mine did. 
Yet I told you about him, not because you know what it's like or have lost someone close to you that way, but because you're my best friend, and I want to confide in you and give you context about my life. She gives me another example. Race. You're a white girl from the Midwest. I'm a black girl from Alabama. We both ended up in the desert. You can't relate to my struggles. I confide in you because we can see each other for the individuals we are underneath skin color. You aren't happy with who you are underneath your pasty skin. I tilt my head at her. You cover up your insecurities and past experiences with alcohol. She tugs at a strand of my blonde hair. And only you can break the cycle in letting drinking be the catch-all for what you haven't dealt with. Adrian, I pat her shoulder. You really are a smart cookie. You better mean that seriously, Sib. She settles back against the couch, crossing her arms. Don't play with me. Adrian has known me long enough to tell that when I get quiet, it's because the wheels of my mind are spinning down a path I need to explore. Oh, no, she teases. What's going on in that head of yours? Before I tell you this, I warn, I need you to trust me. When you say that phrase, it's usually because you are going to do something asinine that is a huge risk. She fixes me with a pointed stare. Something that's trouble. You're a tad dramatic. I strongly disagree, she refutes. You said the same thing before we went off-roading down a canyon. It was a bit of a bumpy ride, I admit. We ended up in the water. It was a creek, and it was shallower than your swimming pool. She sighs. Just tell me what you have up your sleeve. Taking a deep breath, I tell her what I'm thinking, ignoring her wide eyes and puckered lips, focused on delivering my monologue to the unimpressionable painting behind her. Ballsy, she hoots. By the time I wrap up my idea, I think she's sold by the small grin on her face. Risky, she says, fist bumping me. But you got yourself a deal. When Holden returns home later that night, before Adrian leaves, my ears perk at the sound of my name, and even after I lower the volume on the television, their muted voices don't carry from the kitchen. I wonder what they're saying about me. He's probably relieved she kept me company so I wasn't left to my own devices. When I hear his footsteps creak toward the living room, I turn the volume back up so he doesn't know I attempted to eavesdrop. Is everything okay? I ask, when he strides in, a grimace on his face as if he didn't expect me to be sitting on the couch in our home, watching reruns of my favorite show. Yeah, it's just, you know, it just looks so normal. He runs a hand over his face, hiding his emotions from me. We haven't had a sense of normalcy in a long time. So I pat the seat next to me, Holden instead takes the armchair to my left. His outward rejection stings. It reminds me of a middle school dance when I was picked last, and only because my friend Kristen threatened to beat a kid up. He was a skinny twig. She totally could have. How was class? It was good. The students are eager to learn this semester, which I love. He runs a hand through his hair. Did you eat? Not yet. Sib, I told you guys to order takeout. I don't have much of an appetite right now. I rest a throw pillow in my lap. What did you mean about this being normal? We just live completely separate lives. Is that my fault? Not what I said. He scratches at his beard. It seems like a slight, I tense. You never take responsibility for being a shitty husband. Swiftly, he stands back up. Sib, not everything is meant to lead to an argument, yet you always go straight for the jugular. 
hunching over so he can't see my face. I murmur, okay. We both are guilty of it. That's all I'm saying. I don't bother looking up at him. What do you want to do about it? I don't know. He rests an arm on the banister of our staircase. You are selfish, Sibley. You have no regard for anyone else. I start to cut him off, but he silences me with a deep growl. Wrecking your vehicle? Being irresponsible with your job? You didn't consider how a leave of absence without pay would affect our finances. He stares at me sadly. And don't think I didn't notice our wiped-out savings. That's all I am, isn't it? I screech. A meal ticket for you. If Holden hears me, he doesn't answer. His next words are a slap in the face. Not to mention your commitment to this marriage. I caught you in a lie a couple weeks ago, Sib. What are you talking about? You weren't with Tanner on your birthday. He sinks onto the bottom step, as if he's too tired to hold himself upright. You lied to me. This is all... It's all too much. His words and tone would normally cause hostility in me, but I'm also worn out from mental exhaustion. Do you want to... Do you want to get a... As much as we're struggling right now, I can't bring myself to say the D word out loud. Our marriage has been tested and broken, and no matter how many times we fight and talk it out and repeat the process, it's another thing entirely to admit it's irretrievably broken. I'm going to move into the guest room for now. Don't bother. I slowly rise, careful of my now pounding headache. Since I'm going away, I can sleep in the spare room. Sibley. His hand reaches out to clumsily touch my shoulder. I want you to get better. Let's take one baby step at a time. We don't need to make any rash decisions about our marriage right now. I don't trust myself to respond. It's close to ten. Let me help you get into bed and get you some medicine. How's the pain? Slowly getting better. Gently he guides me up the stairs, his hand never leaving my elbow. When we get upstairs to our bedroom, he scans the ginormous closet as if he's misplaced something. What are you looking for? Your luggage. He shifts from foot to foot. I need to get you packed. Anything you need before we leave on Wednesday? Yeah, not to go. Sibley, he sighs. Please. I point in the direction of the hallway. It's in the guest room. Thanks, he nods. By the way, I say casually, I saw online they ask for all your medical records before checking in. Did you see that? I had them sent, yes. Whoa, you are really on it, I sardonically add. How long have you been planning my vacation? Sib, he groans. Your firm reached out to me. We discussed an intervention, but a lot of times that doesn't work. One of the partners had a bad experience with that, so we went this route. In the awkward silence, we both go into the master bath to brush our teeth and get ready for bed. He helps me out of my lounge clothing, a welcome break from the structured dresses I tend to wear. I wouldn't be able to wear the form-fitting material right now with my bruises. Sliding into a silk camisole and matching shorts, I ask curiously, Are you packing for me because you're worried I'll try to slip in some illegal contraband or sexy clothing? Why do you say that? I tell him about the prohibited clothing, and it breaks the tension between us. I'm assuming they don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable if someone's wearing revealing clothing. 
As a dude, I wouldn't want to sit in group therapy with women in skimpy clothing when I'm supposed to be focused on recovery. One less distraction, I guess. Smoothing the flimsy strap of my camisole down, I whisper, You mean like this? As I lean in to give him a kiss, he swiftly moves his head to the side, blocking me, so I catch his cheek instead. In a gruff voice, he chastises me. I was serious about what I said earlier. Doesn't mean we can't fool around, I wink. You're the only person who isn't taking this seriously. Holden helps me to bed before he stomps angrily away. Pausing at the door before he exits, he says, We can't solve all of our problems with sex, Sib. Not anymore. Good night. For once, we're in agreement on something. Chapter 11 Sibley In the morning, Holden rushes around like a madman, dashing up and down the staircase, his heavy thuds adding to my impending headache. I've started to experience withdrawal symptoms, and my lack of sleep grates on my frayed nerves, along with his inability to stay still. Much to my annoyance, Holden paces in the bedroom, asking me a million questions while he's trying to get me packed, triple-checking the items on the necessities list. I finally threaten to kick him out of the room, so he finishes in stony silence. He lugs my suitcase down the stairs, and a final crescendo strikes the landing when the bag hits the floor. It's too much, and I snap at him in annoyance. His eyes flash at me in anger, then hurt. I want today to be a nice day for us. Preparing me for rehab isn't a nice kind of a day, I say through gritted teeth. All I want right now is a drink in my hand and my husband to stop his incessant chatter. I don't want to think of it like that. I want to think of it like you're going to a spa and coming back rested and well. He adds with false excitement, Did you see all the activities they have? I looked at the facility list. You'll have a yoga studio and a full gym and even a steam room. I have to earn those privileges first, I say sharply. And maybe if you had sent me to a relaxing spa in the first place, I wouldn't be in this predicament. He recoils like I slapped him, and I ashamedly stare down at my chewed nails. Maybe the next one will treat you better, he mutters under his breath. I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm just agitated. It doesn't make me feel comfortable to live with strangers in an unknown place. It will be like college, then he thinks about it. Without the fun, I finish. Exasperated, he throws himself down on the bed. I know this isn't what we wanted. He finally stammers. It's not meant to feel like a prison. The website said the property is over 7,000 square feet built into the mountain. I just don't want to be gone for too long and forced to sit and talk about my feelings with random people. Before he can respond, I murmur, I know it depends on the person. He tries to talk to me about it, but half asleep. I'm not sure if I answer the last question he asked me. When I wake up, it's early evening, and a sense of dread gnaws at my stomach. There's an edge I need to take off, and it can only be alleviated by one thing. The house is eerily silent when I tiptoe down the stairs. Maybe because of our tenuous relationship as of late, I feel like a guest in my own home. When I call out Holden's name, there's no response. But I find a barely legible note on the marble kitchen island. His scribbled handwriting says he went to grab takeout from my favorite restaurant on our last night together. It's a nice gesture. And I hate the fact I'm more excited to be alone, out from beneath his watchful and judgmental gaze, than to have food in his company. With him gone, I can go on a mission. In anticipation, I lick my lips, already tasting the smoothness. My hands are shaking. 
my heart having palpitations at the thrill, sending shivers down my spine. It's just one last time, I tell myself. No big deal. I'm in the comfort of my own home, and no one will know. It's not like you're hurting anyone, I whisper to the mirror. My mouth salivates, not for food, but for the sweet friendship of wine tonight. Except Holden one-upped me. He did a stellar job of finding every last one of my hiding places, starting with the linen closet. I wander from our dresser in the guest room to the wicker basket filled with toilet paper in the bathroom. He even removed my stash from the shelving unit in the garage. Slamming shut the heavy-duty lid of his indestructible toolbox, I'm about to self-destruct. Hell, he even dumped out the vodka I poured into a gallon jug meant to look like distilled water. I'm rummaging in our shared office for the miniature wine bottles I hid behind a row of law books. Dropping to my knees, I'm surprised to find something else I'm missing. My purse was returned to me, but my phone wasn't in its usual pocket inside the front zipper. Stranger yet, Holden refused to take me or go look through my vehicle at the junkyard to find it. His excuse was that I'm not going to be able to bring it with me to the clinic, so I might as well get used to not having one for the time being. My supposedly misplaced cell phone is in one of his desk drawers. When I power it on, the red battery light flashes, indicating it's about dead. After typing in my passcode, I wait for the phone to unlock. It doesn't. Fuck! Holden changed my passcode. My heart might as well have jumped straight out of my body, it's pounding so fast. I'm debating what to do when Tanner's face flashes on the screen. At least I can answer his call. Hey, Tanner, I answer with fake enthusiasm. Just a heads up, my phone's about to die. That's all you have to say. What do you mean? Exasperated, he sighs. I've been trying to call you for a few days. I open and shut my mouth, realizing Tanner most likely doesn't know about the car accident, and I'd like to keep it that way. Sorry, I apologize. As you can imagine, I've had a lot going on. Holden's pissed at me. Did you tell him who I was with on my birthday? Of course not, he says smoothly. You know I have your back. He adds, when are you leaving for, I bite my lip, tomorrow. How did Holden take it? He's convinced I'm having multiple affairs. I wonder why. No clue. I play dumb. Before my phone dies, I need your help. I have, or had, a client named Nico Marcona. High-profile divorce with a few mil in assets. I've got bank records and offshore accounts to incriminate his wife, Christine. She's a real bitch, a total nightmare. She's been blackmailing him. Tanner plays straight into my hands. I can hear him practically salivating over the phone. He loves money as much as I love liquor. I almost feel sorry for the weasel. He's only human, and I shouldn't hold his own demons against him. But I promptly reconsider. When you try and fuck up my livelihood and marriage, this scrappy Midwestern girl will become the Wicked Witch of the West and shove a flying broom handle up your darkest crevice. Leslie has all the account information and an overwhelming paper trail. Tanner goes for lackadaisical. You find a good P.I. to do the grunt work? You know I use our guy Chuck, I say. Out of curiosity... Do you know which attorney is representing Nico now? Dead air follows, and I presume my phone has finally died. Fitting it would be in the middle of an important question. You there? Tanner? Still here. Did anyone tell Nico what happened to me? No, of course not. Bad for business. Tanner probes. You didn't tell him where you were going, did you? No, I sigh. I'm not allowed to contact any of my previous clients. Then I'd follow that directive, Sib. 
Go to rehab. Stop squandering your talent on useless men. Before I can respond, my phone goes black. Damn it. After plugging the phone into a charger, I go into the bathroom and take a long, hot shower, steaming up the mirror, bawling my eyes out where no one can hear me. Holden changed my passcode, and now I can't see my messages or who said what. I'm resentful I'm being punished when he's the one who missed an important milestone a few weeks ago. My 34th birthday passed without so much as a happy birthday emoji. That would be the day Holden didn't check his social media, I think caustically. It just so happened that Nico was my last appointment of the day, and Leslie stepped inside my office to say goodbye for the evening and to wish me one last happy birthday. I can't wait until tomorrow to hear what Holden planned as a surprise. Thanks, I forced a terse smile out. But Nico's intuitive, and it didn't go unheeded, at least not by him. I dumbly smiled when he asked about my evening plans. I tried unsuccessfully not to show Nico my disappointment or the tears I was holding back. Your husband must be planning one hell of a surprise party. I couldn't keep the disappointment from my voice. Then I hope you're invited, because he hasn't mentioned my birthday. No. Yes, I said sulkily. You mean regarding your plans tonight, he frowned. You don't mean he forgot your actual birthday. No, I stammered. I mean, yes. I leaned back in my chair as if I couldn't care less. I'm a tough attorney, not a blubbering Barbie. At least he hasn't acknowledged it. Who knows? Maybe he will later. Did he tell you to be home at a certain time? No. I glanced at my watch. He has a class to teach tonight. With a grimace, Nico said, There's no way I'm letting you spend your birthday alone. It's fine, Nico, I objected. I can go out with one of my girlfriends. They assumed I was busy tonight, so we scheduled something this weekend. But he wouldn't let me off the hook, intent on celebrating with me. I told him it was a bad idea, but he wanted to know why. We're friends, right? Friends celebrate their birthdays together. But it's not appropriate. I tried to dissuade him. You're a current client. He narrowed his eyes at me and I withered under his disapproving glance. Today is important, and we're going to make it one for the books, he promised. I didn't ask him to clarify his statement because I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. Was I attracted to him? No doubt. It took Nico a couple tries to convince me to have a drink with him, which I think thrilled him, because he likes an actual chase, not a sure thing. After he left my office, and I spent thirty minutes freshening up my makeup and persuading my reflection I wasn't doing anything wrong or immoral, I met him at a dark speakeasy. We sat in a dark leather booth, where we started on opposite sides, trading stories of our past and present. To break the ice, we did a round of shots. The liquor flowed, and so did the conversation. It's easy to talk to Nico, not stilted like it is with Holden, who never pays attention. He listens but doesn't hear me. Another round of shots went down smooth. Somehow we ended up seated on the same side. I'm uncertain who suggested it first, and by then reasonably inebriated. And then, lost in a trance, I don't hear the knock on the bathroom door. Suddenly I'm brought back to the present when another sharp tap interrupts my thoughts. I'm sitting on the tiled bench in the walk-in shower when Holden walks in. He peers at my barely visible shape in the foggy glass. Did you even know I was gone? Yes, I saw your note. Holding my iPhone up, he says, I see you found this. You had no right to tell me it was lost, I say irritably. 
not to mention changing my access code. What did we agree on? Furiously, I rub at the steam on the glass to stare him down. Sibley. He shakes his head angrily. What did you tell me would be different after your birthday? You mean the birthday you forgot? I step out of the shower and wrap myself in a towel. That I would give you access to my phone, and I did, I grumble, which is why you were able to change it in the first place. You reached out to Nico before you crashed your car. He shrugs. We agreed you wouldn't text him any personal messages, and you did it anyway. I don't have a recollection of this, so I shrug my shoulders. Come on, let's go eat. Holden points downstairs. The food's going to get cold. When we go downstairs to eat, he's lit some candles and set the formal dining table, and it only makes me feel more like a piece of shit. Even sitting close, we have a noticeable distance between us. It makes me sad, and I stare at his profile while he unwraps and uncovers our dinner. He settles a napkin in my lap and our eyes lock. Mine are filled with tears. Sib, he asks, what's wrong? <sighs> Nothing. I shake my head, forcing the tears to retreat. This looks delicious. I hope so. It's your favorite. He sits down next to me. Are you okay? You seem off, like a light bulb just turned off in your head. I'm just apprehensive. With wooden expressions, we sit in silence at the table, both lost in our own thoughts. There's so much I want to ask him, but I'm scared to open our collective wounds. My ego's fragile, and deep down I'm worried my inability to handle an answer I don't want to hear will set me back. Twirling some pasta on my fork, I finally say, I know I need to do this. I know it's been difficult. I want to fix this and fix us. I know I have to accept responsibility for my actions. I know, Sib. I just hope it isn't too late. Me too. Are you scared? No. I meet his eyes. Petrified. He grabs my hands in his and holds them tightly. Will you please sleep with me tonight? I plead. Hesitating, he stares down at our interlocked hands. I don't think that's a good idea. I just mean in the same bed. Please. I beg. I don't want to sleep alone tonight. It's my last night here. Holden relents, and after we climb into bed later, he quickly switches off the lamp on the nightstand. Because of my constant headaches and a good chance of a concussion, we've kept the lights low or off. He clasps my hand in his, and we lie together, side by side in silence. I feel impending doom, a sign of a panic attack lurking, and my resolve to never drink again lessens. I whisper, it's going to be weird to be cut off from society and have no access to technology. This will be the longest we've gone without communication. It might be good for us, he offers. I think we can talk after you finish detox. That might be a good goal being able to speak with your husband after you purge the bad stuff. Will you miss me? Even in the absence of light, I sense indecision. Instantly, my body tenses, a knee-jerk reaction. I pull my hand from his. Sibley, stop, he quietly commands. I'm not going to lie and say it hasn't been stressful for a while. You put us through the ringer. What about what you've done? I cross my arms over my chest. You're not innocent in this, Holden. There's two of us in this marriage. I know, he concedes. So this will be a nice reprieve for both of us. Please don't say it that way. Why? I wish I could turn my back to him. It's true. I don't want to fight. 
he begs quietly. Then let's go to sleep. I bring my hand up in the dark, and a fingernail goes to my mouth, a nervous habit of mine. My nails are already a wreck, but I find comfort in ripping away another sliver of skin, as shredded as my dignity. I yelp as the metallic taste of blood hits my tongue. Stop biting your nails, Holden chastises, yanking my hand away from my face. Neither of us can sleep, and I fumble for him in the dark, hoping Holden will want to close the void between us. He doesn't swat my hand away, instead choosing to entwine his fingers with mine. But it's another glaring spotlight on our tenuous marriage, and I wonder if we'll outlast the next six months or finally grind to a halt. He wraps his hand around my wrist, and I become anchored to him. When he does this, I sometimes feel claustrophobic, as if caught in an undercurrent, and if something happens, he'll pull me down with him to drown. But tonight, I need his superfluous touch. Holden tosses and turns beside me, and coupled with my intrusive thoughts, neither of us can sleep comfortably for more than a few hours at a time. It's as if we've lost the power to tread water. Now we're just floundering. Chapter 12 Sibley Bleary-eyed in the morning, I'm surprised when Holden hasn't loaded his Subaru up with my luggage, but instead has breakfast waiting for me downstairs. When I'm seated, he tells me there's been a change of plans. He seems nervous, his hands fidgeting as he moves the salt and pepper shakers around. I talked with Adrian about... Uh, about taking you. What do you mean? She'll be here in a few to pick you up. You don't want to take me? It's not like that. He removes his glasses. Crap. I can go if you'd like me to. I didn't mean for it to seem like I don't care. No, it's okay. I sip my coffee. I'm just surprised. You haven't let me out of your sight lately. I worry about you. He touches my cheek. I thought you could use some time with Adrian. I know she's your best friend and probably a better support system than me right now. Thank you. I squeeze his hand in mine. I appreciate you saying that. I always hoped you'd be able to confide in me and tell me all your secrets, but there's so much you keep in, Sib. He replaces his glasses with a sigh. Or maybe I'm not a good enough listener and haven't made you feel safe enough to share. Either way, you deserve to have your best friend with you, and that's not me anymore. He covers his face with his hands. Maybe it never was. His words tug at my heartstrings, and I burst into tears. His own are running down his now wet cheeks. We swipe at each other's faces and clutch each other's shoulders as if we can erase our past mistakes. We've had a long marriage, and we've made many. Both of us are scared to move, and our arms stay in a half-embrace for a long time. Eventually, we pull away from each other, and I don't know if this is goodbye or good luck. Either way, we are both hurting, a sense of finality behind our emotions. When Adrian arrives... She's unusually stoic, and I can tell she's having a hard time with the reality of today. We exit through the garage, and my eyes stare at the spot where my Tesla used to sit, now nothing more than an empty space with an oil stain from a previous vehicle. Holden drags his feet behind us and loads my suitcase into the back of Adrian's small SUV. He sends me off with a tight hug and a chaste kiss, and the smell of his cologne and the look of his sad eyes are etched in my memory as we back out of the driveway. We have a long drive to what's considered a state-of-the-art luxury rehab facility inspired by the tranquility of a resort and the secrecy of a mountain hideaway 
with expert staff well-educated and trained on addictions. Or at least that's what the website touts. They have yoga, which I read can help with detox, Adrian mentions. She's a certified yoga instructor and is a massive proponent of Reiki and meditation. I barely nod. Are you even paying attention? Not really. Nerves? She taps her fingers on the gear shift. Okay, I got you. You're afraid, so let's break it down. It's more than that, I admit. I'm worried about my job. You mean because you're taking time off to come here? Sib, she sighs. You can't focus on that. Your recovery is the most important thing right now. I know. But I'm also worried about one of my cases. Adrian waits for me to elaborate. I have a client that's getting a divorce, and I just found out the client's wife was at the home of one of my colleagues. Okay, but what's the big deal? She broods. You think the wife wants representation from your firm? Something we like to call ethics. Both my client and his wife would have to sign off to have two attorneys from the same firm representing them in their divorce. Since when did attorneys start having scruples? She teases. And did your colleague tell you the wife came to them personally? We only do when it benefits us. I elbow her in the ribs. Except in this case, it's Tanner. Isn't he one of your closest work friends? I thought so. And you didn't know they knew each other? Nope. I grumble, wishing I had something to dull the battering ram in my head. But how does it affect you? Adrian asks gently. I mean, this sounds like soap opera drama, but why would Tanner be out to get you? Because in my absence, another attorney will take over my cases for me. Babe, I love you, but I'm not following this train. What does your out-of-control ass have to do with Tanner and your client's wife? If she and Tanner are hooking up and my clients reassigned to him, then his vested interest is in the wife of your client, which makes you a liability. I'd say collateral damage. I shudder. If Tanner's successful, he'll represent my client and be privy to all his financial records and bungle his case big time, but in a way that isn't obvious. I can't be the fall girl for the case. How would that work out? I have my suspicions. I tear at a fingernail. But it will be hard to prove when he's not easily accessible to me. Then someone better keep an eye on dear sweet Tanner, Adrian says excitedly. What about your paralegal, that Leslie chick? Can she watch your back while you're gone? Possibly. I lean my head back against the seat. Except I'm not sure where she falls into this. You think she's doing you dirty? No, but I don't know what lies Tanner's feeding her or what promises he's made. Adrian pats my knee. I don't want to minimize your frustration and hurt with these people, but this is better than all the courtroom nonsense I see on TV. I give her a wink. I'm glad I could provide you entertainment, dear friend. We become tenser and less talkative the farther out of town we drive. As the reality sets in, this isn't a girl's trip to somewhere fun, but a severe departure from our everyday lives. The rest of the drive we chat about everything but where we're headed, and too quickly we've reached our destination, which isn't where I'm supposed to be. Are you really sure about this? Adrian asks one last time as we pull up the long, winding driveway instead of being at a resort-like rehabilitation facility, we're on the outskirts of the desert, about two hours outside the city. I am. I ask to borrow her phone. I'm going to call Holden since we're about halfway to the facility. I'll tell him we stop for gas. Holden picks up on the second ring, concern in his voice. Everything okay? Uh-huh, 
I say. Google Maps estimates we're about 120 miles away. We stopped for gas, so I wanted to call you since reception's getting spotty. That's not a surprise. You're heading up into the mountains. I always lose my signal not far from there. I'll check in when I can. Don't worry about me, Sib. I can tell he's struggling with finding the right words. Just focus on your recovery, okay? I will. Be safe, he adds. And put Adrian on the phone, please. As I hand Adrian back her phone, the screen feels damp against my fingers. Confused, I realize it's from the tears sliding down my cheek. I hear Holden ask her to call him once she's dropped me off. Adrian looks at me and squeezes my arm after hanging up. It's going to be fine. I'm risking a lot. I bite my trembling lip. Holden's never going to forgive me for this. And you're never going to forgive yourself if you don't make amends back at home. She tugs on a strand of my hair. You know I would never agree to cover for you if I didn't think it was important. She stares at the house up ahead. I'm going to tell myself the end goal is to help save your marriage and your health. Now, here's your replacement phone. Don't get excited, she warns. It's basic as fuck. Wow, you aren't joking. The one time I lost my phone, it was a wake-up call since I realized I hadn't bothered to memorize anyone's number but Holden's. This time I only program in a couple of contacts, bypassing Tanner's with an angry sigh. I'm supposed to be off the grid, so I don't need many. Grinning, I see Adrian saved me the trouble of adding her contact info. She's saved as Wing Woman. She's definitely my partner in crime, her status is at a whole new level with our covert operation. Thank you, I whisper. I'm lucky to have you as a friend. Now go, or you're going to make me cry. After Adrian helps unload my suitcase, she gives me a tight hug. Let me know when you're safe. Pointing to a duffel bag, she nods at it. I packed what you asked me to in here. I open the zipper and there's an envelope filled with cash, a refurbished laptop, a map, and a few other requests I made. She also hands me another envelope with a money order inside. Did you have any problem getting the cash or money order? No, she says. I withdrew it from my account just in case. You're the best, I wink, wing woman. Chapter 13 Sibley I walk toward a small house where an elderly man is waiting near a used car. Barely able to contain my excitement, I've never been so thrilled to buy a car, not even when I purchased my Tesla. The man is shocked I don't want to go on a test drive, but in the interest of time, I do my due diligence and inspect the car, not letting on I know the bare minimum. It's had a recent oil change. He's kept impeccable records on any repairs, and even though the outside has seen better days, the interior is clean. Adrian doesn't drive off yet, ensuring I'm not about to be swindled by this unknown seller from a vehicle marketplace, and then get stuck in the middle of nowhere. Giving her a thumbs up, I present the man with a money order. He hands me the keys to my very used and over a decade-old white Toyota Corolla with striped window tint and rock chips that have dented both the windshield and the body of the vehicle. But I don't care. It's mine and it's freedom. With one last fleeting smile and a heavy wave, Adrian leaves me standing in front of my new used car. Clenching the keys in my hand, I throw my luggage in the back, ready to start my cross-country drive. Adrian was right the other night. Before I can rehabilitate myself, I have to confront the demons of my past head-on. And that starts with my only living blood relative. I have to go back to my childhood home, 
a farm in the middle of the country, square in the center of the state. It's time to confront my mother about my father's death and what really happened on that night sixteen years ago. The details have startling clarity, even after all this time. This will take patience and understanding, since my mother and I have never had what most would consider a typical mother-daughter relationship. But then again, I can't even say what that is. I grew up as an only child, a tomboy who preferred to be outside, my father's small shadow. Our relationship became strained in high school when I found out some unsavory details about her, and it only culminated in an estrangement after my father's death and my move to the desert. It hurt my mother when I left after my high school graduation, but we'd suffered too much tragedy to make it less than a painful goodbye. I never looked back as my tires squealed out of the drive so fast gravel sputtered. The problem with time, I contemplate, is that it passes, and you tend to get stuck in the minutia, right or wrong. I've tried to reach out to her, but she's been unresponsive. She's never visited, not even to attend my wedding. Previously, her minimal interactions included an occasional phone call or card in the mail, and bizarrely, the greeting wouldn't match the holiday. As she was unresponsive to emails, I extended multiple offers for her to visit over the years, but the plane tickets went unused. Eventually, our communication dried up, and the years became a long gap of estrangement. When I reached out recently, nothing but crickets. As I start the long haul back to my humble beginnings, the thought of facing her now terrifies me. With so many lingering questions, it makes sense to go back to where it all started, to the environment that shaped me, for better or worse. But I have to be prepared for the possibility that she doesn't want to see me, especially since I didn't come home when she was hospitalized for a nervous breakdown after my father died. Though she was stoic for his funeral, she buckled a couple weeks later under the immense strain. I feel tense even with twenty-plus hours on the road between us, and I know I need to give her a heads up. Deborah hates surprises and isn't the type to appreciate spontaneity or an unplanned visit. I keep throwing her curveballs, starting with my conception. An uneasy feeling settles in the pit of my stomach as her house phone rings and rings. I assume my mother has more than a house phone now, but I don't have another number to reach her on. How do you not have your own mother's contact info, I think, ashamedly? What if something happens to her? But you've tried to reach out, my less critical half argues internally. On your terms, always on your terms. Disgusted, I grip the wheel. I might be a shitty daughter for leaving, but my mother made her own choices, and I suffered the consequences as a result. Lowering the window for some fresh air, I crank up the music as the landscape changes from cavernous mountains and narrow roadways at high elevations to rolling hills and valleys. During the long drive, my mind wanders, and I drift aimlessly to a memory from a few weeks ago the night Nico and I were seated side by side in a booth, our only distractions each other. Did he rest his hand on my thigh? Absolutely. Did I let him? I'm not a saint. He made me feel sexy, wanted, vulnerable, tempted, all the emotions that wane after multiple years of marriage. I twist my hair around my finger in contemplation. Nico and Holden are complete opposites. While Holden is tall and willowy with shaggy blonde hair and a matching beard, Nico is shorter than six feet and built solidly with dark hair and mostly a clean-shaven face, except when he lets it grow out a little, presumably because he's forgotten to shave. Holden's blue eyes are pools of intellectual depth, hidden behind spectacles. Nico's stunning green ones are fringed with dark lashes, 
and volatile emotions change their colors. When I compare the two men, I'd have to say if Holden were my professor, I'd flirt with him, enamored with his ability to have intense and lengthy discussions on a variety of topics. His passion for history is a turn-on. His recitation of facts, impressive. He's the kind of guy your parents hope you bring home one day, steady and reliable. Safe, though somewhat predictable. Nico, on the other hand, oozes confidence and sex appeal. He's a fire you'd want to burn your hand on just once because of the intensity. His passion sizzles with power and dominance. He's the epitome of a Tom Ford cologne ad, spicy and sensual. And in our small booth that night, Nico's hand brushed my hair. Involuntarily, I mimic him now, my cheeks blushing at the thought of my reaction when his fingers went from my head to my hands. Maybe I should have, but I didn't protest when his fingers strangled mine. A loud honk startles me out of my reverie, and I glance over at a van carrying a carload of teenagers. Laughing and carefree, they're speeding toward their destination, and I wonder where that is. I'm somewhat envious. It makes me long for my youth and the limited responsibilities of being a teenager. But as an adult, you have limited freedoms as well. I drive for about ten hours before I'm forced to pull into a rest stop and crash. When I wake up a few hours later, my neck's strained from the uncomfortable position in the back seat I was curled up in. Rubbing my tired eyes, I stop for a gas station coffee before continuing on through a rainstorm in New Mexico and a tornado warning in Kansas. After taking a quick nap at a truck stop, I need to be caffeinated, and my gaze drifts longingly to the large display of alcohol. I sigh, settling on an energy drink that gives me a rush of adrenaline and a headache. With shaking hands and no more resolve, I stop at a big box store to pick up a cooler and some supplies. I tell myself just having it in the car will help with my cravings. By the time I reach the welcome sign at the entrance to my hometown, population 1,250, the slogan of we move slowly as molasses in these parts couldn't seem more appropriate especially for someone who is driven on little sleep slogging toward a bed and a shower. Whether an acknowledgment or a humble brag, it's evocative of a time that moves listlessly without the pressures of the big city. Even though sixteen years have passed since I drove out the same way I just came in, the two-lane highway remains unchanged. I promised Adrian I would call and update her on my progress. She answers on the first ring, and I can hear the trepidation in her voice. Did you make it there yet? Almost. My yawn interrupts my unfinished thought. Only a few more miles. I'm curious to know how everything went after she dropped me off at the rehab facility. How did it go when you got to the clinic? Adrian drove all the way there, bless her heart. Fine. I sent Holden a picture of the outside of the building. I even dropped a pin at the facility so he knew I was there. She gives a nervous giggle. And I gave them the updated medical records with your recent injuries. I thank her for getting her friend, a doctor, to write a letter to the rehabilitation clinic regarding my car accident and subsequent course of treatment. I'm off the hook, at least for now. The facility thinks I'm recuperating from my injuries and will be joining them after I'm cleared to by my doctor. You're the best, I say. And don't you forget it, she teases. What do you think your mother will say when she sees you after all this time? I'm more worried about what she'll do. Adrian starts to ask a question when a news bulletin on the radio interrupts the music. Chapter 14 Sibley Breaking news. 
A manhunt is underway this morning for two inmates who escaped from the local prison around 11 a.m. Deputies have established that the inmates had assistance in escaping from at least one individual on the outside, said Thomas Delaney, the director of the Medium Security Correctional Institute. State troopers said that both inmates are believed to be hiding out in the vicinity of the prison. Deputies are canvassing the area. Updates will be provided as they become available. Holy shit, I whisper. When did they build that? What's wrong? Adrian's voice echoes, cutting in and out. Are you okay? Yeah, there's just such crappy reception out here, I say. But I made it. Phew, that takes a load off my stress. Glad to hear it. Let me know how it goes with your mom. Adrian's voice lowers. Just know I want to be here for you. I'm about to thank her when I hear the unmistakable blare of sirens in the distance. My lids jolt open, and sneaking a glance in the rear view, I expect the cop car to speed up and maneuver around me, headed for someone or somewhere else on the endless highway. But there's no sign of life out on this open stretch of the road. Peering at my speedometer, I realize I'm driving faster than the limit. Like, way faster. Holy shit. I ram my fist on the wheel. You've got to be kidding me. This Toyota isn't new enough to have Bluetooth, and a distracted driving ticket is the last thing I need, along with a citation for speeding. The police car slows from behind, which means I'm the culprit. So much for not drawing unnecessary attention to myself. It would be my luck that less than two miles from the farmhouse I grew up in, I might be put in handcuffs before my mother knows I've arrived, unannounced, of course. I wonder how far back the cruiser spotted me. Was it lurking in one of the overgrown fields, or has it been following my progress, and I never noticed, even though the scenery is flat and predictable? With the ear-splitting cacophony signaling me to stop, a bottomless pit of apprehension gnaws in my stomach. The day-old coffee I threw back like a shot of tequila sends a warning signal to my intestines. Sour tummy is what my father used to call it when I was a child. Not only are my nerves shot, but my eyes dart anxiously to the rearview mirror. I didn't expect to glimpse the bumper of a squad car, especially on this open and desolate road. I grew up out here in rural America, and even though there's an endless supply of soybean and hog confinement lots, the opposite is true of uniforms and crime. The occasional break-in or bar fight is at the top of the news hour, and shared via the gossip chain of the phone or your closest neighbor. It's unimportant to those outside the parameters of small-town life who have kidnapping and murders to contend with. Not that we're completely immune to those. If the policeman has run my temporary plates, I'm in trouble. Driving on a suspended license in a vehicle with a title I haven't switched over is frowned upon. I'll be in big trouble. With white knuckles, I take my foot off the accelerator and put it on the brake, slowing so I can pull off onto the gravel side. I turn on my hazard lights out of habit, not a necessity since there are more people in the city I live in now than in this entire state. Cattle outnumber residents here. Sucking in a deep breath, I wait for what's next, running through illogical options in my mind. If I speed off, it'll result in a chase, negative publicity, and an imminent arrest. So as I stare at my fair skin and freckles in the mirror, the lingering cruiser crawls to a stop behind me. When the dust settles, I make out the slightly balding head of a man staring down at something in his hand. His phone, I assume. Hopefully his wife or his captain texted him, and he's in a rush to leave. Maybe he'll peel off toward the scene of something more exciting than a wannabe drifter. Aren't the prison escapees a more pressing concern at the moment? 
A fingernail goes to my mouth in nervous anticipation. He's about six feet tall and stocky, and his bulging biceps are glued in place by an even tighter uniform. His purposeful stride and swinging arms remind me of someone I used to know, but his eyes are protected in the sweltering June heat by his sunglasses. Quickly, I move my hands back to the steering wheel so they're clearly in the officer's line of sight. My window's down by the time he appears to my left, yet I'm reluctant to lower my own shades to unveil my apparent signs of distress. I prefer to struggle with my fragility internally. I want to seem amenable when, in reality, a considerable weight hangs over my head. They say eyes are the windows to the soul, and fortunately, my swollen, tear-stained ones are shielded. The cop pauses for a moment, examining my worn tires, the dented hood that looks like someone took a hammer to it, and the peeling window tint. His stare lingers on my now reddened cheeks. Good morning, ma'am. He rests a hand on his hip, presumably wanting to appear casual, as if we're two people who've stopped to chat for a friendly conversation, not a traffic violation. Morning, sir, I sputter. Do you know why I pulled you over? Should I try for contrition or humor? Sarcasm and a timid smile win. I fix him with my best grin, albeit a tired one. I'm guessing I lost track of the speed limit due to the fact I'm really into the new T-Swift record. He chuckles, and instantly I recognize who the voice belongs to. Without being able to see his eyes, I peer into the face of my former friend, Miles Fletcher. His family grew up in a neighboring town less than ten miles from mine, and because of the size, most kids were bussed into one central high school. We were platonic, except for an awkward kiss at a barn party one night after drinking a brand of off-label vodka that caused residual pain and the threat of puking long after we'd imbibed. You know, the type that tastes like gasoline as it cauterizes your throat and burns down your esophagus to churn uneasily in your stomach. It's cheap and easy to score or steal, and sold in liter bottles that cost substantially less than other brands. You pay for it with the repulsiveness of the substance you can barely swallow. Miles Fletcher has aged since I last saw him at the end of our senior year of high school. I can tell he's rocking a farmer's tan by the sallow skin sticking out from his shirt sleeve that draws a sharp contrast to the rest of his arm. It reminds me of my father's uneven tans from his time in the fields. License and registration, please. He says it politely, but I catch a steely undertone. I fumble for my purse on the passenger seat. This a new ride? Oh, you mean because of the temporary plates? I smirk. Yes, it beats putting miles on my lease. His eyebrows rise sky high, and I get the impression he's flabbergasted at who would willingly purchase this junker, bald tires and all. Girl on the run, that's who. I pull out the flimsy plastic of my license, biding my time. How could I be so stupid and careless, allowing myself to speed across the rolling prairie? I drove over miles and miles of pavement, surrounded by tall corn stalks and blue skies without exceeding the limit. I motion to my plugged-in phone. Let me pull up my insurance information for you. I don't bother to add that my current policy is for a black Tesla I wrecked, or that I no longer possess a valid license or the accompanying insurance. You don't have a paper copy? As if reading my mind, he says dubiously, Doubt you'll get reception out here. He points to a pothole straight ahead. You have to cross that before it works. I'm sorry, officer. I shake my head. I don't. 
Let me guess, you're saving the environment by not printing it out, just like those damn paper straws that dissolve before I can drink a sip of my pop. The sneer I give him makes him add, And yes, lady, I have been out west before. My lip quivers, and I try for a woman in distress. Do you by any chance have a tire pressure gauge? You don't have one? With tires this shoddy? He scratches his chin. I hope you didn't pay much for this clunker. It's a Toyota. They run forever. I cross my arms defensively. Plus, I couldn't afford much. Desperately, I add. And certainly not a ticket. You should have thought of that before speeding like a bat out of hell. Uh, Mrs. Bradford. Seventy-nine and a fifty-five. He slaps my license against his palm. Are you moving here or just passing through? Visiting is all I give him. Tell you what, I'll bring a gauge back when I'm done writing you a ticket. You're going too fast to get off with just a warning. I decide now's not the right time to joke about a rumor in high school about how he couldn't satisfy his girlfriend and she cheated on him with a quarterback. Again, he scans my license before his eyes drift to my ring finger. Sibley, eh? He taps a finger at the smiling picture of me from three years ago, when hitting my thirties seemed like I'd hit my stride. If only I'd known what was in store for me. I knew a girl, except my last name is no longer Sawyer, and I'm no longer the girl he used to know. I take a cursory glance at myself in the mirror. How have I aged compared to my classmates, to the general population? I've always thought I've done well, or at least faked it, able to afford some of the pricier creams and skin procedures to keep a youthful glow that lets me pass for my late twenties. I decide to test him. Fletch? Uh-huh. He doesn't notice his nickname, or if he does, he pays it no mind, laser-focused on every detail of my out-of-state license. And just like the thought of discount vodka, it makes my stomach seethe like I'm back in high school, a red plastic solo cup pressed to my lips, drinking the vile liquid named after our state. It seems to be the only way to generate brand loyalty for liquor that tastes like an oil field. His phone buzzes in his pocket, and impatient, he says, We can skip the insurance. Just need that registration, and I can get you on your way. Fletch, I plead. I hadn't planned on announcing I was back home, but it looks like I have no choice. What? he says automatically. Why are you such a dumb shit? With a swipe, his sunglasses land on top of his head. Narrowed slits regard me with disdain. What did you just call me? I lower my glasses, and our eyes meet. Flicking my index finger and thumb against the license in his hand, I bellow, Miles Andrew Fletcher, since when did you stop answering to your self-appointed nickname? His head instantly bows, a knee-jerk reaction to his mother screaming his full name whenever he was in trouble, which was often. My parents did the same with me. I grin when his face lights up with recognition. A whistle escapes through the pucker of his mouth. Wait, Sibby Sawyer? His eyes drift again to my bare ring finger. Duh, how many Sibleys do you know? None but you, thank the Lord. I see you've taken the town slogan to heart. I roll my eyes. You always this slow on the uptake? Well, we lost the only fast pony we had. His green eyes dance as he chuckles. My face must give something away because he's quick to point out, I meant your wild streak. It's sorely missed around these parts. Oh, I know what you mean, Fletch. I tease. I grew up beating you at every game we played, even girl softball. And broke every heart in the process, except yours. Don't kid yourself, Sibby. Sibby. 
My nickname rolls off his tongue just as quickly as it did back then. It's surreal to hear it after all these years. And last I knew, you were some kind of fancy doctor now. He pretends to try to remember my occupation. What do you call it, a juris doctor? That silly title, it's just a fancy piece of paper I hang in my office. If I still had an office, I don't bother to mention. My face burns at the memory of being escorted off the premises of my employer, a potted plant in hand, my navy suede Jimmy Choo's clomping down the back staircase so I didn't have to take the elevator and risk the curiosity of more inquisitive eyes. I focus on the holster that contains Fletch's gun and the handcuffs dangling from his waist while he examines my bare finger again. It's coming. I thought you got married. I did. He doesn't mention the noticeably absent jewelry, but prods. Everything okay? I don't bother to tell him I'm supposed to be at a rehabilitation clinic and wearing jewelry isn't allowed, or that I left my diamond engagement band and matching ring on my husband's dresser at his behest. We're taking a break. It's somewhat of a truth, somewhat of a lie. Trial separation. I'm embarrassed at the thought Fletch is going to mention the plethora of crumpled mascara streaked napkins I've soaked from crying at the breakdown of my marriage and the silent rejection from my own mother. Marriage is hard, he says, commiserating. Without thinking, he blurts out, I hope you picked a better guy than your father. Both of our faces redden. Ouch. Refusing to engage with this subject, I stare at the absence of a band on his finger. You were smart not to bother. Who said I didn't? Miles Fletcher, who was the unlucky girl? You know her. You guys used to be tight before the drama started. That's one way to put it, I guess. I unhinge my jaw, knowing exactly who he's talking about. I try not to throw up in my mouth at the thought of my arch-nemesis. Kristen used to be what is now called a frenemy, and we had our spats, whether it be over boys or other friends. A drama seeker, she loved being the center of attention at all costs, no matter who got hurt. I learned this the hard way. When Kristen and Fletch started dating our senior year, I figured they deserved each other. It was after an unforgettable Halloween party, when Kristen spread a vicious rumor without regard for anyone involved. And after she dumped her boyfriend, Josh, for the umpteenth time, she and Fletch decided to give it a go. I never paid attention to see if their relationship fizzled or made it down the altar. Kristen and I were married for twelve years, he says proudly. He would marry her, especially since she did everything in her power to destroy my family. Stop making it about you, I warn myself. You made it longer than most. Would have made it longer, but she, oh, um, she, I can't help myself. Cheated? Of course not. Crestfallen, he takes a deep breath. How could you even ask that? With what? Shit. Foot and her mouth. I'm royally screwing up my chances of getting out of here without a ticket, not to mention without a beautiful garnish of silver cuffs that can't be ordered from the home shopping network. I'm sorry, I sigh. It's been a long drive, and I'm not thinking clearly. I'm in desperate need of sleep. Sniffing my armpit jokingly, I confess, and a shower. I stare into the same wounded animal eyes he gave me the afternoon of our earth-shattering fight, one that caused a close friendship of ten years to end promptly, and at the time felt like an amputation of a necessary limb. I extend an olive branch in the form of a small smile. What happened with Kristen? She died. 
I became a widower, not by choice. I'd rather puke than say this, but I force it out. It's not like I haven't embellished or lied through my teeth for the majority of my career. That's awful, Fletch. I'm really sorry to hear it. I touch his hand for a fleeting second. I wish I would have known. Even with all our differences, that's not fair. And so young. I whisper, life is so unfair sometimes, isn't it? A rush of anger colors his cheeks. It certainly is. I'm really sorry. I chew my lip. I know you've had a tough go of it over the years. How would you know? He rebukes. You up and left. We could have leaned on each other. Once again, I'm not taking the bait. I mustn't run my mouth right now. I might win the argument, but I'll lose the war. I'm thinking about how much more Fletch could do, like arrest me and haul me off to jail. I've already done a piss-poor job of blending in. I need to keep him talking so he doesn't mention my plates again. If not, I'll be the headline by tomorrow morning, and if you think people don't read their newspapers in these parts, you're wrong. I can hear my mother now, worried about being the town gossip again. How's the farm? His dad uses six acres of land to grow Christmas trees of different pine variations, including scotch, white, and red tree species. We used to go there as a family tradition for the choose and harvest method, where we would cut down our own in early December. Dad's still chugging away at the tree business. Seriously? I screech. I figured he'd have handed that off to one of you boys by now. He says he'll try for next year, but he always has to have multiple irons in the fire. Is Bryce taking over, or are you quitting the force? His brother is two years older than him, and both are in constant competition to be the favorite child. The sour expression on his face tells me that hasn't changed. He'll have to, since I'm about to get a promotion. He shrugs, like it's no big deal, but his posture straightens in an attempt to puff out his chest. The police chief's finally retiring next year. Congratulations! I joke. I'll send you both a bottle of room-temperature vodka. Hmm. He taps a finger against his chin. I don't trust your brand preferences. I'd sooner siphon gas from the tank than drink that poison. With another glance at my driver's license, he motions to the squad car. Let me go run this. Get the tire gauge, and I'll be back. You know you're only prolonging my arrival. I say, my mother's going to be all over your ass for keeping me. I should be over hers. Deborah never told me you were coming for a visit. He shakes his head sadly. I'm aloof. It's a bit of a um, surprise. Surprise? He fixes me with a stern look. He knows my mother hates surprises. Then he softens his gaze. Though, truth be told, I'm glad to see you. You must have come home because you heard the news. What news? I pop my sunglasses back over my eyes to conceal my bewilderment. Did something happen? Narrowing his eyes at me, Fletch asks when we last communicated. I shrug. I wrote her a few letters, and I didn't hear back. My voice trails off. Was this recently? He shifts his weight onto his other leg. I think you'll see that the farm doesn't look quite the same. What do you mean? He scratches a mosquito bite on his arm. She's having a hard time. When was the last time you saw her? She called into the station a couple of weeks ago. About what? My stomach drops. Is she okay? I took the call. He motions in the opposite direction. Deborah almost crashed into the ditch a couple of miles from the farm. Was she avoiding a deer or coon? No. She thought she saw an animal, though. He adds, she was pretty shaken up, 
said she'd been having trouble with her eyesight. Hmm, I offer. Maybe she just needs an appointment with her optometrist. I'll ask her. Speaking of poor judgment, I bet she wishes she could have avoided seeing you, I whistle. If I remember correctly, you hit the Eisenberg's award-winning heifer and our mailbox. That old cow was blocking the road, he protests, handing me back my license. I hope you know I've buried the hatchet with Deborah. As he fixes me with a hard stare, my cheeks redden. My mother always blamed Fletch erroneously for a broken window that wasn't his fault, but I never set the record straight. I'd scored free concert tickets from a radio station during my junior year of high school. Kristen was dating Bryce at the time, and all four of us went together. Our parents found out, and by the time we got home, we had no idea that we were busted. I had left a ladder hidden, the kind you use to escape a fire, but my dad had locked my bedroom window so I couldn't sneak back inside. I know he meant for me to come in the front door and face him, but Kristen threw a rock and shattered the glass so we could crawl back inside. My mother blamed Fletch because he stuttered and choked on his words for years at the mention of that night. My throat becomes dry when I think about how junior year was the last time life felt normal. Everything went into the gutter in my senior year. Yeah, I should have told her the truth. There's more. He opens his mouth, but a crackle comes through his radio. His name loud and clear. He speaks into the receiver and tells dispatch he'll be right there. I gotta take this. Waving a hand, he says, Just be cognizant of your surroundings. I'm not trying to scare you, but things have changed since your time, when we could just leave the doors unlocked. You probably know this since you moved to a big city and all. Safety is an illusion. And go to bed. His pointed stare is directed at my bloodshot eyes and limp hair in need of a wash. You look like you haven't slept in days. Good thing I only have two miles to go, I grin. But okay, and thanks. I wrinkle my nose at him. That's a nice way of telling me I look like shit. A smile curls at his lips. You know, you can always count on me to tell the truth. I try not to show my disgust. His truth isn't always factual. Many times it's a matter of opinion. His opinion. As I'm taking the Toyota out of park, he slaps his hand on the open window to get my attention. And Sibby? Pausing with my foot on the accelerator, I wait. I'll give you a warm town welcome back to these parts if you slow the hell down. He bites his lip. Please drive safely. We don't want to lose any more family members. His eyes linger on mine a second too long. Or have any more accidents. With a withering smile, I tuck the plastic back in my wallet. The word hits me like the sound of a pistol at the start of a race. I'm swiftly transported back in time to a difference of opinion between Miles Fletcher and me. We both have a different view of the turn of events, how they unfolded, and where to lay the blame. I think my father's death was a tragic accident. In contrast, Fletch alleges foul play and something sinister at the hands of my mother, Deborah. I do not agree with him, which puts us on opposing sides with insurmountable obstacles between us. Now, after Fletch manages one last nod, his footsteps crunch loudly as they retreat. A lump in my throat burgeoning, I forcefully turn off my hazard lights and jerk onto the blacktop. It seems fitting that my welcome home would be from the person who chased me away to begin with. Part 3 Sibley and Deborah Chapter 15 Sibley As I reach the stretch of our twenty-seven-acre farm, I turn on my blinker, signaling out of habit. 
I snicker. Using it seems silly since it's obvious where I'm going. In the rear view, Fletch slows behind me on the empty highway, giving the customary short neighborly honk as his arm lingers out of the open window, a small wave as he speeds off. Now that I've seen the wasteland the farm has become, it doesn't take me long to see what Fletch meant about changes. Time has hit pause on the stark prairie, and it's as if I'm Rip Van Winkle waking from a very long nap to find everything exactly as it was, but not as it should be. As I pass the ancient windmill, the blades rotate, lazily moving in the sun. I involuntarily shudder at the root cellar in the distance. It's now padlocked with a heavy chain tethered across it. At least no one can get stuck down there accidentally, I think grimly. My gaze drifts to the tool shed, and I slow to a crawl, but I practically miss the edge of the gravel driveway. The distinction between the fragmented pieces of stone in the yard is now one overgrown mess. The infinite expansion of weeds has swallowed the broad stretch, and dandelions seem to proliferate in every square inch unoccupied by crabgrass. When I hightailed it out of here, I thought of it like a lousy breakup, permanent and with finality. Gripping the hard plastic of the steering wheel, I'm overcome with raw emotion. This new reality has me unnerved. What did you expect? I chide myself. She lives out here, alone like a pariah. Did you really think folks would get over what happened out here? They might have forgiven Jonathan's death, but not that of the church-going, volunteer-loving, perfect mother and wife, Cindy. I shudder again as I settle back against the seat, my hand hesitating on the gear shift. Despite the summer humidity, my whole body tingles with goosebumps when the red barn comes into my periphery, a visceral reaction I have when I think of that night. The gambrel roof of the barn has two different slopes on each side, and even though the roof's designed to eliminate both water and snow, its worn-away shingles signal their own fatigue. It must be hard to sag under the weight of guilt and time, I suppose. My heart skips a beat. If my mother isn't keeping the property up, what did she spend all the life insurance money on? She couldn't possibly be squirreling it away. Part of the reason so many people think she did him dirty is tied to the exorbitant sum of money my mother inherited after my father died. But looking at this eyesore, you wouldn't know it. Maybe that's been her brilliant plan all along, let the town think she's destitute. I guess after my long-term absence, she'd probably tell me it's none of my business. Souring on the idea of a reunion and feeling guilty for abandoning this life for a new, shinier one, I already want to crawl under a rock. If my mother was struggling, why didn't her doctor or the hospital call me? Because you wanted nothing to do with the likes of Deborah Sawyer, I recall. But why didn't Fletch bother to pick up the phone? Because of the very same reasons, I lament. Parched, I realize how thirsty I am. At one of my pit stops, I picked up a red plastic cooler. Now I fumble for it in the back seat. Most of the plastic bottles are filled with alcohol, a trick I've been using for years to avoid detection, which was another reason I wasn't keen on running into the police. Sniffing for one that's vodka, I'm dismayed to find this is my last bottle. After I tip my head back to swig it the same way people throw back coffee, it goes down smoothly, no chaser needed. After the last drop is drunk, I toss the plastic back in the cooler. One voice inside my head tells me I'm not an alcoholic, while its counterproductive companion tells me I sorely need help. Regardless, it's not enough. I need more, a lot more. Sedatives or liquid courage to calm my shredded nerves. If I turn around and go back west, she'd never know I was here. 
I tell myself if my mother needed my help, she'd have responded to my attempts to reconcile. It's a painful rejection, but it's one I've had to live with. If I leave now, I could go straight to rehab, and Holden and my firm wouldn't know about the stunt I pulled. I can't change the past, and by the looks of the place, there's nothing to salvage. Except what good is living if I'm confined to four walls, I muse. Whether it be a rehab facility or jail or in the form of my addiction. I squeeze my hands in my lap. You're not a real addict, Sibley. That's what weak people admit to. By now, my mother has probably taken notice of a strange vehicle in the drive. She might have heard Fletch's neighborly honk before he continued on the highway stretch. If I look through the small window over the kitchen sink, I bet I'll see her ogling at the disruption. <sighs> Taking another deep breath, I force myself out of the driver's seat before traipsing through the budding jungle to the front stoop of the faded box. My mother always kept a well-tended garden and yard. Even after Daddy died, before falsehoods drowned out facts, neighbors pitched in and helped with chores until we got back on our feet. I'm disgusted the weeds have engulfed the wraparound porch to become a single landscape without any ending or beginning. If you were a painter, you'd just make a swift stroke across the canvas. How long has it been like this? I shake my head sadly. Unfortunately, the house is not a pleasant sight for my tired eyes. It's squalid with faded siding from a century of battling four seasons and uncompromising weather patterns, and I wince at the disrepair. In some places, vinyl's missing. One of the blue shutters dangles precariously off the window, like a cigarette hanging off someone's lips, signaling it could fall without warning. Nailed to the spot, I stare at the ripped mesh in the screen door drooping like a face with partial paralysis. A wave of nausea consumes me, and struck with an uncanny feeling, I pause. I ran away from this ugly olive green entrance with no plans to return. The red blinking light catches my attention. It belongs to a security camera hanging underneath the roof line. Tentatively, I knock at first timidly, and then with more force. After all, she's not expecting me. Thinking the front door will swing wide at any moment, I hear footsteps and the click of the lock. But it must be my imagination, since no one answers. Shifting impatiently from foot to foot, I'm eager to see her reaction. But there is none, because the door doesn't open. I collapse on the rickety porch swing and rest my groggy head in my hands, considering my options. I could take a nap in the back seat and wait for her to come back. But on second thought, the exertion of standing up seems like more work than it's worth. I moan. Maybe I can roll over on my side and nap until my mother arrives home. But what if she's not coming home anytime soon? Maybe she went out of town. That could be why the yard looks like a wildlife conservation area. I argue to myself as my eyes, under their sagging lids, peruse their surroundings. And go where, I think, and with whom? Suddenly a moment of clarity hits. The hidden key. Lethargic, I stumble to the side of the house. Hopeful the farm's unchanged appearance means the rest is also untouched. We kept a spare key hidden inside an old metal container by the side of the house. Under the rusted lid, there was a tiny crevice in the top where only a small object like a key would fit. Of course it's not here anymore. I decide to check the detached garage, wishing there were a window I could snoop through for my mother's car, just to confirm or deny her presence. Frustrated, I run a hand through my unkempt hair. When I kick a loose board, I catch a rusted nail and utter a steady stream of curse words. 
Unsatisfied, I followed them with a shrill yell, letting the universe know how I really feel about the kinks it keeps throwing in my master plan. I'm loud enough, the visiting birds scatter, annoyed by the sudden interruption. But my luck changes when I spot the rusted container pressed against the garage, partially hidden by an overgrown brush. As I hold my breath, the box squeaks open, and it's empty. Chapter 16 Deborah Come on in, Dr. Alicoy tells Deborah warmly. I'm just finishing up with some notes. I'll be right there. Nodding her head, Deborah settles into the leather couch that's starting to feel like a second home, now that she's had multiple sessions. Though she wouldn't go so far as to say she's a fan of coming, it doesn't cause her as much discomfort as it did. Deborah tells herself the meds can only help her feel better, and this way she can show Robert she's willing to work on herself and isn't losing her grip on reality like before. Flustered when she notices the drapes and windows are wide open, Deborah asks Alice if she can shut them. Of course. Alice waves her hand at the window. Sorry, I was in here by myself and needed some natural light and fresh air. Standing up, Deborah's caught off guard. When she notices a blonde woman getting out of a white car across the street, and then tossing something in the trash. She's wearing cut-off shorts and a tank top, and her hair rests on her head in a haphazard bun. Or maybe it's intentional, Deborah supposes, since shaggy ponytails and loose-fitting buns seem to be a popular trend. The woman crosses the street toward her and stops abruptly on the corner. She takes a few tentative steps in the opposite direction, and then, just as suddenly, turns around to pause and stare up at the sky. Her movements seem disoriented, as if she's not fully capable of carrying herself upright. When Deborah shields her eyes from the sun, she notices the absence of a wedding ring. Alice is speaking to her back, but Deborah doesn't acknowledge her. I got the records from your last MRI. Soren. Deborah whispers out loud. Beg your pardon? Deborah watches as the woman tightens the strap of her purse on her shoulder. When she twists around, Deborah scans the back of her shoulder for the defining mark. Instead, she sees artwork, some kind of tattoo, but can't make out the image. Soren. Tears well up in her eyes. She can't help herself. Deborah cups her hands by her mouth and hollers, Soren, is that you? Startled, the woman glances around for the voice responsible for shouting. Right here! Deborah knocks at the open window pane. I'm right here! Do you know that woman? Alice stands next to her at the window. Yes, Deborah manages to choke out. Please excuse me, I have to go. Not bothering to grab her purse, Deborah darts out of the office and outside. But the woman is no longer standing on the sidewalk. She's disappeared, almost as if she vanished into thin air. As she walks into a few different stores, Deborah hurriedly scans the faces of the few people she encounters. But none are the woman. Recognition lights up in Deborah's eyes at a sales clerk she knows from church but unwilling to make small talk, she abrasively asks if she's seen the blonde woman. The clerk stammers as confusion clouds her face. Frustrated at her slow reaction, Deborah fumes a goodbye and storms out. The blonde woman couldn't have evaporated. When Deborah is back on the sidewalk, she glances at the parking space where the white vehicle was parked just a few minutes ago. It's empty. I must have the wrong spot. Deborah shakes her head as she paces mindlessly up and down the concrete, scanning for the white car. Clenching her fists angrily at her sides, she blames herself for not memorizing the license plate. A tightness wells up in her chest, and unable to breathe, Deborah rests a hand on her throat. 
reassured when Alice joins her on the sidewalk. Don't let me suffocate, Deborah manages to whisper. Gingerly, Alice takes Deborah's elbow and walks her back inside the office, where the window and drapes are now closed. I think I have heat stroke, Deborah confesses, sinking into the couch. I think it's a panic attack. Alice hands her a glass. What happened with that woman? Who is she? I guess she left. Deborah gratefully sips the water. You seemed alarmed to see her. And now you're having a bout of anxiety. Alice points out gently. Did something happen between the two of you? She's from my past, is all. Deborah twists uncomfortably on what is usually a comfortable couch. Do you want to talk about her? Alice asks. Sorin, is that what you called her? Not right now. Deborah brings a sweaty palm to her forehead. I didn't know she was alive. Alice starts to ask a question, and almost as if she thinks better of it, she pauses with her mouth wide open. Deborah thinks she looks like she's trying to catch flies. With a resigned glance, Alice shuts her mouth and settles in the chair. Holding up a thick file, she flips through the pages. I got the record of your MRI back, and I'd like to schedule another CT scan. Deborah is only half listening. Is everything okay? I think we just need to complete the puzzle, Alice says thoughtfully. A couple pieces aren't fitting correctly, and I'd like to make sure we have the most up-to-date information possible. I see. Deborah leans her head back against the leather. She wishes she had a couch like this at the house. She'd surely be able to sleep then. Let me ask you this, Alice says. How are you feeling on your meds? I'm still adjusting to them. Deborah closes her eyes. My brain feels like mush. Ah, we call that brain fog. It makes it impossible for me to follow a train of thought. Deborah likens it to driving down a street and having it dead end every time. Her brain merely screeches to a sudden halt. Are you sleeping better? I am, but I feel like I want to stay in bed. Deborah clutches the water glass tightly. It's as if I can't get my day started. When I do get up, I have no energy. Do you feel depressed? No. Deborah's eyes flicker open. I should be thrilled. Alice waits for Deborah to express her emotions. My boyfriend. Oh, yes, I told you about him. Robert. He talked about us moving in together. That's exciting, Alice says. Congratulations. It seems weird to say boyfriend at my age. Are you ready for this next step? I think so. It's just hard because I've been independent for so long. Deborah bites her lip. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous. I'm super anxious about it. Let's talk about your anxiety. Alice asks her questions, and Deborah tries to answer as truthfully as possible. Have you dated or lived with anyone since your husband passed away? No. That's another reason this is such a huge change. She takes a deep inhale. And my husband, Jonathan, we didn't have the best marriage. It was rocky. It was always bad. It wasn't a fit. If you knew it wasn't a match, I'm curious to know why you married your husband then. I didn't want to. In a tempestuous voice, Deborah recalls her former love. I dated a guy named Edward in high school. We were very much in love. But he joined the Navy and got his papers to go overseas. Deborah is always surprised at the emotion she conjures up when she thinks of this. Alice must notice her discomfort because Deborah feels a tissue pressed into her hand. My father, being a preacher, 
didn't like the idea of me moving to different military bases or leaving our hometown in his watchful eye, regardless if it was for a good cause like serving our country. She dabs at the crease of her eyelid. Unbeknownst to me, my father forced Edward to break up with me on a visit home. How did that make you feel? Deborah wonders if Alice has been listening. I felt like my heart had been yanked out with pliers. So when did your husband come into the picture? Not long after. My parents forced me to attend a singles mixer at the church. They said Jonathan was a God-fearing fellow, would make a good husband, and had farming in his blood. Marriage was the furthest thing from my mind at the time. Except... Deborah inhales a sharp breath. I found out I was a couple months pregnant after I met Jonathan, except it wasn't his. I thought I was depressed since I was tired and moody all the time. I blamed it on missing Edward, but my mother made me take a test. When it came back positive, she forbade me from telling Jonathan or my father, since I was used goods and certainly Jonathan wouldn't want to marry me. Deborah chuckles. And she would have been right. When Jonathan asked my father's permission, my mother told me I didn't have a choice, that we had to act fast to pass the child off as his. And six weeks after we met, we were married in my parents' backyard. I was absolutely devastated, and I missed Edward like crazy she admits. I cried through the wedding and the awkward lovemaking, but he thought it was from inexperience. It was painful. He just didn't know it was the heartbreak kind. She recounts with a deep sadness. I found out later Edward sent letters, but my father ripped them up and burned them. At least that's what my mama told me before she died. Is that what you meant when you said, Alice consults the notepad, that your father could be cunning? Yes. Deborah crumples the tissue in her hand. After Jonathan and I sat down with my parents and announced we were having a baby, my father cornered me a couple of weeks later. Deborah drops her face into her hands. He wanted me to. Alice stares at her intently intrigue written all over her face, the pen dangling in her hand. Then the beeping of her watch interrupts the high tension in the room. Chapter 17 Sibley Even though I'm dead tired, I can't seem to get comfortable tilting my seat back for a nap. The back seat isn't any better my muscles frazzled with tension and nervous energy. Disturbed by the eyesore in front of me and a grumbling stomach, I decide to return to town, grab some food, and stock up on supplies. I'm craving the local diner and some hometown food. The freeze was the only hot spot in town when I was growing up, the celebratory place to go after home games and a popular date hangout a small diner located at the edge of the town square. It's known for its fried food and prize-winning homemade pie and ice cream. Black and white tiled floors, a jukebox, and red leather booths take you back to an earlier era. Before I eat, I decide to go to the gas station and stock up on liquor, then go through the drive through We only have two gas stations in town, and I pick the closest to the diner. The cashier is on a personal call and doesn't pay much attention to the few liters of vodka I pick up, along with soda water and orange juice to use as chasers. As I'm waiting at the drive through I do everything to ignore the intense craving that's causing tremors throughout my body. Humming along to music, I play a word game on my phone, but the incessant voice doesn't refrain from berating me about what a loser I am. I ignore the internal bully so I can eat my food. After swallowing the last greasy bite of my burger, 
I decide it can't hurt to have a couple of sips of my new purchase before I head back to the farm. It'll mellow me out and help me sleep. And if the inside of the house is as chaotic as the outside, I might want to get a hotel. You can't afford to stay in even cheap motels, I remind myself, opening the bottle. A large swallow burns down my throat, and I hope it stops the headache building behind my temples. In the side mirror, I notice a rusted-out Ford hanging a left at the stop sign. It looks identical to my mother's ancient beater. It was old then, and by now I'd have thought she'd have upgraded, what with all the money she inherited from my daddy. Thinking about this, I get heated, and wiping a frustrated hand across my brow, I watch her turn past a cluster of brick buildings on the square, then disappear from sight. She didn't give me one dime. Thinking about the farm and my deep-seated hatred toward my mother, I continue to take generous sips. Before I realize it, I've successfully emptied a third of the bottle. After opening my car door, I carefully climb out and throw my empty paper bags in the trash can. I consider driving back to the farm, but without a way to enter, what's the point? Even if my mother is running errands and isn't ready to go back home, she can give me the key so I can go lie down. I'm starting to feel unwell, the sun beating down as I make my way across the street. Glancing up at the striped awnings, I consider where she would have gone. There's a beauty salon on this side of the street. Maybe she's in there getting her hair done. If that's the case, she could be a while, I think impatiently, the buzzing in my head growing louder, decibel by decibel. A loud voice drowns out even the pounding, but I don't know where it's coming from. I turn around and don't see anyone else on the pavement yelling or even talking. Weird. Oh, I need sleep, I grumble. Pushing myself forward, I walk into the salon, but the receptionist shakes her head. No one by the name of Deborah has an appointment today. Perspiration drips down my forehead as I fight to stay upright. Dizzy, I ask the receptionist to use their bathroom. She gives me a curious glance as I pass the desk, my steps uneven and loud. Or maybe I just imagine this when it's really the beating of drums in my head. After sinking to my knees in the pristine pink bathroom, I watch as the remnants of food and alcohol eject themselves from my stomach, leaving me with a taste of bile and salt. Shakily, I wet a paper towel to wipe my brow and face. I rinse my mouth out and pop a stick of gum, my eyes bleary and unfocused in the mirror. I turn right instead of left to a red exit sign next to the bathroom and avoid the judgmental eyes of the clientele. I'm relieved the door opens to a back parking lot, and sure enough, there's my mother's car. She's not visible through the windows of the flower shop or dry cleaner. The next entrance is not glass, just metal with no windows, just brick. Curious, I look for a sign, but only letters are sketched on the outside. Dr. Alakoy is spelled out in bold black stencils, but there are no hours or even a phone number listed. It doesn't specify the type of doctor. My interest peaked. I try the handle, expecting it to be locked. Surprisingly, it's open. Since I can't see inside, I expect to be welcomed into a dark lab or something. Instead, the front room is airy and clean. There's no reception desk, just a couple of chairs. The small area is uncluttered. A couple of paintings hang on the wall, but they aren't drab walls. They are painted a warm blue tone. I'm wondering what type of office this is since I don't see a buzzer or a security camera. Then, hearing voices echo from behind the only door in the room, which happens to be closed, I tiptoe toward it. I feel like a snooping intruder. 
but I guess I am. I sheepishly lean my head against the door. There's no denying one of the voices belongs to Deborah, my mother. I'm not expecting her to mention my father, Jonathan, in her next sentence. My breathing becomes labored. Is this a therapist's office? I wonder. Touching the wood paneling of the door, I hear Deborah say, After the wedding, he started using his fists. And I can't describe the relief I felt that the baby wasn't made up of his genes. Another female voice, louder than my mother's muted one, asks, Over the years, did you ever want to tell Jonathan the baby wasn't his? Hell no, my mother raises her voice, sounding upset. He would have killed me, and our daughter, that's why I never left. W wait, what? I chew on this news as my brain tries to play catch-up. My deceased father isn't my real father? And she's claiming to some doctor he was abusive? Covering my mouth with my hand, I force myself to keep my emotions in check, so I don't fling open the door and unleash a tirade of anger on a mother who doesn't know I'm here. And nothing more from Edward. Not until we bumped into each other a few years later, when he was home visiting friends. His parents had moved away by this point. Her tone softens, and he asked me to leave Jonathan. I was devastated Edward had moved on with his life and gotten married. Deborah's voice fills with contempt. To make matters worse, he got married to an awful woman. He told you this? Yes. He begged me to leave Jonathan, said he would leave his wife in a heartbeat for me. Did he know then he was the father to your daughter? No, Deborah cries. At least not that I know of. If he was the love of your life, I'm curious to know why you didn't leave. Deborah sounds like a strangled cat. Even though he would leave his wife for me, I couldn't leave my husband. I was a coward, worried about what Jonathan would do to him and to us. If not for fear, would you have left Jonathan to be with Edward? I almost suffocate myself during the long pause. Yes, my mother finally admits. If our daughter wasn't around easily, it's a double-edged sword since I would have loved for us to be a family and for her to know her real father, but I knew Jonathan would never let that happen. Were you not concerned about breaking up Edward's marriage? Not really, my mother sniffs. Not really. At the time, he didn't have kids. I know Edward eventually had children, but they didn't live here. When did Edward find out about your daughter and vice versa? I believe when she was in middle school. She and I were walking around the town square, and I could feel someone watching us. When I looked up, Edward stood stock still, staring at his spitting image. I didn't even have to say it. My jaw clenches. Oddly enough, I remember this moment, because it stuck out like a sore thumb. In public, my mother barely acknowledged the opposite sex. I thought it was because she was a timid creature, a pushover. But this time, she ran to the car and crumbled into a tearful mess. No wonder Jonathan never seemed to trust her or like her, or this sham marriage. I saw how his eyes bulged with resentment when he thought no one was looking. Now that I think about it, my supposed father was usually in the barn or the fields, avoiding her. Were you worried about Edward's wife or children finding out about your daughter, that they had a half-sibling? My mother's response is too muffled to hear. Another lapse, this time from the woman. I don't think you've said. What's your daughter's name? Sibley. When did you tell Sibley the identity of her real father? There's a long pause, or maybe it feels that way because I'm holding my breath. 
It's like an explosion of fireworks in my head when Deborah reveals, I haven't. Not only is my mother a cheater, but she's also a liar. I knew my mother had been unfaithful. I just didn't realize it was more than once. Not only did Deborah have an affair, but she got knocked up and passed me off as another man's child. The once effervescent room becomes suffocating as it sways in front of me, and beads of sweat form on my upper lip at the earth-shattering news. I'm not Jonathan's real daughter, and my birth father is a man named Edward? Who is he? And more importantly, where is he? A deep pain jabs me deep in the heart. There's a rustle of tissue or paper, and I can hear Deborah's pitiful crying as she acts like a tortured soul, always the victim. Maybe Fletch wasn't far from the truth. I've heard enough. Eager to flee from the admission of Deborah's guilt and lies, I start to tiptoe away from the door. Unfortunately, my shoe squeaks, and I don't bother being quiet. I start to sprint out into the sunshine, stumbling over my own two feet, a torrent of tears streaming down my face. Chapter 18 Sibley In the safety of my car, I drive aimlessly with no direction in mind, passing more storefronts, most empty, a reminder that nothing lasts forever, save for a pharmacy or a gathering spot to have coffee. It's hard to have longevity in this town, and apparently not even my father was meant to be a permanent fixture in my life. Without a concerted effort, I park in front of a bar fittingly called Bar on Main. The other option down the street is Mickey's. These are the only two bars I know of in town, and though they act like arch-rivals, it's ludicrous to me since both serve the same watered-down alcohol by the same breed of bored bartender, listening to the same type of music repeatedly on the jukebox. The permanently tired forty-something woman behind the bar nods in greeting as I sit down on a squeaky bar stool. I.D. Seriously? Her short bob nods up and down. Aren't you cute making me feel young? I chuckle. I bet you say that to all the girls. The ones under fifty-five, at least. She shrugs. What'll it be for your liquid lunch? Sliding my ID out of my wallet, I say, Vodka cranberry, a splash of lime. After a quick glance at my driver's license, she sets it down and lowers a glass off a shelf. I know I'm out of my bubble when it's assumed well vodka is my preference. She pours my glass and serves it to me on a paper napkin. Taking a long sip, I feel her eyes boring into the side of my face. Ah, this is just what I needed. The circumstances of the morning have weakened my resolve when it comes to drinking even more. Considering me, she puts her hands on her generous hips. Say, your name looks familiar. You from around here? I grew up here. Sibley. She rattles it off. Sibley Bradford. I hold out my hand to shake hers. Miranda. She gives it a limp shake. Don't know that last name. It was Sibley Sawyer, I shrug. You might know my mother from around town, Deborah. Deborah Sawyer? Wait a minute, she peers at me. You lose your father? I nod. He a farmer? Uh-huh. Yeah, I remember hearing that. She taps a long talon on the counter. Long time ago, right? Without waiting for confirmation, she continues. But those stories don't die. She pours me another round and slides it across the counter. Where do you live now? Arizona. Your mom in the same house? 
Yep, still on the farm. Is your farm by any chance close to the Guthrie's place, John and Nancy? She huffs a strand of dirty blonde hair out of her face. Not too far. They used to throw all the holiday parties. That's it. She points her sharp fingernail at me. That's where I recognize you. Did you go to their parties a lot? Not often, but I was at the Halloween party that night. I almost heave the vodka and cranberry with a splash of lime back up, my throat burning like I took shots of fireball instead. Miranda would remember that night, my senior year. She would have been present. Why wouldn't she? Everyone knows everything in this town. John and Nancy Guthrie have two kids close to my age. They were notorious for their epic parties, and the Halloween one was quite the extravaganza. A yearly gathering with hay rides, a bonfire, and a costume party. Much to the disgruntlement of the youth, parents were also invited. If kids wanted to sneak in liquor, they had to mix it in pop bottles beforehand. My parents, though asked, rarely went to parties. This year stood out because of my mother and what she did. My mother didn't go to many places alone, probably because we only had one vehicle, my daddy's truck. This time, my daddy had to go out of town and pick up a malfunctioning part for his tractor. It wasn't until I got older that it seemed weird we only had one car. But I guess I assumed we were poor growing up. My mother didn't work outside the home, and farming isn't an easy way to make a living. So many uncontrollable factors can come into play, the weather, crop prices, and crop production. That evening was the catalyst that started the downhill trajectory of my life. It might have been only one night, but like a destructive tornado, it ravaged our family and ruined lives and friendships. Not to mention, it carried a health hazard. Death. I remember that night vividly. I was upstairs in my bathroom, putting the finishing touches on my makeup, when my mother walked in. Need any help? My mother smiled at me. Setting down the eyeliner I used to draw the thin lines, I returned her gaze. I don't think so. Twirling around, I showed off my black tights and leotard. Your tail, she reminded me. Don't forget your tail. It's the most prized possession of a cat. What about the whiskers? What about them? She put a hand to my face, almost smearing my not yet dry whiskers. Mother, I said crossly, let me attach it for you. She used a safety pin to secure the long fabric tail in place. It was nothing more than black pantyhose stuffed with black garbage bags and shaped into a bendable limb. I slid on the finishing touch to my costume with a flourish, proudly staring at the headband with faux fur cat ears. Giving my real ear a gentle tug, she asked, Who's picking you up? Kristen. I thought you two weren't speaking. I sighed at the thought of our tumultuous friendship. We would fight, go weeks without speaking, and then inevitably find our way back to each other. We're friends this week, I murmured, though I was pissed because she had decided to do a group Wizard of Oz costume when we hadn't been speaking, and admittedly I was jealous. It was much cooler than my cat attire. What my mother said next blew my mind. Do you mind if I ride with you? You want to go to the party? Yes, I think so. She nervously touched the cross pendant that never left her neck. I never get out, and it should be fun. Will you have a good time without Daddy? Frowning at the question, she stammered. They invite us every year, and we never go. He's not one for hocus-pocus and costume parties. He thinks it's a holiday for the devil. And just think you grew up with a preacher dad, I smirked. Did he let you celebrate Halloween? 
We could dress up. The church had its own fall party every year, so I got to trick-or-treat that way. Okay, I shrugged. Just promise you won't embarrass me. Most teens would be disgusted if their parents asked to ride with them to a party. But I was curious to see my mother in another setting. I offered to help her pick out a costume, but she was adamant she could find something to wear. When I barged in her bedroom a little bit later without knocking, she quickly covered up her body with a towel. I thought it was due to modesty. We weren't a household that talked about or displayed nudity or sex. You know better than to come in without knocking, she chastised. I just want to help with your costume. Maybe I shouldn't go, she sighed. I have nothing to wear. Why can't you be a witch and wear your black velvet dress? It's sleeveless. It's not like it's inappropriate. She shook her head like I wasn't understanding. And at the time, I didn't. Sitting down on her bed, she put her head in her hands. I heard muffled crying, and I thought she was upset and missing the party. I'll find you something to wear, I offered brightly. And so I did. While I rummaged through old boxes in our attic, she put her dark hair in waves, the perfect accompaniment to the long sleeve hippie dress I'd found. We located a leather strap for her to use as a headband. And after we'd selected a couple of pieces of chunky costume jewelry, she embodied a flower child from the 70s. As I applied makeup to her face, I realized how pretty my mother was. She was young, only in her 30s, which was crazy to think about. But she never wore makeup, always went plain-faced, dowdy even. Using the same eyeliner as I had for my whiskers, I drew a peace symbol on her right cheek. All set, I smiled proudly. She seemed amazed at the transformation, her grin as wide as her flared sleeves. Even Kristen whistled at my mother's costume and whispered to me how hot she looked. It was true, neither of us had seen my mother dolled up. And more than that, I saw a different side of my mother, one I had never seen before. Instead of timid, she was glowing, her posture relaxed instead of rigid. She commanded the room instead of begging to blend into the carpet. When we arrived at the Halloween party, Miles and Bryce were there, along with their mom, Cindy. I noticed before I took off with my friends that Cindy didn't seem thrilled to see us. Usually she treated me like one of her kids, the daughter she never had. But as soon as we walked in, her face turned to stone, an impenetrable gaze fixed in our direction. We said hello, but Cindy was distant. I forgot about it because later Kristen and her boyfriend, Josh, had a fight, prompting her to want to leave. She was hysterically crying, and since she was my ride, I told her I would find my mother so we could go. But I couldn't find her. Kristen threw a fit, and I told her to go ahead and ask Miles or Bryce to give us a ride home, but she refused. I went in search of my mother, checking the fire pit, knocking on the doors of the closed rooms in the farmhouse, and asking around. No one had seen her. Annoyed, I went for a walk, impatient to find her. The evening was chilly, and I was only wearing a thin leotard. My teeth were chattering without the heat of the bonfire. I should have brought a coat, I berated myself. As I headed down a dark path toward the silo, I became terrified when a shadowy figure came running toward me. At first, I didn't know who it was but the pink sequins of Kristen's Glinda the Good Witch costume sparkled when they caught the moon's bare light. You don't want to go that way, she warned. Why not? Two people are getting it on. So? Stop being such a prude. I rolled my eyes. Who is it, people in our class? Breathlessly, she shook her head. It's adults. Let me go see who it is. No, it's gross. She stuck out her tongue. Plus, I thought we were trying to find your mom. We are. 
Then let's go back inside. It's damn cold out here. I thought you didn't want to run back to Josh. Screw him, she sniffed. Now that homecoming is over, I'm done. Though we walked back toward the loud music and sounds from the party, we didn't go back inside. Kristen lit up a cigarette, and I could tell by the way she was chain-smoking one after the other, just like my daddy did. She was agitated. Josh found her, and now she wasn't in a rush to leave, so they went inside. Bored, I sat on the steps of the wooden deck, trying to keep myself warm, but not wanting to rejoin the cacophony. It was a full moon, and I was sitting quietly, the darkness enveloping me, when two shadows appeared from the direction of the silo. I was rubbing my legs for warmth, curious to see who the adults were who had disappeared to make out, or do more, I supposed. Assuming it was a couple, probably a friend's parents, I waited, wanting to tease a classmate about this in the morning. The pair were close enough their shoulders touched, with one leaning into the other. I could tell by the way one arm was draped over the other that they were holding hands. They stopped as they got closer to the house, disappearing behind a large tree with branches that shielded them from view. The wood railing hid most of me, but I crouched down and hid underneath the deck, knowing they would walk right over my head when they reached the house. I peered between the slats and the railing, and when they entered my field of vision, it was like they'd become a different couple. There were at least three feet of distance between them, the earlier closeness either imagined or gone. My gaze was level with their knees, and my eyes widened when I spotted the knee-high brown boots the woman was wearing. They were my brown boots, the ones I'd let my mother borrow for her costume. And obviously, the man was not my father. I was frozen in horror. He wasn't a stranger, either. He smelled like spruce and the outdoors when he hugged me. It was Miles Fletcher's dad. Horrified, I had no intention of ever crawling out of my hiding spot, preferring to curl up in a ball and die. I stayed concealed for what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes. Numbness settled over my body, some from cold, some from the shock. My face, my legs, my hands. When I returned to the party, my mother was sitting on a bar stool talking to a blonde woman. I approached her. Where have you been? Even speaking sounded monotone. We're ready to go. Sorry, she apologized. I must have lost track of time. Kristen drove us home, but Josh was with us, and I noticed Kristen was talking too fast and not making eye contact with my mother or me. When she dropped us off, her goodbye was forced. My mother didn't seem to notice, and inside I watched as she hurriedly washed the makeup off her face all traces of the party evaporating from her pores, as if she were Cinderella getting home from the ball, turning back into a frumpy housewife. I wanted to ask my mother about what I'd seen. The words were on the tip of my tongue, but I couldn't force them out. The next day at school, my stomach dropped when Kristen brought it up at my locker. In a whisper, Kristen told me what she'd seen how my mom and that man had been kissing and necking, their hands all over each other. But she couldn't keep watching. It had felt wrong, so she'd rushed out when they'd started to undress. She promised she'd never say a word, and I believed her at that moment. I hoped it would become old news now that she had more Josh problems to talk about. A couple days later, after a fight over something trivial, Half the school heard what a cheating whore my mother was. My contorted reflection in the mirror behind the bar causes me to glance up. I'm grimacing while Miranda stares at me with wide eyes. You okay, darling? Yeah, sorry. I shake my head sadly. Memory lane. 
Yikes. I shouldn't have mentioned that night. Miranda blushes crimson. You probably get tired of talking about all this old drama. I was just thinking how my former best friend and I had a falling out then, I muse. Actually, both of my best friends. You know, Kristen wrote Deborah a letter before she died. Really? I'm incredulous. Saying what? I'm not really sure. Hell, it could be just another rumor. She wipes a rag over the bar, even though I'm sure it's unnecessary, since the room is empty except for us. You know, Miranda sucks on her lip, you should ask your mother about it. I watch as her unreasonably long claws get caught in a strand of hair and she mutters a curse word. Taking this as my cue to cash out, I bid Miranda adieu. Chapter 19 Sibley When I stumble out to my car and lock eyes with my reflection in the rear view, my face is drenched with sweat, perspiration clinging to my upper lip. As I drive, I warn myself to slow down. You'd think I'd be overly cautious because of my earlier encounter, but I'm in a warped mood. My foot pressed on the accelerator as the old beater lurches struggling to gain speed. My only concern is outrunning the instability of the emotions that threaten to internally combust. I pass a rare sight on the road of another vehicle, an old tan Buick that's at least a decade old but looks brand new. It most likely belongs to an elderly person who drives a few hundred miles a year and keeps it garaged the rest of the time. Scanning the driver inside, I realize it's Nora, our elderly neighbor who must be in her nineties by now. I debate whether to wave. She's not going to know who I am, but it's the neighborly thing to do. I can't remember her without white hair and gnarly hands smelling of flour and turpentine. The woman always had keen eyes behind her spectacles and an insatiable taste for gossip. When I give her a shrill honk, I startle the poor woman, though she attempts a flimsy wave. I careen around her, my reckless driving has her behind me in a matter of seconds as I gain distance. I need to focus on something other than my jaded emotions, and flicking on the radio, I can't settle on rock or oldies. Talk radio can be so dull, depending on the topic and the host. I find an alternative channel and drum my fingers on the wheel. It's a song popular from my high school days. I try for the high notes, hitting my lung capacity, and then burst into laughter at my voice, a high-pitched hyena sound that never can reach quite the right note. Before I know it, I'm sobbing, my shoulders hunched over the steering column as if embracing it. When I pull into the derelict yard, I have to swerve to avoid one of the farm cats that seem to be in endless supply. Wiping a hand across my nose, I remember why I wasn't able to stay in the first place. I don't have a key. Most of the windows on the first floor are solid panes and don't open, and the kitchen window is too small for me to climb through. I walk around the perimeter of the porch, but I'm unable to peer inside because the blinds are closed. Shrouded in darkness, the house has an ominous quality to it, even in the daylight. My mother's bedroom and bathroom are on the first floor, the addition she begged my assumed father for my junior year of high school. He didn't want to spend the money, but she convinced a couple of neighbors to help, and it ended up being a group project. In fact, after everyone pitched in on our remodel, my parents returned the favor for a few of the neighbors who were tired of their old farmhouses and wanted more functional rooms. The window in the master bath on the first floor might work. It's not very wide, but I bet I can cram my frame through it. It's locked, but I have a solution. I pick up a rock and toss it at the pane. 
It takes me a couple of tries since I feel off-kilter and woozy. After winding up like a baseball player, I launch another stone through the glass, and it finally shatters. The sound of breaking glass can't repress the acute feeling that someone's eyes are on me. I stand in silence for a moment. Paranoid, I sneak glances around, barely able to see through the tall, dense grass in some areas. Ignoring the chill running down my spine and my pounding headache, I decide I'm acting ridiculous. It's because of the news flash about the prison. I'm on edge. In the tool shed, I find a pair of thick gloves and a broom. After using the wooden handle to brush away the excess shards of glass, I drag the metal tin over to the window to use as a stool. I'm sweaty and hot, and it's not as easy as it looks on television to climb through a broken window without scraping yourself on shards. After I land with a loud thud on the bathroom floor, I toss the rock back outside. Staring at the splotchy mirror over the sink, I pry open the medicine cabinet. Inside is a miniature pharmacy, white and orange pill bottles lining the shelves to full capacity. Jesus, Deborah, I think, examining the labels. I wonder how carefully she keeps inventory, or if she'd notice any missing. After I slam the cabinet shut, I step into her mostly tidy bedroom, relatively similar after all these years. Deborah's habits haven't changed when it comes to making her bed. I roll my eyes at the abundance of decorative pillows that take up a chunk of it. Her closet is still overflowing with clothes that are either too small or outdated by two decades. The unforgiving rocking chair that belonged to her mother rests in the corner of the room, and a fabric seat cushion is now attached to make it bearable, I presume. Making my way through the small downstairs, I scrunch my nose at the smell of cat piss and coffee. Since when did she inherit an indoor cat? Feral ones used to run all over the farm, great for catching barn mice. But Daddy always warned us about feeding strays, how they would never leave. My mother had a bleeding heart, and begged unsuccessfully to keep every one of them as a house pet. Mournfully, I study my father's old chair, his existence made known by the plethora of cigarette burns forging a path down the battered leather. My mother tossed almost everything of his shortly after his death. But oddly, she kept his recliner and dining room chair as if he still needed a seat at the table. But he's not your father, I woefully remind myself. Scanning the rest of the small space, I'm baffled by the messiness. Pots and pans and silverware cover every inch of counter space in the kitchen. Boxes of pantry items are stacked on the scarred table and the formica countertops. I assume the pantry is overflowing, but I'm amazed to find it scarce. It's as if spring cleaning started and never finished. Disgusted at the dirtiness, I shake my head in alarm. I guess you have your first project, I think, ripping off the shred of newspaper clinging to the bottom of my shoe. When I reach the front door, I fumble open both locks with trembling hands to pretend I entered the way most would, through the actual door. The adjoining living room has fared a little better. The furniture is the same, old and shabby, but at least it's reasonably clean. I'm already tired of the house's gloominess, so I open the drapes to let some light in through the picture windows. Intending to wait up for my mother, I make room to sit by moving a pile of blankets on the couch. Noticing my favorite, a crocheted one made by my grandma, I spread it over my lap. I promise myself I'll just shut my eyes for a few minutes of rest. However, the bright morning sunlight is warm and inviting, consoling me gently to sleep. It's as if I never left 
the hum of the refrigerator, the chit-chat of birds, but mostly the solitude. They welcome me home with open arms, their familiarity beckoning me to remember this is where I once belonged. Chapter 20 Deborah A white vehicle is parked sideways in the drive when Deborah comes home, blocking her path to the garage. It looks like the car from earlier, but she can't be too sure. Standing at the rear bumper, Deborah strokes her chin, staring at the ripped remains of where a temporary plate should be, shaking her head. Deborah notices bald tires and dark tint missing in places, as if someone took a razor blade to shave off portions in vertical stripes. Peering through the scratched tint, she's disappointed no one's inside, and all she spots in the back seat is a red cooler and an overstuffed suitcase. She tries the handle, but it's locked. That's not the case with the front door, which is ajar. Did I accidentally leave it open? Deborah shoves her knuckles in her mouth. She moved the metal tin after the incident. She doesn't keep a hidden key anymore, just in case someone wants to ransack the house. What the? Deborah peers up at the security camera. Irked, she can't rely on it to provide her any basic details before she decides whether it's safe to enter. The recorded images take too long to download because of the spotty reception on the farm and typically appear black and grainy on her phone screen. If anything, it's supposed to be a deterrent. Except in this case. As she waffles on what to do, Robert doesn't answer. So she shakily dials the emergency number. After all that's happened, she doesn't want to assume the identity of her uninvited visitor. Relieved, an operator quickly answers. She doesn't offer a greeting, just a mumbled string of words. I don't understand, the male voice says. Who's at your house? I'm not sure, Deborah whispers. Someone's here on the Sawyer property. Okay, do you know who? I might know them. Is this the Sawyer farm? There's an air of exasperation she doesn't miss. You have to believe me. She grips the phone in her hand. I'm not lying. There's a strange vehicle in the drive, some type of foreign car. A Toyota. No one said you were. Can you describe them? She grits her teeth. I didn't walk inside yet. But if that's what you want me to do, what do you mean? The voice on the other end fights to stay calm. An intruder is inside the house? I haven't gone in. Wait, hold on a sec, the man says. Have you walked around the premises? No, Deborah says. Do you have any spare keys the trespasser could have located? I don't think so. This should be an obvious question, yet she doesn't know. Frustrated, Deborah paces the length of the porch, tempted to collapse onto the porch swing, until she notices the curtains are open. Deborah never leaves them open. It might entice someone to take a peek inside the house. Licking her lips nervously, she wonders if the man is back. Please stay out of the house. An officer will be dispatched shortly. The man on the phone sighs. There was an escape today at the correctional facility. What? Deborah almost loses her balance. Another one? She tries to act reasonable. There's a car in the drive, so clearly the owner didn't walk here. Well, people do drive getaway cars. A keyboard clicks in the background as the dispatcher says, Expect a policeman soon, ma'am. And then, I can stay on the line if you'd like. Please, I'd like that. Comforted by this, Deborah rests the phone against her thigh, not hanging up, per se, but keeping it there to shudder the conversation at least for the moment. Sneaking closer, she peers inside the picture window, spotting a lumpy figure sprawled out on the couch, their silhouette covered entirely by a blanket. Soren, she thinks, hopefully. 
Disregarding the dispatcher's advice and unable to contain her nervous anticipation, she gently pushes the olive green door the rest of the way open. If it is Soren, she doesn't want to prolong their reunion any longer, and the white car outside gives her a sneaking suspicion it might be. Deborah's met with the annoying squeak she thought she'd become accustomed to. Now it sounds like a brand new irritation. Hello? She tiptoes into the house. Her eyes play catch-up, taking a moment to adjust to the dimness from the contrast of outside. A wheezing sound from the living room brings Deborah face to face with the heap on the sofa. Stunned, Deborah peers at the straggler sawing logs under her roof. Slowly, she approaches the form, tangled up in her mother's cherished blanket. They're back to Deborah. There's no mistaking the freckled skin and blonde hair, and Deborah hovers over her. Pushing aside the strap of her tank top, Deborah's fingers trace the skin, where a small tattoo of a monarch butterfly rests. The phone slips out of her other hand, as if dipped in Vaseline, and Deborah barely catches it before it hits the woman's chest. Chapter 21 Sibley Even when I hear a loud gasp, I'm rattled but not fully awake. The squawking continues, and in my slumber I assume it's a hummingbird outside on the feeder. Oh my God, it is you! The voice resonates from above me. You came home! Bemused, I open my eyes, expecting to see my comforter from home draped around me and not a crocheted heirloom blanket. Disarmed, I'm face to face with big brown eyes and a heart-shaped face that matches mine. The only other trait we share besides our face shape is our fair skin. I used to think I shared similarities with Jonathan, but my mother blew that out of the water. Her eyes go wide when they see me, squinting as if I'm a mirage. As she moves her hand to her heart, her skin turns an even whiter shade. Is that really you? We peer at each other. My mother's hair is now shoulder length, chestnut colored, and tinged with gray. My sudden presence has caused a reaction of sorts. I'm still trying to decipher what kind. I shift awkwardly on the couch, ready to bolt in case it's not a positive one. We didn't necessarily have the fairest of goodbyes. As I live and breathe, her hand reaches out to touch my cheek. I thought I'd have to die before I saw you again. I try not to flinch at her touch or her morbid comment. You feel hot, and look at you using a blanket in this heat, she scoffs. You came from sunshine. You should be used to it. Her gaunt appearance is worrisome, skin sagging down to the bones. She looks a lot older than her fifty-plus years, her wrinkles more pronounced in the sunlight. She tilts her head as if her eyesight is faulty and she can't rely on what's in front of her. I don't like surprises, but this is... <laughs> wow! She settles back against the edge of the couch, tears welling up in her eyes. I just don't believe it. Pinch me, please. Dumbfounded, I wish I could feign excitement, but the bitterness soaks my lips like the residue of something pungent. Uncomfortably, I tighten my hold on the blanket, feeling naked as her eyes examine every square inch of me. Moving to a seated position, I cross my arms over my chest. I feel feverish, and my skin's flushed from alcohol, sunshine, or trepidation. Maybe all three. My throat is parched, and breaking the torturous eye contact, I ask if I can have something to drink. Of course, she says, but she doesn't stand. So I heave myself up. It feels good to stretch my sore limbs. I follow her into the kitchen, where the unpleasant smell again forces me to pinch my nose. You get an indoor cat? 
No, but Esmeralda's about to give birth in the barn. Why does the house smell like an outhouse? Hmm, she sniffs the air. I didn't notice. If she doesn't detect the noxious odor, she must be used to living in these putrid conditions, which is an unsettling thought. You want any breakfast? My mother shuffles over to the refrigerator, and I notice she's limping on her left side. I'm about to ask what happened when I stopped to gawk at the fridge's contents. Usually it's overflowing with more food than a family, let alone one person, could eat. Now nothing is inside, save for a carton of milk, a pitcher of water, and a few expired-looking yogurts, as if someone has cleaned it out. Why aren't you eating? I ask casually. I am. Then why does it look like the end of a pandemic? If I keep the fridge stocked, all I do is eat. I'm confused. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? When you get to my age, you'll see how your body rebels and the calories go straight to your waistline. Believe me, I already know. I groan. But why is everything removed from the cabinets? I can't say I like what you've done with the place. I've had some run-ins with mice. It took me a minute to find the little devils. When was this? A week or so ago. My favorite kitty, Esmeralda, and her chums were happy to help. Rolling my eyes at her fondness for nomadic cats, I offered to help reorganize her cupboards. Before she can respond, the phone rings in my mother's hand, alarming us both. She doesn't answer, instead setting it on the counter. With the kitchen a mess, I have no choice but to search for the least inhabited chair and scoot aside some old magazines and newspapers, dog-eared and worn. A muffled voice interrupts the quiet, and I assume it's a radio announcer until the voice repeatedly shrieks her name. My mother gives a guilty look at her phone. Crap, she murmurs. I must have hit answer instead of decline. Who is it? Give me a second. She holds up a finger, picking her phone up from the counter. I swallow a sip of my water as my mother chatters into her phone. Tilting my head, I recognize the familiar voice. From her one-sided conversation, realization dawns on me. Shit, did you call the police on me? She doesn't respond, but I see the local police department contact on her phone. Horrified, I clap a hand to my mouth. The rock, her window, breaking and entering. Damn it. This staying under the radar isn't working out for me. How does an unexpected road trip turn into two run-ins with the police? Ignoring me, she says, I wasn't wrong. She's here. Can you believe it? I watch her grin into the phone. Yep, all the way from Florida. Now it's my turn to be confused. Florida? Did she forget I live in the desert? I pout. She wouldn't forget what state I live in had she bothered to write a letter back to me or return a call. I jump up, grabbing the phone out of her hand mid-sentence. Hi, Chief. This is Sibley. Sorry to give both of you a scare. I surprised her out of the blue. My mother gapes at me like I'm speaking a foreign language. I cradle the phone, mouthing, what's wrong? The voice on the other end falters a greeting. Uh, hi, Sibley. How are you, stranger? Good, I say. Great. I don't bother to add that while being home for less than two hours, I've learned my mother's a fraud and my dead father isn't my real one. It's pleasant to hear your voice. He sounds relieved. Your mother scared the living daylights out of me when she called 911, and the station received an alert from her security system. Not to mention a woman named Nora said she was almost run off the road by a woman speeding like a bat out of hell. You wouldn't know anything about that, would you? In my stupor, I didn't consider Deborah might have alarms on the doors and windows. 
I'm relieved he doesn't mention the broken window or my drunken shape entering the small space. Again, I lie to the authorities. I used the spare to get inside, Chief. Didn't mean to spook her. In fact, I already ran into Miles Fletcher. I smirk. He gave me a warm reception when he pulled me over. Then it definitely wouldn't have been you speeding. I can hear his deep belly laugh through the phone. I forgot how much I missed the police chief's discernible guffaw. I'll bet Officer Fletcher gave you an earful. Oh, he did. Said he's vying for your job. I'm sure he did. Problem is, I doubt I'll ever get to quit the force. He grunts. Well, I order you to enjoy your time with your mama. How long are you in town? I don't know, I stammer. A couple of weeks, maybe? Sounds good. I hear the background noise of the station, and he speaks louder over the din. Please stop in and see me before you leave. Sure do miss you around here. My face feels heated. I know he's not referencing when my squad in high school went TPing and included the police station in our harmless prank. It was good fun until someone got a bright idea to use spray paint on one of the vehicles in the lot. When I'm about to hang up, the police chief stops me. And Sibley? Yes, sir, I gulp. Don't know if you knew, but they built a men's prison outside of town, and we've had a string of unfortunate incidents. It's important to be conscientious. I heard an announcement on the radio. Here comes another fib. And it might be an odd coincidence, but I did notice a broken window in my mother's room. What? My mother and the chief both gasp, one through the phone, one poised over my shoulder. It's in the master bath. My voice vacillates. Please tell me you've now caught them. The chief urges me to hand back the phone to my mother. This can't be happening. My mother starts to shake like a leaf. She disappears out of the kitchen with the phone, and I hear her mumbled cries as she exits the room. Ashamed at my behavior. I wait until I hear a shriek from her bathroom before I take tentative steps toward her bedroom. She's seated on the edge of the bed, and even though she's no longer speaking to the chief of police, the phone convulses in her trembling grip. I know you don't like surprises, I say, attempting a half-hearted apology. I'm sorry for showing up this way. She doesn't acknowledge this instead staring at her gnarled hands. I got worried when you didn't answer, I say lamely. You haven't wanted to communicate. Her silence is deafening, and suddenly I'm a little girl again, feeling vulnerable and unwanted. Old insecurities rear their ugly heads. It's time to change tactics before I implode. Can I help clean up the glass? Deborah doesn't answer, just murmurs. They stole from me. Who? Whoever broke in, she sighs. A bunch of my medication is missing. Pills? I ask innocently. What kind of pills? This is unbelievable. And after what happened last winter. What happened then? My eyes widen. Is that why you're limping? With a pounding heart, I wonder if this is what Fletch was alluding to. She rests a hand on her forehead. A man tried to... He didn't try. He... Stammering, she covers her mouth with her hand. What? He attacked me outside. She nods toward the porch out there, dragged me to the barn and clubbed me with a gun. How could you not call me? I'm appalled. This is serious, mother. She tilts her head to consider me. Would that have changed anything? 
I would have come to the hospital. Really? We both know you haven't been back since... She hesitates. Since you graduated your senior year after the unfortunate accidents. If one could call them that, I shudder. I wonder if my dad would agree to that sentiment. She doesn't pick up on the insinuation about my father, who, in a flash, has been erased as my biological one. Her eyes cut to my core, piercing deep inside of me. We both know nothing would have brought me back here unless it was her funeral. An uncomfortable moment passes between us. I shift from foot to foot. From the looks of the place, I got worried you had moved or were robbed. The man didn't take anything. Motioning around the room, she sighs. And move where? I've got so much work to do here as it is. Besides, who would want my stuff? This time I bite my lip to keep from making a sarcastic comment. She's right about one thing. Her furnishings aren't high on a robber's wish list. Why anyone would choose this place to target is beyond me. Everything is mostly old, not even in the antique sense. The grandfather clock is certainly priceless, but it would take grunt work to lift and carry out the door. The clutter makes it hard to ascertain valuable from invaluable. The junk has been amassed just as eagerly as the more essential items. Most of the things are sentimental to my mother, meant for memories, not for resale. I wait for the inevitable questions. She asks, What brings you home? Is everything okay? No, it's not. I want to scream. But I force myself to say without much conviction, Nothing in particular. I just wanted to see you. I sigh. It's been too long. Her face goes ashen. I don't remember agreeing to have company right now. Her voice trails off. A lot is going on, and it's not the best time. Her thin gold band is still on her finger after all these years, and it only heightens my resentment. It's a slap in the face that she bothers to wear it after all that happened, along with the cross pendant, a paltry attempt to be pious. I swallow down my anger as we lock eyes. I need to ask you about my father. About Jonathan. Can you excuse me? My mother presses her fingers to her forehead. All of a sudden, I'm not feeling well. What's wrong? I'm dizzy. This is too much shock for one day. I need to lie down. The vodka roils in my stomach, as if I'm aboard a cruise ship in turbulent waters. And excusing myself quickly, I run to dislodge the contents for the second time today. Chapter 22 Deborah Deborah goes to bed spooked and wakes up filled with dread when she hears talking in the other room. Oh no, she thinks, groaning. He's back. He's probably seated in front of the television. Remembering the broken window, 
Deborah slides into a pair of slippers, not wanting to risk cutting herself on slivers of glass. He must have crawled in the bathroom window quietly. How could she not hear his footsteps? Slowly, Deborah walks into her bathroom to consider the damage. Plastic is now taped to the opening, and broken shards are no longer on the floor. That's right, her daughter is here. The sound is her voice. Deborah goes in search of her daughter, to thank her for cleaning up the mess. Her appreciation turns to bemusement, as she watches Sibley balancing on a chair in the kitchen, searching in vain for something. Her hands are sweeping across the cabinets, like she's looking for one of those secret bugs that people plant to spy. What are you doing? Deborah's mouth gapes. Sibley spins around and loses her balance. Grabbing the edge of the cabinet just in time, she manages to avoid a hard fall. Jeez, mother, you scared me. I shouldn't have to announce my presence in my own home. Deborah tries for a tight smile, but it comes off as a grimace. Do I need to put a bell on you so I know what you're up to? Of course not. Sibley wipes her hands on the front of her shorts. Deborah asks coldly, What are you looking for? Tea, Sibley shrugs. It sounded good right now. They both know this is bullshit, a flimsy excuse. Deborah thought she'd be more skilled at lying by now. I don't remember you liking tea. Deborah points to a glass container filled with various tea bags. But if you did, it's on the counter in front of you. Of course it is. Right in front of my face. Sibley's cheeks turn ruddy. I was looking up instead of ahead. She yanks a couple of tea bags out. Would you like some? Deborah shrugs. I usually drink it at night, but why not? It's not every day your daughter shows up unexpectedly. Yeah, right. Sibley raises an eyebrow. Still like it hot, even in the summer? Yes. Deborah fixes Sibley with one last pointed stare. I'm going to go sit in the living room and take a load off. Sibley manages a nod. Deborah collapses into her chair, rubbing the drowsiness out of her eyes. Her daughter arrives out of nowhere and is already ransacking her cupboards. What could she possibly be looking for? Considering all the options, mostly unpleasant, Deborah wonders if Sibley is trying to catch her doing something. Was she sent here to spy on her? Maybe she's going to plant one of those miniature recording devices. In distress, she doesn't notice Sibley standing in front of her, a strange look on her face, tea in hand. Pressing a mug into Deborah's palm, she sits down across from her on the couch. Stifling a yawn, Deborah notices the dark circles underneath Sibley's eyes. You look exhausted. That earlier nap wasn't enough. I was driving almost nonstop for twenty-three hours. You didn't stop? Her eyes widen in alarm. You should have told me you were coming. I would have picked you up from the airport instead of you driving all this way. Then Deborah could at least have known when she came and went. She wouldn't have come home to her asleep on her couch. It's okay. Sibley stares into her mug, refusing to meet Deborah's eyes. I didn't want to trouble you. Deborah lifts her chin. Where's that husband of yours? He's at home. Sibley chews on a fingernail. Still have that nasty habit, I see. Deborah frowns at Sibley's hands. Where's your wedding ring? Its absence is puzzling to her. Deborah doesn't mention she noticed the enormous diamond in the engagement picture she found online after she heard about the wedding announcement, but not from her daughter. No, she had to find out from a neighbor who'd read it on her social media account. She was peeved. It was the same with Sibley's graduation from college and law school. She did receive a Hallmark card informing her she'd passed the bar and joined a law firm. It hurt like hell. 
but she'd be lying if she said it had been unexpected. Debra's received sporadic, high-level cliffs notes along the way. At the jeweler, I decided to have it cleaned professionally, no need to wear it on the farm. It would have been nice to finally meet my son-in-law. Debra knows his name starts with an H, but she can't seem to pluck it from her memory. Holden had to work, Sibley mumbles. Well, it would have been nice to meet Holden, she says pointedly. And you managed to make it, Deborah chastens. That seems dangerous, you coming alone in that metal trap with those tires. Sibley leans her head back against the couch, closing her eyes. Getting nowhere, Deborah asks, Is he still in education? A teacher, right? He teaches poli sci. Deborah stares at her blankly. Political science. Holden's a professor at the university. Sibley's voice squeaks. That's why he couldn't come. He got tenure, so he's thrilled. How wonderful, Deborah says politely. Good for him. And you, are you still a lawyer? I am. Was it hard to get time off? I was able to juggle it. Deborah knows the farm's condition has thrown Sibley for a loop, but she hardly owes her an apology. A lot of pressing matters have consumed her time as of late, and she's so tired and bogged down. And today, Sibley's blue eyes wear the same guilty cloak Deborah's have worn for the past sixteen years. Maybe Deborah feels high strung because of the timing, skeptical even of her intentions. She hates to chew over the timing of Sibley's visit, but she'd be remiss if she didn't. It's odd Sibley would show up around the same time she's making a radical decision about the farm. Deborah didn't expect her to come knocking at the door, certainly not without a phone call. Eventually, she would have sent a card with a handwritten letter inside, pouring out the feelings she's kept bottled up because Jonathan used to throttle her for having them. It's a hard conversation to have with your child, even at an adult age. And now Deborah's moving on, tired of feeling exposed on the farm, a sitting duck, if you will. She's ready to branch out in life. If Deborah didn't have Robert, she'd lose her patience and will to live. Smiling gleefully to herself, she thinks that moving on with Robert has a nice ring to it. Deborah's biggest mistake was not fleeing all those years ago after the string of tragedies happened. Blow after blow. But she had a target on her back, and it was easier to grin and bear it. Deborah paid the price in silence with a backbone that was stronger than most. Leaving would have been an admission of guilt, and would have caused more damage than staying did, though she couldn't possibly have known it at the time. She and Robert made a pact to stay silent about what had happened the night Jonathan died. It was in everyone's best interests, hers included. Sibley has no idea what she's given up for her. She's never appreciated the sacrifices, how unselfish Deborah had to be to do what she did. But it's not all her fault. A mother's job is to protect her children, shield them from pain. She didn't want to let her know the man she'd put on a pedestal was a cruel monster, even if it meant staying silent. So both women have suffered, and spread the blame around the same way you spread a thin coat of peanut butter on a cracker with a knife, stuff it in your mouth, and wonder why your throat has become dry and cotton-like. If you swallow the lies and half-truths, they become toxic. Deborah realizes Sibley's asking her a question. Meeting her daughter's eyes with a blank stare, she waits for her to repeat herself. Is my room the same? Yes. You'll probably want to change the bedding, though. It needs a refresh. Why? Sibley winks mischievously. You have company lately? Heavens, no. Do you see Fletch a lot? Sibley asks. Or his family? More than I'd like, Deborah snorts. 
Miles Fletcher told you he's the next chief of police, huh? That boy is delusional. How come? Everyone in town knows he stole money from the officers' union, but the charges never stuck. The district attorney decided not to prosecute, said the evidence wasn't sufficient. Money and power always talk. All of a sudden, the money was found, and the paper wrote some long bullshit article about responsible journalism and fired the poor reporter who broke the news. I bet his dad wasn't thrilled about that. The Fletchers prefer to stay out of the papers as much as possible unless it's for a worthy cause, like a charitable donation or a community service award. He got off without so much as a hand slap, she sniffs. Everyone still feels sorry for him since his wife died. Did you know he married Kristen? I heard. Sibley wears a pained expression on her face. Could it have been a rush to judgment? Even though Fletch and I have differences of opinion, embezzlement doesn't seem to fit his character. His brother Bryce would be more likely. Who knows, Deborah shrugs. He's always been a wild card. Snapping her fingers, she says, reminiscing, Oh, don't think I forgot when the four of you snuck out to go to some rock and roll mess or how one of the Fletcher boys broke your window to sneak back in the house. A giggle escapes Sibley's lips. What's so funny? Sibley gives Deborah a smug smile. I thought you two buried the hatchet is all. With another yawn, Sibley languidly rises from the couch. All right, I'm going to go grab my suitcase and try to sleep. Wake me up if you need me. Speaking to Sibley's back, Deborah says, I'm going to cook dinner tonight. This calls for a celebration. Her words fall flat. Anything particular you're hungry for? She pauses with her hand on the door jamb, but doesn't turn around. Haven't had much of an appetite. I'm more concerned with getting rest. Maybe just a salad. Deborah notices how Sibley's hands tremble at her sides. We need to fatten you up. You're much too thin. Sibley doesn't respond, and Deborah hears the slam of the screen door as her footsteps trudge outside. Sleep well, honey, Deborah hollers a few minutes later, when she hears the stairs clunking as Sibley climbs them. After Sibley's bed creaks upstairs, Deborah steps outside to make a call. Without saying hello, she whispers into the phone. I'm not sure what to think. Wait, I can't hear you. Why can't you speak up? Robert lowers his voice, which is tinged with worry. Are you okay? I'm not alone, but I'm not in trouble, she says. But I think she might be, maybe financially. She recounts for him the concern about the missing wedding ring and the absentee husband. She's already looking for something, Deborah huffs. Maybe she's got ill intentions. Robert lets out a lengthy exhale, a habit of his when he's processing news. How well do you know your daughter? He asks gently. You haven't seen her since she was a teenager. Deborah bites her tongue. He has a point. She presumed Sibley had her life together. Her list of accomplishments and degrees made her seem untouchable and superior. But she's human. And Deborah's certainly no stranger to making decisions that aren't necessarily legal or respectable to survive. There's a lot you don't know, Robert says brooding. I guess all you can do right now is keep asking questions. But if I find out she's using me or spying on me, she won't be here long, Deborah growls. Exactly. I won't let her hurt you again. There's a brief pause, and Deborah knows what he's going to ask. She tightens her grip on the phone in anticipation. When are you? You're breaking up, having trouble hearing. Going to tell her who her father. Abruptly, she disconnects and Deborah's mind loops back to the farm and Sibley's shocking appearance. An unsettled pit in her stomach 
makes Deborah wonder if Sibley is telling the truth. People don't just reappear after so many years, out of the blue, without wanting something in return. The question is, what is it? <laughs>